back to the Metropolitan Grid. I almost said to Montreal because I read the chat. How's it going? Hey, Nanako, wake up. A new set has dropped. Yeah, there's Byroids in it. She was really hyped it like a minute ago, I promise. How's everyone doing? Welcome back to Metropolitan Grid. It is uh, Tuesday, Monday morning. We don't normally do this here at this time, at this place, uh, but a new set came out like a couple minutes ago it seems like uh it's gonna be a fun stream here it's a 10 a.m in the morning uh we're gonna be streaming here for about four hours uh so we'll be here till around two at that point i have to peace out but um there's already a lot of folks here hopefully you're all hyped about the news that just kind of came out so uh we're gonna do what we can do within the time that we have to do it so just to make sure we're on the same page we're gonna go to null signal.games that's their website and you notice that there is not a new article this morning so normally they do like a set drop article that shows you all the cards it's not out yet that's okay because technically all the cards are up on netrunner db if you go to sets and you, oops if you go to sets and you go to uh it's all here so we're going to start there because there's cards here that haven't been released yet, that haven't been scooped. There's 65 cards here. I don't think we've seen everything. So we're going to go in that in just a second. Otherwise, to check up here, this is Jinteki.net, the website in which we play the dang game. And this one also hasn't been updated yet. We're hoping to be updated later today, but we're just going to be constantly doing check-ins to see what happens. It's okay. If at the end of the day, it doesn't go anywhere. We're just going to hang out here and we're going to look at some of the new cards and we're going to talk about them. We're going to do some deck building. That's the best we got to go. Dan did just post the last two cards in Stim Slack. Oh, cool. I, I think they're all here. I think there's actually 65. Hold on. There are 65 full cards up here on NRDB. 65 cards. Yeah. So everything is here. And there are some cards that I don't think we've seen before. Like looking at the names here. What is strange? What do I not recognize? I recognize most of these. Did we see everything? No, there's no way. There has to be some cards that weren't cohort guidance program. Oh, there, unknown cards, new content. There's new content out there. Julie, Julie's name showed up in in stuff. Have we not seen Julie? Oh, we haven't also seen. Julie. Let's not look at that. Let's not spoil that for ourselves. We're gonna get there. That's true. That is very very true. Okay, let me catch up on chat. I predict a lot of hush and runner decks. Does ice matters now? I think Daijin, you're so hush pilled, and like you're hundred percent right. I think Hush is really, really important. I think NSG has printed zero cards on the set that don't interact with Hush. They have printed cards that interact negatively with Hush that you don't want to Hush. You don't want to Hush a Piranha, but you will do it um, every once in a while. But I agree. But I think that's just what NSG's thing is. So let me just catch them on chat real quick. There's a lot of folks. Some folks I don't recognize names of. So thanks for dropping in. Daijin, by the way. Hey. Not Yeti, Ronha, how's it going? Rohit, thank you for supporting on Patreon, mind you. Uh, your name is in the nice credits and it's uh, it's very kind. George Osborne, hype. How's it going? I guess this as well. Damian Kubrakovich. Not yet. How's it? Welcome to the stream. Idaho, hey. Yeah, we're just going to be deck building. That's right. The animated title card is kind of sick. Thank you, Not Yeti. We spent some time putting that together for the reveal stream, doing a lot of like masking out of the people in the crowd so that the light could go through their legs. It was a lot of time. Good morning, Changeling. Seven in the morning working from home. Let's see how it goes. Brennan, 7 a.m. working the wilds of Canada. Hope you brought your hatchet. So excited for new cards. Cyber next snaps. Welcome to the stream. What a great song to launch a set to. That one's really goofy. That's the one with the whistling in it, right? Wake up, Samurai. <laughs> AVK. Seb, how you doing? All right. Ready to simulate, Jake? How's it going? I caught your message. Oh, that's quite okay. I need to respond to it in, in a second. Uh, hopefully you're doing well, huh? Rebellion time short here. Are we deck building without rehearsal? We are entirely deck building without rehearsal. So again, 65 new cards just dropped today. Eventually, hopefully later on today, they'll be up on JNet. I don't know if anyone has an update with that. We're going to be here for a couple hours. So if we get on JNet, we get on JNet. Let's just say that. Adam, how's it going? Izzy, hey, welcome back. How you doing? How's the launch been so far now? As a community person, is it like a, a, a stressful day as opposed to a fun day? Happy release day. Jason, thank you. You too. I don't think I said hi, Jai. Jai, how's it going? How's deck building? We're going to start here. I honestly think we're going to start where like, where do you expect me to want to start deck building, right? Like that's the question. 
I'm going to try to make a Jai Chin Ho as a thing, I think. Okay, how do you pronounce that one? We don't have the pronunciation guide. That's honestly the release document on, on, on Null Signal that sometimes doesn't come out on day one, but it's the one that I'm most excited for, which is pronunciation. So that card that I think I would call Jai Chin Ho, Jai Chin Ho, I think it's pronounced Jai Chin Ho. There's a pronunciation guide. Yeah. Jai Chin Ho. Jai Chin Ho. Mind you, we got some good corrections about some other cards we've been saying incorrectly. Like, it's not Cachador, it's Casador. So it's Charlotte Casador. Hopefully that's correct. I think my pronunciation is probably closer to European than Brazilian Portuguese, unfortunately. Uh, but Jeichinho, I'm so stoked for the pronunciation. Jeichinho, the ho is a U. Jeichinho. Yeah, there you go. Okay, happy report. It's gone so smoothly that I'm just enjoying it. Yo, well done. That's sick, Izzy. Well, buckle in. How's, uh, how's, uh, how's everyone finding the new set? Are y'all like deep in the tank already? Being in the south of France, I really get to watch live and say hi, but love the content. Oh, thank you, Yido. Welcome. Ça va? Thanks for making the stream. Happy to hang out together and wait for the drop. Yeah, hey, me too. Who is Braganza? Basalt Spy has a lovely flavor text. Mela, Braganza seems to be the CEO slash general who is in charge of Nuvum. Now, your next follow-up question is, what is Nuvum? And genuinely, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Uh, I feel like the launch of the set was kind of strange. And I feel like there's, I still got more questions than I do got answers on a lot of fronts. And I feel like just some fundamental explanations of what's going on and the set as a whole might not have landed in the way that I was hoping. So Nuvum, no idea. Literally still no clue what Wayland is doing. Why are they doing real estate? Why did they grind down the rainforest? I got nothing. I, I don't know. I don't know. And I want to be excited about this, but I just think this is a text box and not much else. So hopefully uh, we'll find out sooner than later. But yeah. They buy and own Lords of Land. Yeah. Okay. That's all I got. I, I don't got more than that, which is unfortunate, but hopefully we get something soon. Is your thirst for crim slightly more quelled for that? Have a sword for criminals to assassinate people with? No, I don't. Mel, I don't. And I was thinking about this a fair bit. So a narrative piece dropped yesterday, Morgan put up. Uh, and it's like a pretty noteworthy narrative piece because it has like pretty memorable narrative beats. Now, specifically, I in terms of like this piece found, found, making feel like a criminal thing, I don't think it does it for me. And maybe I'm just like, you know, whatever, I'm going to move the goalposts. But I did not read this piece and think that, that Mercury is a criminal. It came out like Mercury is an anarch. Is that not the case? Something was done for non exactly selfish goals. Obviously, what it was done was illegal. But of course, everything in Neverwinter is illegal. But it was, it was an anarch piece. It wasn't a criminal piece. Am I, am I the only one who thinks that? Like, it wasn't done for self-interest and for personal gain. It was done as a politically motivated action. That's an anarch. Right? I don't know. I don't know. This piece was interesting. Can you walk through your process a little as you deck build? Adam, 100%. Or maybe there's another video we should watch for that. This question came up someone recently. I know Jeff has an old video at this point talking about deck building. We'll definitely explain what we're doing when we're deck building, especially all 59 cards of our Nuvum deck, but we'll go from there. Why not Google lady pronounce? <laughs> I found a lot of like the YouTube pronunciation guides to be like honestly jokes and intentionally incorrect haughty kudarati all that sort of stuff as a streamer I'm quite hyped for the pronunciation guide oh it's so important it's so good I've been running around telling people how to say these words all spoiler season yo that's appreciated Melandrigam with a silent M okay and a soft G Alandrigam I think I did that one worse and buy an online. I think Nuvum led the military coup. It's why they were the protesters in hearts and mind. They were with the pro yeah, Cold Lob. I think there's something there. I just don't think we saw the story. I think there was a story that was meant to be part of launch that didn't land. Okay, so look, my criticism about the launch documents is like I realized this when I was writing together the article, like the little blurb underneath the the spoilers video that we put out. Is if yeah, someone had to ask me like, what is rebellion without rehearsal about? At that point in time. On Wednesday of uh, mid-spoiler season, I couldn't actually tell you. I thought the Tomlin Initiative had passed. That's what some of the marketing material had. But, like, I don't have a good idea what was going on in the narrative of the second half of the set versus the first half of the set. I think the first half of the set, we understood who the players were, what they were doing, what was going on. And then I feel like the second half of the set, because largely was, you know, prefaced with two narrative pieces that were, you know, like kind of slices of life. They weren't like, really establishing what was going on. I honestly don't know what's going on. Like, we still don't know what Nuvum's going on. I think there was a narrative piece that was meant to tie together Nuvum and then probably Seb uh, that didn't land. So, like, I, I got more questions than answers on a lot of stuff. Uh, so, I don't know if that's going to get ironed out soon, but I don't, I honestly don't know what's going on. I don't. 
Four cards with expendable subtype. Do we get four new cards? I feel like we got a couple. Hopefully these two delayed fiction pieces will fill in some blanks somewhere. Hey, Con, yeah, I think so. I, th I think it's necessary. I also think it's really strange that like the major narrative beat was like released eight hours before the set came out. Right, like if this sort of piece came out at the beginning and we had a big understanding of what the set was be about and some of the major themes, I think it would actually do a lot to make people more hyped for the set. But like one of the biggest narrative pieces came out literally for some parts of the world. It was today. Maybe that's fine. Maybe that's how you launch a set. But I think if you have something that's like that important, you probably want to do it a bit earlier than that. No, assassination is not a crime confirmed. It's obviously a crime, but like it's the same sort of crime that an anarch would do, not a criminal. Criminals generally, to me, do things because of self-interest. Uh, I don't know. It's a weird sticking point. Anarch would have blown something up. Criminal is targeted hits. Think of the mafia. Okay, so when it came down specifically back in the day to why different factions did the thing they were, it wasn't about what they did or how they did it. It was about why they did it, right? It's about how they think of it. And if you look at all the criminals, they're doing things for self-interest, either the act, like crewing money or information or whatever it is. It's for personal gains. They're running because it makes sense for them on a very selfish level. And I don't think that is Mercury. I don't think that's Mercury. The whole TAI is very anarchoded. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. Mercury's based. To be honest, Seth feels more criminal. Mercury feels more anarchy. Yes. And I do think the fact that one's connection based and the other one is like, and really one of my favorite things about this piece is that it does a really good, good job at making me understand what Mercury's ability is meant to be. Which again, if you, okay, we'll talk about the piece. If you haven't read the piece, it'll be very obvious. But Mercury uh, kills a series of uh, high ranking officials, including the president. Um, why? So, intentionally, it seems because there was hope that doing that would change the the vote outcome of the Tomina initiative. It turns out it did. I don't see why those are exactly connected. It might not have, um, but apparently kill enough people it does. Uh, but yeah, this making Mercury being like somebody who is, you know, in terms of the physical angle of Netrunner, like breaking into places, if you get through the ice, you can do more damage on centrals. I think it does a good job to make me more excited for Mercury. And I think this is why like my Nuvum uh, kind of criticism kind of is the way it is, is because we saw a lot of fiction back in the day that made you more excited to play certain parts of Netrunner. Like Shoeflower put out the piece, uh, what was it last year? So a couple, it was a while ago now, talking about Ampere. And it showed how Ampere worked. It showed a bunch of the people inside Ampere's offices and what they did and the struggles. And I don't like Ampere, but reading that piece and then even listening to Shu read that piece, you know, about a year later, I wanted to play Ampere. And I think we're just missing that for Nuvum. For what it's worth, I think this piece does a good job to make people excited for Mercury because it makes Mercury, you know, make sense, <laughs> make a bit more sense because I'm not the biggest Mercury fan in terms of like gameplay. And I think it's cool that it actualizes Mercury's ability. Uh, but I don't know. A lot of parts of this fiction don't focus on the parts that I thought were interesting. Like why Adam? Like, what does Adam do? And then the whole thing, like the Tommen initiative is not talked about that much. And like, apparently the whole government collapses and it's, you know, a couple sentences. Like, I don't know. It, it, it was a bit, a bit, uh, bit interesting for me. Mercury's always seemed like an anarch. Yeah. Hey, Ocean, how's it going? I guess like central servers bypass is very criminal, but yeah, it does feel anarchy. There's a piece of lore explaining how Gmod is in a wheelchair. Sebastio? I don't think so. I think it's a mix. Doing it three times is part of an attempt to more permanently change, remove the directives Mercury is forced to live by. Oh, like you think the three hits were targeted attached to directives? I didn't make that connection. That's obviously interesting because, you know, directives by three. But like the hits didn't seem to specifically align with each one, right? Like it was just this person that gave information about this person, which gave information about this person. Yeah. Merkel's surprise stream. Tron, how's it going? Thankfully, nobody would ever accuse NSG of having a favorite child in Anarch. <laughs> Only the last M is silent. Oh, that's so much more. Makes way more sense. Thank you, Lucille. Uh, Malandra, hey. Malandra, hey. Damn. They want to be free, didn't they? That's pretty self-interested. Saving everyone else is just a bonus. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, obviously, like, there's self-interest attached to it because if the Tomat Initiative passes, it's going to be a problem for Mercury. But to me, it seems more like a political goal. I don't know. Maybe. But maybe the sort of, like, self-actualization where it's like, wow, I really want my life to be better. I'm going to kill three people. Right? Like, it seems like it would have to be on a bigger scale than that. Clearly something went on with Adam, but that part of the story wasn't focused on. I don't know. That's the part of the story that I think is really interesting. It's like a name drop for a character that has importance for people who've played Netrunner for a while, but then it wasn't really dwelled in, delved into, so I, I don't know. Do we have a card for the lady posing ominously between the Twin Towers, the one to find a way? I don't know. I think that's meant to be the new president. The new Brazilian president. Mind you, these four cards are, I think... 
some of the most important cards in the set. That being said, I have mixed opinions about these cards. I think specifically some of these cards are like inherently kind of problematic. Uh, not the win condition so much. I'm actually surprised how I don't feel that strongly about the win condition, which could have been pretty bad. But I'm not sure. It seems like everyone dies. Like, it just seems like it's, you know, Call of Duty. Everyone dropped the nuke, and now we have to walk through the fire for a bit. But I think this is meant to be, like... Because inherently, the story is, if you want to argue, it has a bit of a punchline that after all is said and done and the dust settles, we're kind of back where we started. Uh, and this card does that, minus five. Uh, maybe that's a bit of the point. So... I don't know. I, I think that's meant to be the new um, government, but it, it's 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 a bit of a haunting picture, but I don't think I have a clear understanding exactly what's going on. But that's okay. I think they mentioned that all the runners were more politically evolved due to the events taking place. Yeah, 100%. And it's a story, right? About byroids and clones losing inherent basic rights. And so, like, obviously people are going to be politically motivated. But, like, when Mercury was first pitched, we saw Mercury as, like, a coyote who their job was to bring people across the border for pay. And that made more sense to me in terms of like, oh, that's a criminal narrative because they were in there for self-interest. And this story, again, it's more of an anarch thing, I think. Methods of the crime are more crime-ish, methinks, infiltrating by sneaking through the weak points and stuff, though it's genetically good strat is more crime of mine. Uh, I think what's really cool too is like, and I was thinking about this recently because I think it was in uh, Ryan's video, El Delgado's video that went up, is that we saw a playmat, the old playmat with silhouette on it. And silhouette hasn't really showed up in any fiction back in the day. Uh, but having that sort of like boots on the ground criminal is something that I think we're kind of missing because silhouette was a stealth operative. Like there's cards of silhouette breaking into places and Mercury now being the one criminal that I would say most often will be physically breaking into things. I think that's pretty neat. I think that's definitely worth something. They were all delayed due to car accident, I believe, so it's more than understandable. Oh, that's unfortunate. I hope everything went okay. There's a good climactic end of the scoop, especially with the reveal of Jay Chinyo. I'm still saying it wrong. I'd say the timescale of the directive rehabilitation seemed a little compressed, but maybe that's just me. Therapy doesn't go so fast. So the, in the story, like the dates were called at T, you know, T something. So like there's a long stretch between T29, T900. So the time does go back and forth, which I kind of appreciate. What I think is really confusing is I'm pretty sure that this date is actually before the entire liberation cycle. Because I think the liberation cycle begins to happen around T27-ish, where like it talks about Mercury going out and starting to like do coyote work. Uh, so it's strange because this goes behind even further. Um, so I could see how it sometimes, you know, to get all the, you know, the books in a line might be a bit tricky. But um, it, it's interesting that it, it, it's still somewhat linear, but you know what I mean? To be fair, Mercury's a byrate, so not having byrate shipped back to HB is their self-interest. Oh, I know it is. I, 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 I see that for sure, but it seems more like politically motivated, like Mercury's doing this for their kind, for all those, you know? What did pronouns get added to NRB? Yeah, this got added just a couple of days ago. Another shout out, but now pronouns show out. It doesn't really show up on FFG cards because I don't think NSG wants to assign pronouns to characters that they didn't create. But say we look into, oh, I was going to pull up a new card. Let's not pull up a new card. Let's say we go to Manuel Latos de Mura, another new card, and it should have pronouns... This one doesn't have pronouns. A bunch of the cards have pronouns, right? Maybe only the IDs do. So what's an ID? Uh, Essa. So Essa's pronouns. Pronouns Zizer. Like, that's sick. That's really, really cool. Uh, I, I was uh, expecting this to happen for a while, and it's awesome that it did happen. So anybody with pronouns will show up. Uh, yeah, what's another runner? Like, uh, I was going to search Charlotte. Does, does, like, do characters have them? I don't think. No. So it depends. Probably IDs mostly do. I'll be interested to see if other supporting characters do. First half is set up, but the second half expanded and resolved it, I think. Epiphany was relying on the politics to pass TAI and Atea, making advantage of the chaos to hunt. Okay, hold on. Let me read this slower. The first half set it up, but the second half, I'm so behind in chat, excuse me, and resolved it, I think. Epiphany was relying on the politics to pass TAI and Atea, taking advantage of the chaos to hunt. But Nuvim read the room and supposed the protesters with the military and Prysec, and Thunderbolt realized they could make money by supplying the military and supporting the people. So to me, this doesn't make a lot of sense, because I think the passing of TAI would have happened relatively quickly. So HB setting up a military arms works shop and doing all that sort of stuff doesn't happen overnight so what i see it is that hb has been there for a while that's just what they're doing in south america that's fine that's not a criticism i don't need a reason for them to be there but like that doesn't make sense but the parts of the story that i find most interesting is why is nbn doing this why is the hollow man passing this up and the why of what is happening i don't think was well explored like it's kind of a line just saying oh we looked into it nbn was doing this behind the scenes but like that's the most important thing like, I don't know, maybe I was expecting a reveal that NBN wanted to do this because they wanted to pit HB versus Jinteki so they would collapse, so they would have a political role. Like, none of that is spelled out. Maybe you don't want to spell it out. Maybe you want a, you know, future story. But, like, the cool reveal of why things were happening wasn't there. 
as much as also sometimes what is happening wasn't exactly there. That's what I've seen so far. Like, I still don't understand when Nuvim's there. I think narrative is going to come eventually, but there's some self-motive in the story because Mercury uses gold to free themselves from the directives. That is true, right? Every I think every hit, the directives get smaller and smaller. Hey, Dirty Deeds. It's because by assassinating the president, they got the successor to veto the TI. His past legislation was on the desk of the president to sign. Was that in the narrative? Was that actually in the narrative? Yo, Veronica, how's it going? Say I wanted the runners to be less heroes. I'd argue, yeah. Like, that was a criticism that came from the first set. I, for what it's worth, I think this story does kind of push away from this sort of hero aesthetic. Maybe an anti-hero, but like, at the end of the day, yeah, maybe still. To me, all the runners in the set have the same drives and wants, which makes a degree of sense. There's a lot of thematic depth to the set. How's it going, D? So having a runner go against these themes is a problem. But as someone who likes playing runners with an array of motivations and driven, it definitely feels like crimes aren't crims and anarchs aren't anarchs. They're all just some freedom fighters or some different drive. Yeah, I think that's largely how I feel about it. Um, again, in the sense of like the political fight. And I honestly, there was, I think maybe a reference in the story about specifically also uh, Arasana, who's had very little mention in narrative in the last little while. They talked about how people were coding messages in, in street art from the favelas. Maybe that's Arasana. I'm assuming it does, which is a cool tie in. But yeah, I, I agree. It's uh, it all kind of it's attached. And mind you, this set is all usually advertised as a, what is it called? A narrative set or something like that. There's a term they use for it, which I think that does a reasonable job. But I kind of agree. Yeah, they're all just kind of anarchs. Yeah, right. I mean, conflicting interest among the runners seems more interesting, but I understand the set was about them coming together. Yeah. And like 100 percent, the set was about them coming together. Like we got Dan Card of them, like all standing next to each other, like the the final shot of. I don't know. Oh, no, well, not this one. This one is another final shot. So it's actually a beginning shot. Oh, I keep opening the wrong lines. It's the third card. But I think it's more complicated than wanting the crimson to do this crime. I think it is more complicated. I, I don't think it's just like knock over an ATM for me, please. I don't know. Mercury paid three cards to trash the powers that be. Yo, how many people paid two cards to trash the Hollow Man? Because I did and it was sick. <laughs> the Hollow Man thing was awesome. I really like that. Shout out to uh, Hartman B and Ams. I'm pretty sure. That crime is murder. Anarchs have done more murder, I think, on whole. I still think Anarchs are murdering people left and right. Like, I don't know. Anarchs are the ones with bombs and stuff. It's just, uh... Only if never run a universe, so we argue political assassination is a criminal act. <laughs> no, <I'm> not. <laughs> oh, what's the third reference? Is Apex here? Um, there is an Apex... There is Apex representation in the uh, Tom Initiative. Or not the Tom Initiative, in the Liberation Cycle. We'll just leave it at that. It's not as overt, but there is Apex in there. We get a few vignettes for characters. It's hard to say this is what they're usually like, and we're most likely to zoom in on a runner in the moment where they look more anarch. If we say anarchs are the ones with ideology, then suddenly all runners have to be anarchs because everyone has ideology. Well, it's not because they have ideology. It's where their ideology lies, right? How's it going, by the way, Apple Pie? Again, man, we haven't even looked at cards. That's what I signed up for, but I'm glad we're having this conversation. People are pretty hyped about it. Uh... I don't know. The way I saw it is like, why do you run? It was like the big thing. And mind this, this goes back to FFG days. And if she looks at this a different way, that's totally fine, right? Like, that's really cool. But generally, the criminals is a bit of self-interest and self-gain, right? Like, we saw a lot of runners like that. Gabriel Santiago, mind you, Corset, wants to get paid. Doing the bank job, right? We're running centrals. The gab doesn't work. It works. Gab works. Uh, that was it. Just to get paid. No bigger ideals besides this is the job that works. And then we saw, like, uh, Reina Roja. This is a bit later. But Reina Roja was, again, a freedom fighter, very similar into a lot of themes that we're going to see specifically in this set, where Reina Roja was ex-super military uh, and is specifically like attacking, I think, Blue Sun and wants to have the shut down and is fighting for liberation on Mars, right? Actually very similar in an overlap. And then you have shapers who are doing it just because it's creative and kind of fun, right? They're doing it because there's self-expression and because the art itself is worth the payoff. It doesn't have to be bigly politically motivated. And then you have overlaps, right? Like maybe that's a part of the set is that we have Arasana, who's a mixture of somebody who's doing it because art is, you know, at, and at the end, self-expression and all that sort of stuff is, is important, empowering, good fun. But it's attached to a political motivation. Um, who else is like on the political spectrum of like criminal? Uh, what's the name of the, the jack out criminal? Oh, it's been such a long time. They didn't see a lot of play. But there are some criminals like that are also in it on a sort of political angle too. Nero. Thank you. Nero Severn. Nero Severn was a data dealer. Like, inherently, there's stories that involve Nero Severn not dissimilar. Mind you, there's a fair bit of overlap between the Mumbad cycle and the upcoming cycle right now that we're in, uh, where Nero Severn was an information broker, and uh, their information was used on the, the sort of exact same clone versus byroid suffrage movement that was going on here, or anti-suffrage movement, more specifically. 
Um, so we've seen these overlaps, but I think Nero is someone who seems more self-interested than Mercury as the criminal versus criminal and the anarchist versus the criminal. I don't know. It's not that big of a deal. Actually, I believe it's more thematic than a real moment. It's the new president showing how the three runners did all the work and at the end of stuff is mostly the same. Yeah, <laughs> it's a punchline where like at the end, nothing really matters, which like sometimes that's hard to land. Like, obviously, it's a bit dire, but we you kill three people. Obviously, Seb and Arsan are up to something at the end. It stays the same, which I'm actually surprised that to be that is the answer from NSG or that to be the the ending from NSG. Like after all the work, we're back in square one. I, I thought, I know, like maybe we say about how uh, maybe we wanted something that is a bit more uh, pushing us forward. Tentacle story. And the entire unrest was over a single month. I don't know how long it was, Jai. It, it wasn't that like, I'm not sure how long it is, how long it takes to go through progress because the marketing material says that the Tamina initiative passed through legislature. So the last thing it was waiting on, from my understanding, is the president's signature. Obviously, the president's not going to sign it. Uh, so I'm not sure how long it was. It seems to be pretty sudden. Mind you, Brazil was meant to be a safe haven for like pirates and clones. So people were going out their way to come there. And then obviously they got rug pulled real hard. But at the end of the day, I still don't understand why. Like, I don't understand why the Tamina initiative exists. And that to me is the part that I'm like, wait, I thought we would figure out why. Like, why is MVN doing it? Like, Epiphany seems so important in the narrative and then didn't come through. I realized I was referencing Apex as mostly because they're glowing red. Um, Morgan's talked to me a bit about the Apex stuff, and I said I wouldn't say about it, but hopefully there's something coming in on it. I think Chad has mentioned a lot of uh, where it is. I think the 30-day timer is Mercury going for murder. Oh, because there's a 30-day timer through here. Yeah. I don't know. There's like a sentence in this thing that just says, like, Mercury, you know... The government was corrupt. Mercury released information. The entire government collapsed. It was a coup. That one paragraph, that one sentence is like where I think the interesting story is or there is an interesting story there. And that's the sort of stuff that I thought would get covered more to some extent, because I think that is the majority of what's going on when you're playing Netrunner in the uh, rebelling with that rehearsal is the government collapsing because of massive corruption being exposed. But yeah. Didn't get the story into that Adam was there because he taught Mercury how to preemptively change the directives. Did the story get into Adam? The story introduced Adam. Okay, so this is here, right? So for those who don't know, this image is the meeting of three people, uh, two of them from old NSG, uh, FFG lore. On the left, we have Adam. Adam was the original Byroid runner, uh, which came out in... What's it called? Date and Destiny. Date and Destiny was a deluxe box, which on the runner side came with three mini factions. Sunny shows up, mind you, in the set in a way I find kind of offensive. And Adam is here as well. And Adam was the big, cool, very, very loved runner by a lot of people on the fact that Adam had directives. And then through Adam's gameplay, and it didn't actually come out like this, which is fine, is that Adam started the game with these resources called directives. And then you were meant to trash your directives and basically break free of these like Asimovian chains. Turns out most of the time you wanted to keep your directors around the way that it played around because the directives were relatively good for you. Besides this one, this was bad. The second character there was Dr. Lovegood. And you see Dr. Lovegood in the art with the glowing goggles and the glowing cigar. Now, Lovegood was an interesting card, didn't show up that much in Adam, that's fine, the narrative is its own thing, in which you could use Dr. Lovegood to disable some of your directives, to turn off the text on a resource. So this turn, where Adam had to do this thing, you could say, I don't want to do it this turn, and so these two characters are really important. If you read the narrative, Lovegood introduces Mercury to Adam, for sure, and then what happens with the two characters, which I'd argue is probably the part I'm most interested, is not exactly explicitly in the story. I'm assuming that the two of them together, like there's an explanation of how uh, they can break through their directives because Adam technically has done that sort of as much as it is still through Dr. Lovegood. But yeah, I, I don't know. Like that to me is the cool part, not the name drop, but like how that conversation happened, what they're talking about, which isn't exactly there. I'm so behind in chat. I don't know what to do. Uh, by the way, the other night I caught the VOD at the Pat Prank stream and you guys were alluding to something concerning Manuel. Yes, we'll talk about Amela when we go through the cards, but Manuel has Sonny's flavor text on it. It's not, I don't like it. Thunderbolt was in Brazil to make money and couldn't do with Byroids. They switched the money to, to military, right? Long before TII was discussed. They've been there for a while. There's no way. Agree to the motive, agree on the motive of Epiphany being unclear. Yeah, I don't understand why Epiphany is doing, like, the Tommy Nishes is a really big thing. We don't know why it happened. Like, we don't know why it happened. It didn't happen. That's obviously good. But why did it almost happen? I don't know. All men felt like a very power behind the throne kind of character, so it was disappointing that he was overly pushing TI instead of being more politically opportunistic. Can someone explain why the vice president vetoed the TI? This was going to be, yeah, I don't understand it. I think it was, it was said in chat that it was on their desk to not sign it, but like this seemed like a chance that this wouldn't have happened. 
Like maybe Mercury just had to kill a fourth person, right? Like how many people you got to kill before they're like, I probably shouldn't sign that one. That's I don't, but I'm not 100% sure. I thought Epiphany simply, simply gets paid to fabricate a certain result. Maybe, but that's not clear. And if that's the case, why this result? And by paid by who? Right? Like it just, anything produces more answers than questions. Or sorry, questions than answers. The vice president vetoed TAI because Mercury killed three people and the vice president don't want to be number four. Yeah, we're assuming, but maybe they did. Maybe they didn't know. I don't know. People are dying. So like how, it was it clear that a Byroid did all the kills? No, I don't think so. I don't know. I like a set that ends. In terms of a climactic like ending of, we haven't seen a set that, well, actually sort of we have. We've seen sets that have stronger narrative beginnings than this set, but this set definitely has an end. We can talk mechanically about this card too, mind you. I think this card is mechanically cursed. I think there's arguably some cards here that probably exist because of narrative reasons sooner than mechanical reasons. And I think these are mechanically very problematic cards, like incredibly problematic cards. And that kind of concerns me. Oh my God. I thought when I was seeing this art, I saw this art. <laughs> I thought it was Adam and Mercury shaking hands. And then this bottom hand, I was pretty sure was Dr. Lovegood just holding their hands to be like, I did this, but no, it's Adam with like a two-handed handshake. That makes more sense. Sometimes it feels more like the official lore is Anzuki posting a GLC, which is a problem IMO. Yeah, I'm not too in GLC, so I don't actually know what that goes like. Hey, Grendel! Good morning and happy RWR release day, everyone. How are you doing? Particularly, I think Mercury started way more criminal and shifted Anarch with this, them starting charging for their services until they became radicalized. Yes, I agree. I totally agree. I, I And I think we saw that in the first part of the set, is that Mercury, when Mercury was first introduced as like a four-pay coyote, 100%. And yeah, this story is basically the story of them becoming more radicalized until doing, you know, political assassination for political mean, uh, for good of all byroids, which is a good story. It's definitely a good story. But like when we talk about criminals, this is maybe not the most important point. Thing is, it's hard to tell a story without narrative growth. They can start in one place, but their goals change. So having them end like anarch like is fine if they start in their faction motivation. Yeah, I think that's true. When it comes to like, obviously, that's the whole narrative here is about change over time, you know, for many reasons. So Zaya, Tao, and Rene would be comparisons. I think Zaya is also kind of cool. And when it comes to being a criminal, because if you read Zaya's lore pieces, Zaya is kind of like the sunny for criminals, where Zaya is out there just making money, doing illegal trades, penny shaving, skimming, uh, getting, you know, the Docklands Pass access. But at the end of the day, you know, she's just going home because she wants to provide a better life for her, for, for her family. Uh, great. Like, maybe that's all I want. Like, obviously, it can get less simple than that, as, you know, straightforward as Zaya's character seems to be. We don't know too much about Zaya. It's probably a bit more interesting. Uh, but I think that's probably it. Yeah, while Lou is, like, you know, on the front line. He works in kitchens providing food for strike workers. Like, he is an anarch, capital A anarch. Uh, and then Dao, well, that's clear. Um, I forget what in the motivation of Dao's lore, but Dao is saying that he wants to do things because he wants to do things, just because they're kind of in his self-interest. And I reckon there's some amount of like, yeah, you know, the magic of it. But I think that's exactly it. I think Gateway did a really good job differentiating the three factions. Generally doing a lot of heavy lifting here. We're zooming on Ari Merc in the most anarch moments of their lives, but that doesn't make them anarchs. I don't know. Oh, everyone's saying Nero in chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yo, Eric, how's it going? Monday stream. Are you streaming tonight, Eric? Liza is a good example. Liza is a really good example, too, because Liza is like a politician, which seems, you know, potentially politically motivated. That could be an anarch thing. That's a really good shout out. But inherently, Liza's there to uh, to push Liza forward. Square One's Byrods are still free, so the fight was to keep things from getting worse. For now. I think it has to be hard to balance faction by the character's motivation when the character's tool set. Mercury definitely uses the crim tool set, even if their motivation changed. Yes, and I agree. I agree. I think the way that um, I think that's a really, really good part about this piece of fiction is that it gives uh, an explanation and it makes me more excited to play Mercury. It really does, because now when I'm like, unfortunately, inside jobbing HQ to see three cards, which like still hate that play pattern, uh, I'm I'm t doing a break in to do a murder. Like, that's cool. I'm in on that. Given how these things are going in real life, it felt like kind of affirming to acknowledge that it was still worth it. That's true, actually. That is a cool point. That, like, at the end of the day, was it still worth it? Almost definitely. We got Levy. <laughs> I'm not actually sure why the end of the story is so mel melancholy tonally. Didn't the rebellion get what it wanted? I think it did. It definitely did, right? Like, the TII has been repealed for now, but I still think there's power structures in which these things can happen over and over again. And obviously, like, that's a hard thing to change. Adam big. Adam is massive. I also think Mercury is meant to be pretty big. At least if you look on the scale here, and maybe they're standing at different distances, but it looks like Mercury's standing at the front. Uh, Mercury seems really big. 
Our son is meant to be younger, though. Am I bad for being happy with the Sunny cameo? Yeah, definitely, Veronica. 100%. <laughs> Gotta get that checked out. I think the characters are left with the sense that the new president isn't a true ally. They'll have to fight this again. Yes, the new president just seems to be another cog in the machine that obviously has been problems for everyone. Bring mini factions back. We need APOC. I wouldn't say that far, but I think everyone likes the mini factions. I don't think we need APOC. Do people put a counsel? No one we cared about died. Hey, Ilya, how's it going? Just finishing up working. We'll come hang later. Love the new set. Yo, welcome. We've like just sat down for a while. I've opened a can of worms talking about uh, this this narrative piece, but we'll talk about the cards in just a second. Wayland was behind the vice president. Spratella, why? How? Says whomst? It was just Tavares' vice president. It was just the person there. They weren't put into power. They were just like, oh, you have to because the first person died and you signed a contract in which that would happen. Are all three dead? I thought the person on the right of the powers that became president and the powers that be in this. Oh, I don't know. So this is meant to be, I assumed it was the three assassination targets. So the person with the medium length hair, um, they have a name, Tavares, right? This is Tavares in the middle. Uh, and then the two other people might be two other people that were assassinated. Maybe the person on the right is the person that take over. But the, some of these people are named, right? Like, I forget what their titles are. It didn't seem incredibly important. But, like, two of the people were killed to get to the president, finally. Uh, this might be those three people. I think that would make some sense. Maybe we get to this later. But can you say more about what you think? What do you mean, Adam? Oh, about the cards? Yeah, we'll get to it later, for sure, when we talk about the cards. So I'm meeting of minds immediately thought hostage is back and better than ever. Oh, man, Evie, how's it going? I think this is this is messed up. This card shouldn't exist. I don't know. I feel really strongly about this card. I haven't played it yet. We'll see how it shakes out. But I think cards that just say search your deck for a thing added to your hand, especially when it comes to virtuals, shouldn't exist. It's not good for the game. Right? Ugh, I don't know. Obviously, we had a hostage. But like, no, that's going to be a problem. We know that Zai is the abyss. Yeah. Recklessly speculating. I think it's plausible that Wayland sees powers possibly in their pocket and like doing hearts and minds popularity thing by vetoing. That could be incredibly wrong, but it feels like Wayland Koo being two lines. Is, did the Wayland do a coup? Like, I don't know what Wayland did. I don't know what two of them did. I don't know what's going on. Anyone know when the cards hit JNet? I don't know. We're going to just hit refreshing every once in a while to see it. I would be surprised if it happens this afternoon. Sometimes it takes a while, which is like, that's fine. We're streaming tonight. Fiercely printing proxies and bulking, building decks, and we're not sure we're going to play Nuvum, Epiphany, Ari, and Stabby deck. Oh, cool. We got worse Levy AR. Obviously, we got worse Levy AR, but not meaningfully worse. Remove five cards makes your deck thinner. <laughs> That's consistent. If I play Slay the Spire that says, do you want to remove the five cards at the top of your deck? You do it every once in a while. It's fine. Arsa Hunches? Yeah. Don't forget to hit like, Chrissy. Thank you. Not sure if you've seen it, but we announced a meme contest last night. Decent GLC community announcement channel. Okay, cool. I'll look into that, Eric. I'll be able to share it probably tomorrow. Oh, no, I'm sorry <laughs> regarding a sunny comment. Okay, I think I'm almost caught up in chat. The thing is stopping one oppressive law is like a battle in a long war. So stopping one law doesn't stop the problem behind it. It's a win, but it's never a complete win. So how many people do we have to kill? Right? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Is the message we just got to kill more politicians? I'm, I'm not sure. Obviously, it's incredibly difficult. I got here. Sounds like we're talking about why Mercury, Adam, and Lovegood are meeting a story. Yeah, we did mention it. Celestial. How's it going, by the way? Yes. So basically, because there's a lot of heavy lifting done in this story for these characters that some people who are newer to the game might not know. And that's a really important thing to understand. Like Adam being like, and then they met Adam. I don't think means much to people who don't know who Adam is and Adam's import in the narrative. So I just want to make it clear that this card, Meeting of Minds, also the way that the mechanics text works out, is meant to be really hinging on the fact that you know who these characters are, which hopefully you do now. You might have to rewind the stream a bit, but um, yeah, that's very, very important. All three on the powers be got assassinated. Okay, Stacey, how's it going? Thank you. So these are the three targets. Do we know what's in the briefcase itself? Andre against Mutual Favor, but Mutual Favor is an icebreaker, and you need your icebreakers to play the game. You don't need to get your turning wheel, or sorry, your twinning. You don't need to get your companions. It's so hard. You can print icebreakers. You're expected to print icebreakers in the history of Netrunner. This card now, as soon as there is a problematic virtual card, you can get it in your hand on turn one in any criminal matchup. Cards like this mean that if they're good virtuals, you're going to see them more consistently in more board states. The game gets less interesting. It has a design constraint on virtuals. Mind you, there's a lot of virtual cards that are banned. Virtual is a good subtype. And now we have a card that just says, oh, I'm going to get them. And obviously it's a bit expensive, but not even. Like, do you know what you play this in? You play all the companions in Anarch. Fantastic. And then you just pull your turning wheel, gaining a credit sometimes. Like, I don't know. 
it seems like it, it incentivizes some of the the ugliest parts of of it's like it's a Yu-Gi-Oh card a tutor for a card in your deck I don't know icebreakers is fine because you need them to play the game like mutual favor special order that stuff is fine but we've not really seen a card like this outside of a five influence Adam card which is search your deck again for a hardware or an icebreaker which you need to play the game inherently you don't need virtuals to play the game Mean the more cost four. It does maybe, but it doesn't cost four. It functionally costs three because you can reveal the card that you added to your grip, right? Add the card. So it functionally costs three. And mind you, this is like it, I could be totally wrong about this, but it's totally to understand is that we've played ridiculous costs to either replay problematic cards or consistently get problematic cards. Same old thing back in the day was a really powerful card. We spent three clicks to replay an event from our bin. And that is an issue when the card to play from your bin is a problem. So I have no doubt that either that this card is not a healthy design potentially, but like at some point paying two to three credits to go get a thing from your hand is right. Like how much would you pay on certain board states to get the turning wheel in your hand? Two credits, three credits seems fine. I don't know. It also like a lot of this now means you can play even on faster like career fair because all the virtuals mind you are just about resources so now career fair is a bigger hit so a lot of times you're paying two credits just to get your turning wheel down for free i don't know i don't think we need cards like this that give consistency to the, like multi-axis win packages i don't know i i'm not my thing in my union recently we recently had a big win a long thought battle to keep a family in their home was finally successful and we all got super bummed out after knowing how hard we fought for such a small win we had people drop off completely after i think the fiction is pretty good in that sense oh that's really cool The power brick on my laptop broke the day before release. Oh, Chrissy, sorry. Janet update is later. One of the devs posts in GLC. Okay. One of my buddy calls them memes. Adam is the name of the first man on the earth. Amen. Yes. Well, uh, the names are pretty heavy handed when it comes to naming that byroid specifically. If I can bring up the Cuban revolution, please, Izzy. It's interesting. Real change usually doesn't come from assassinations. There was an attempted assassination of Batista that failed, and their analysis of the revolution is that had it assassination succeeded, they'd have won mere reforms instead of overthrowing the ent entire Batista regime. Yeah, and like that's a fascinating thing. Like when it comes to uh, admittedly a pretty complex political situation, the answer would be, be kill a couple people. Like, th to me, that lacks the sort of depth that I maybe wanted from this narrative. Because you're right. Maybe, you know, and we saw some flavor text, too. There's one flavor text where Sebastian was like, I got to shoot a cop. It's like, I don't know about that one. But like, at some point, yeah, violence makes sense. hundred percent. But uh, it's it's not always right. I don't know. The light bulb from Pulp Fiction. Yeah, it has the Pulp Fiction glowing light bulb by Marcellus Wallace's soul. With Megan Minds, we missed the early game exciting. Excitement? Yes! A big part of the game is drawing your cards from your deck in the order the game gives you. Otherwise, all the games become the same. If I can consistently pull the power cards from my deck with a card like this, I'm going to consistently pull the power cards from my deck with a card like this. I do not like this. As tearing for Asmund to grab the knife. Aurora, how's it going? Yeah. Also, like you can now in As get DJ Fenris. So you can play Sebastio and Criminal, right? That's arguably pretty cool. I think the connection part of this is like seems less problematic because we had hostage. I just don't like the design of this card. Six credits winning is too expensive. It's five credits winning. It's two credits winning if you have uh, uh what's it called career fair in hand. It's not six. Oh, well, it is six. You're right. It is six. No, I said it wrong. It's six to three. And I'm not saying whether that's good, but then this is the question: Are we saying that this card is so bad that we're not going to play it because the numbers don't make sense? Then why do we have the card? Because this is what I think these cards are inherently problematic and they remind me of designs that NSG kind of went out of the way to not do. Mind you, this is a reimagining of a card that was, I think, banned, if not restricted in the format for a long time. And I've said many times on stream, it's good that we don't have a Levy AR lab access. I've said this many times on the stream. I like Netrunner right now because we don't have Levy AR lab access. And mind you, we're even at a point where some of the Anarch decks that maybe don't want to play this have a recursion issue. And so while Levy is definitely an easier to play card for some people, mind you, it was actual influence, more influence than this out of faction. The question is then one of two things happens. Either this is playable or it's not playable. If it's not playable, I'm not excited because then it's just not a card that's worth anything. But if it's playable, I think we have problems on our hands. And both of these cards represent that. These seems like cards that have to exist for narrative reasons. But in terms of what they could do to the gameplay, I don't know if it's worth the payoff. But again, I'm more of a gameplay Netrunner person than a narrative Netrunner person, for sure. Yo, Kato, how's it going? You're saying turning wheel? I think you mean the 20? Yeah, definitely. I'm definitely meant the 20. Because <laughs> it's not good doesn't mean people aren't going to try it. Yeah, people are going to play it. Even if it, it turns out to be bad. It's like, okay. 
then I don't know. Meaning the Minds is going to be gross anywhere crowdfunding is legal. But that's the thing. It's like some of the worst cards are virtual cards. I think some of my least favorite cards in Netrunner are virtual cards. Some of them are banned. Obviously, we can play the whole companion suite and you actually can somewhat make money. And this card makes sense with Mystic Miami. So do Anarchs play this? Maybe. Do they need to get their twinning down that soon? Maybe not, honestly, but they could for sure. Uh, then like, obviously there's some band stuff. Like we had Dreamnet recently. Like there's just inherently a bunch of cards that being able to tutor the one of Dreamnet from your deck, it's probably not good for the game where we just have now three draws on our deck for Dreamnet as much as Dreamnet's banned. You know what I mean? Leading up to the Russian Revolution, various assassinations happened, including the Tsar, but the Russian Revolution didn't succeed on the assassinations of the Tsar. It was the mass movement that led to the general strike that finally pushed the royal family out. Izzy, thank you. What have I missed? Look at Ross. How's it going? We just talked a bit about the narrative. We're going to be diving into the cards. I've been trying to catch up on my chat and have my coffee, but I've been kind of like stoking a fire a bit. So we'll get there. I guess I'd argue the crux is less the assassination did anything and more than Mercury and Seb felt compelled to reach that level. Yeah. Assassination storyline may be only smart part of Mercury's story arc. It's the only part we have, though. Obviously, yes, Mercury is probably a much deeper character than saw Adam killed people. Like, obviously, we'd hope, uh, but we just haven't seen it. Meaning Minds would have been nice with either Spark of Inspiration or Wizard box text. Yeah, yeah, kind of. I think this would be more fun if it was less consistent. Like, that's the problem. It's incredibly consistent. It is perfectly consistent. Just doesn't say right with the return to status quo and the ending of the story. Off to work, have a good stream. Brennan, enjoy work. Levy was only restricted, never banned. Okay. NSG is seriously hitting a stride with the art in this. This is a really good art. I really, really do like this art a fair bit. This is Benjamin Galetti. Um, I think meaning is cool because you need a lot of connections to make it efficient compared to hostage. Yes, but I'd argue any deck with a lot of connections is install runner. And I'm worried about that. Like, I'm generally a bit concerned about Seb because I don't think we saw a lot of good payoffs to Seb. And it seems like it's a lot of install runner. And then if you're play, having a hand with four connections, like, how are you running? Right? Like, tribal deck support is interesting. It's just like, oh, man, there's so many more ways this could have been more interesting. Like, make a run. Jai, how did Bingo go, by the way? Levy got banned. I'm surprised to see it back. I thought Harmony Air Therapy showed the level of end recur. Yeah, and that's, like, a thing that mainly I'm a bit reticent about parts of the set is, to me, did it actually get banned? No, only restricted. Never got banned. Um, is that there's a lot of designs in this set specifically that seem like they were designed by a different NSG that designed the set before. Let's keep that in mind before we go to the cards. But there's like a lot of fundamental design things that NSG has gone and gone out of their way to avoid. Things like on tempo <laughs> recursion. Like recursion in general shows up a heck of a lot in this set. There's obviously a fair bit of bypass stuff. I'm not going to be personally excited about that. Uh, but there's like some weird things that I'm surprised. Like I'm so surprised. NSG, who specifically they went out of their way to say that they want a faster game uh, that's a bit speedier. That's not about like, you know, a grind of a game. And then there's a reset your whole deck button. Right? Like it's... NSG was very clear that they want limited recursion in the game, and then there's a reset your deck button. Now, you could argue that maybe Ashen Epilogue is unplayable, and this is not a problem, but then why is this unplayable? Why was it was printed? I don't know. There's a, We'll talk about it when we go through the cards, but there's a lot of stuff to me that's like, this doesn't seem like it lines up to the design ethos that I saw on earlier set. Can they just be niche playable because there's a space between Trash and Bustle? George, I would like it if this is niche playable, but I'd argue that any deck in which this is niche playable... Having to play against a runner that resets their deck and then you're like, oh, I thought I won. I have to do the whole damn thing again. Just like we did in Levy. It's, it's not great. It's not great. <laughs> like, that's a big thing. Is like, Levy wasn't in every deck. Far from it. But in the decks that was there, it was incredibly important. Now, there's other problems surrounding Levy being good modernly. We don't have the same old thing, mind you. The cards like this also encourage you to play other recursion cards like Katurga Breakout and uh, Buffer Drive and Labor Rights. Other cards that can potentially also be problematic. So if this is worth playing, which we didn't have to see the deck for that to be very obvious right now. It doesn't look like it is. I don't know. Meaning on mine's reliably used to fish out DJ and run a tag focused sub deck. I yeah, Tron, exactly. I don't know. I don't know. The remove five cards from the game and the two influence is very important. I think the remove five cards from the game doesn't matter. I think two influence doesn't matter too. Like people played three influence for Levy out of faction. Obviously, that matters a bit for Shaper, who weren't playing influence. The remove five cards from the top of your stack, I think only matters so that you can't play this as a consistent reset button to be like, oh shit, in criminal, I lost my fractor. I'm gonna reset my deck, because you might lose it. But I think resetting your deck, eh, maybe it doesn't matter. Because when you reset your deck, especially when it came to like prepaid voice decks, most of the decks, you were cards you were resetting were like events. 
because you installed all your hardware program. So if you're resetting maybe now 20 cards, you're still resetting 15 events. I still think that's fine because you usually didn't get through your second levy. And then your deck is more consistent and you know what you're drawing into. So it's a mixed bag. I think it's interesting, especially with the theme, but I don't know if it's a huge detriment to the card itself. Meaning the Minds is going to be bad, no stress. It might be, but like then if it's bad, the constraint it has on the design space is not worth the payoff of the card. I don't know. This is just not... It seems like it needed to be there for other reasons than gameplay. Meanwhile, only Corp that has assassination as text on his agenda, but it's not an assassination. <laughs> That's true. So uh, we didn't talk about the win condition. I think we'll talk about this later. This is fine. But this is an assassination agenda. There are assassination cards on the Corp side that are not assassination subtyped, which is very funny. Recurring your entire deck is a tool against mass damage done by Corp to combat the type of prison deck. Otherwise, it will not help against archetypes. But Diogen, it's, it's, a, it's medicine for an archetype that shouldn't exist. Right? Like saying that this is good because then you don't have to worry about 100 cuts, which doesn't exist in Neverland because NSG has done a good job and make that not exist. Doesn't mean we should have it. Right? Like it's, it's an antidote for a poison that we should just not have the poison. That's the way I see it. I agree. Levy was really strong against like the grinder decks. And back then there were grinder decks. They would go out of the way to remove from game your Levy AR lab access. This is not it. I don't see how Levy's going to be a problem. Obviously, there's no max, and I think Buffer Drive seems to work better with Anarchy. Yeah, I think Anarch self trash stuff has this, but then, like, why this card? I don't know. Go through my prediction quiz. It's wild how most of the Corp cards in the teaser list were NBN. Give me back crowdfunding because I can play Meeting for three credits. I know. Levy was only restricted. I remember being unable to play it. It was rotated. Yeah, it was restricted. I wasn't sure, Veronica, either. Levy's fine. World Tree Ari is already going to make Outlasting Runners impossible. I think World Tree Ari is probably a fair bit better now. I disagree that we only saw the Mercury assassination story arc. We saw early mercenary work, insider covert work, worries about protecting people they've grown to care for struggling with. I think we just saw, like, okay, I don't remember because it's been a while. I haven't reread it in a minute. But Calvin wrote the story from the first set where Mercury was just like trying to protect people on a dock and was attacking Wayland goons or something like that, security officers. Just because we have Zoe instead of June, maybe she has different goals. I don't know. I honestly don't know. But like, I think this whole set with the 130 cards were designed together. So maybe, again, it's a weird pack break, uh, but I don't know if the designer change midway is going to be that big of a deal. It'd be hard to. Levy cooks Grinder. It did, but we don't have Grinder. We should be happy about that. And Grinder went out of the way to cook Levy. Is it possible we're making a statement about assassination being a sort of selfish crim way to attempt to create change? I don't think that comes through, Will. How's it going? Will, by the way, I need to message you. Oh, my God. Hopefully you're doing well. I think maybe they don't want grinder to be a thing with which i'd be happy with yeah but there's better there's other ways right to make grinder not happen and it's not planted to influence card that you have to put in your deck to battle grinder right i think someone mentioned on daily cast that hopefully the existence of this card yeah I, just don't make grinder <laughs> like i don't know I, I i think if there's grinder and then you were putting this as two influence in your criminal deck like grinder just seems better now it's not good i don't think it's good now so i don't know if we have to deal with it what deck are you playing on trying first Nuvum. i think we're gonna try Nuvum out because it seems I want, Nuvum is the thing that I think is going to play differently than it looks. Do you have any time frame of how NSG are publishing the PAP for RWR? Got to print some proxies. I have no idea, Tanuki, unfortunately. I don't know what they classically did. I do think the epilogue is great against Grinder unless you already have a buffer drive since you can just get it out of your hand. Maybe the new levy could be played in prepaid Kate. I think you do play this in prepaid. I don't think you play it in prepaid Kate in like Eternal because you just play levy. And you don't need like two or three of them. Calvin wrote the early one. That's the one I know, Eric. That's the one I remember. Isn't this a way to play a big deck Anarch without big deck and fuel the pawn shop, Q loop, Shaper, Crim decks? I'll reserve judgment. I think if you're playing big deck Anarch, you probably want to be playing the other stuff. Like there just seems to be better support for Lagu, like buffer drive, labor rights, all that sort of stuff. And arguably some of that stuff is a bit problematic. So like having a big deck, getting through it and doing it again doesn't really happen in most mat matches where you would want this sooner than you'd want to be bottomed out anyways. What is the grinder archetype? Yeah, all the cards are up. Yeah, Eric, we're going to jump in just a second because I caught up to chat. Neutral cards cost influence. Yeah, there's a bunch of them in the game that cost influence, so everyone has to pay for them. Unless you're playing Empire. Or I mean Nova. What is Grinder? Grinder is an archetype that used to exist back in the day that its goal was to deliver any amount of damage to you over and over again. So we used to have cards like this that was neural EMP that just said if the runner made a successful run, do one net damage. And so the deck would just go out of the way to recur this over and over and over again. So they'd be like, oh, ran net damage. Okay, I'll put this back into my deck, net damage, net damage. And then you had other cards back in the day that would just do incidental damage. So Kakago, mind you, we didn't have Hush back in the day. When you ran through it, you took a net damage. 
And so basically they could build a board state in which you almost always ran out of cards in the game. And then once they ran out of cards, they could just score an Obacata protocol on the table, let alone just kill you with Neurospike. These were sometimes called potato decks for reasons that I still don't fully understand. Um, but these sort of decks that just weren't trying to make plays, but just ice up centrals and attrition you down. Every card you play, you lost a hit point. Those are not very good decks for the game. And they were tried to be banned out multiple times. They were unbanned shortly. But like NSG is doing a really good job to make the archetype of just like, I'm going to sit back and do damage to you. Um, not that strong. In fact, they've even gone on the way to make these sort of cards, which are the sort of operations that do damage, not do permanent damage, which is good because then you can't use these because bring them home gives the runner negative two to negative three cards, which matters for making plays on the board, but it doesn't give them minus two or minus three hit points on a long game. So like NSG is doing a really good job of ensuring that the that sort of archetype doesn't exactly exist. Grudge work is a decent grinder list. I don't think grudge work is really a grinder list. It's setting out to do with an OTK usually. Like it's setting out to kill with a, uh, with, it can grind you out on value, but it's not trying to do small bits of chip damage and make you run out of deck. Generally in those matchups, you don't run out of deck. You die because they can build some sort of board state in which clearing house is like lethal. That's usually how it goes. So it's close to it, but I wouldn't say it's exactly it because they're actually putting things in remote servers. Neuralia be legit as Mr. Beast on the art, you think? Ah, kind of. How's it going, by the way, chat? Ashen's good for Anarchs, especially Lou with 40 cards using the price catch on Banhar. It'll allow the player to build the board state very fast and lock things out early. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think there's a chance. I think you still have to play with labor rights because if you lose it, you lose it. Uh, but a lot of the Lou decks we see right now specifically want to get to the bottom of their deck so they can just like buffer drive the same uh, strike fund over and over again. So I think it'll be a slightly different build, but I think Diogen, that is definitely a home where you can consider it. I just don't think it's going to be exactly the sort of imp Lou decks builds we see. Potato because potential leash? I believe, yeah, Fenris. It's because people brought potatoes. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Was it a joke of meat damage and potatoes? No, it's a, uh, yeah, so, okay. So it technically came because of this is there's a card called Potential Unleashed. Uh, this was the worst of it because it said whenever the runner takes at least one net damage, trash the top of your stack. So now the grinder archetype was twice as powerful because one net damage is now two functional damage. And people showed up with potatoes as their ID and uh, that was the joke. I don't fully get it, but it's fine. All right, let's look at cards. I'll be making Anakam Lago, trying to speed run my deck over again. And yeah, I think it's really cool too. And also like you can play, uh, what's it called? Joyride. You can draw a lot, discard cards. You don't care. VRcation. Like it allows you to rip through your deck. And then once you're set up, reset. Like that's actually really interesting. That allows you to just rip through your deck because you're going to know you're going to play your deck again. And so a Shaper deck that's like joyriding, VRcationing, doing all the draw they can is a very interesting thing. That being said, is it healthy? I don't know. I'm surprised that we, we saw it printed. Let's just say that. All right, you ready? Move the potatoes to board and it breaks your morale. All right, here we go. So some of the cards, very few of the cards are new. I think we saw only like two new cards so far. We've seen Sebastian so far. Uh, I think we've already talked about Sebastian on the channel before. We're going to go through the cards, I think, relatively quickly. Mind you, we're going to do a tier list with Jeff. It should be uh, in the end of the month. The counterplays to play never like a potato and do absolutely nothing. You better off spending your time eating potatoes. I think spending your time eating potatoes gives potatoes a bad rap because potatoes are kind of sick. Uh, but yeah, generally in that matchup, click for four credits was not a wrong turn. You don't want to install your cards. So Sebastian needs a couple things to make sense. A lot of connections. I don't think that's going to be a problem. A lot of ways to get tags. I don't think that's a problem. I think we saw a resource that allows you to get a tag every turn on largely your own terms. That seems incredibly important. Are you seeing RWR as the new Flashpoint? Oh, far from it. Far from it. I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of designs here I'm surprised to see, but I, I don't know how it is, uh, how it's going to shake out. But there's a lot of stuff here that I think is like, OK, that's interesting. Like, that's not what I expected. So I worry my concerns about Sebastian is that I think there's a lot of really interesting engine pieces. Not a lot of them are super interaction based. There's some running stuff. Uh, mind you, we saw two run events, I for an eye and then uh, what's it called? Praxis. Uh, those are going to be cool. I, th I think for sure. A lot of this is just like value text. So to see how this works out, I don't know. I've heard some, you know, constant donation that this might be a bit more install runner. I could see it. I think when you're playing against Sebastian specifically in this upcoming week, ice archives, Sebastian is going to run archives. It's going to be a problem, but you definitely have the ice archives uh, and we'll see what Sebastian does. What's interesting about Sebastian too is that inherently there's HQ pressure as well. I think R&D is the one server I'm not too worried about in the early game because Sebastian could be playing cards like Hot Pursuit and other stuff to push forward. 
right? Like there's a lot of good payoff cards that give you tags. Mind you, a lot of folks might have to dive into some of the older FFG card pool you might not be familiar with. Rogue trading, also very, very powerful, but none of these things are inherently very interaction based. Turns out Sebastio requires you to not have a tag. So while I think people will try tag me, I don't think a tag me is going to make that much sense with this ID. I also think you can play a bunch of Sebastio stuff in other factions, potentially. I think the connections are not only Sebastio cards, and that's kind of cool. And it's also Gmod. So as long as you remember what this text is, I think there's reasons to consider playing this in as that can also play connections and get two uh, boards. As is not a Gmod, though, right? As is a uh, mechanical, yeah, cyborg. Okay. You can do very hype things with potatoes, tater chips, fits in mashed potatoes. I gotta go. Hope to catch up the stream later. Really excited to hear your take on Epiphany Analytical with RWR cards. Hey, Veronica. Yeah. Um, I think there's some really cool reasons to play Epiphany now, which is great. Yo, Alec, how's it going? Seems like Hoshiko is that you want to swap between two states to consistently generate values. Yeah, Gordy, how's it going? That is true. Is that like you obviously want to take a tag, untake a tag? Mind you, untaking a tag is also just inherently board based where or you play an event. We saw a neutral way to clear tags, which is definitely good. You definitely want it in this deck. It's also a connection, but there's not too many ways to interact to do this bottom part. So you're going to spend a, a fair bit of time in your base doing your base stuff, which is is interesting. Bing bong, how's it going? Um, yeah, I'm excited to build Sebastio. I'm again, we'll see how it works out. I think there's a lot of pieces there. A lot of it is a bit more engine based Netrunner than I think I'm excited for. And honestly, when it comes to things like Hoshiko, like as maligned as Hoshiko is, Hoshiko inherently has an interaction based text box. This is also the first Anarch I think NSG has printed ever that doesn't say draw a card on it. I think that's something you have to keep in mind with Sebastio is that Sebastio's ability is going to require you to do a lot of things in the same turn. You need to be constantly drawing cards. I think Earthrise Hotel is pretty good for that. I don't think we've seen a lot of draw based connections besides the class act, which for five influence, I'm not sure you want to do that, uh, but you need to have a constant hand full of ways to install things, get tags and remove tags, uh, especially a lot of connections too. So deck building might be a bit of a uh, problem. Like it's going to be a tricky affair, but I could see this potentially be very, very, very good. The Nihilist? Yeah, but the Nihilist, you have to play viruses too. And now you're like six or seven, you know, steps down a really slippery staircase of all your things working out. Oh, Nuka. Nuka's really good. I'd argue that Nuka may not be as good as anything else. Firstly, paying two credits less, you want to land that as much as you can. If you don't, it's not the end of the world. Like, I career fair down a two cost card, it's fine. But when it comes to Nuka, I'm maybe don't like Nuka as much. I think Lago is a better uh, call there, Augustus. I agree. It's because Nuka is click intensive. Before Nuka draws you three cards, it's two clicks. And inherently, all the things Sebastio is forcing you to do requires a lot of clicks. So I think something like Lago, which is a connection, and interestingly enough, is probably a better uh, option. And even just like Earthrise Hotel, right? Like clicklessly drawing six cards for a single click. Okay, summon clicklessly. That's kind of what I want more. I think Lago would like a bit better. And you are going to probably be playing the Trasher hand package with it as well. Uh, oh, the, the console, mind you, is a draw engine. We'll get to that. But I do think you want to make sure you're drawing well. I'm not sure I would go to Nuka that soon. I could be easily wrong about it. Play God of War. Yeah. All right. Eye for an eye. Um, flavor text on this. I shout out. I think the flavor text on this is really strange. As the riot turned to open conflict, Seb looked down at the gun in his hand. Time for peace was over. Is Seb going to shoot a cop? Who's Seb shooting? I like the move to violence when, you know, conflict doesn't make sense. Yeah, I'm not going to not endorse that. But, uh. This is the one flavor text that I think is so strange from everything else we've kind of been shown of Sebastian, who is, you know, seems more like a, a backline talking to people thing. But like, are we gunning down riot officers now for political change? You can fetch your class act with meeting the minds. That's very expensive, though. Class act is the way I've spoken. Class act, I think, is fun if it does make sense, because drawing the right card for the board state is going to be important for Seb, because there's going to be hands where you just draw like six connections and no way to get a tag. It's got so bad he had to do something extreme. But like shoot a riot officer? He has a gun. Like, where is he going with a gun? Like, Seb is portrayed in so much of the art as like, you know, a nice, you know, person of his community, and now he's armed. Like, I just, I just it's notably strange. Anyways, the card play only if you're not tagged. That's a bummer. Obviously, it means that you have to not play tag me. He is Anarch. Sometimes Anarch's going to ACAB. I think Anarchs are going to ACAB. I just don't think Seb is going to ACAB like that. It's a nice gun. What's your deal? I don't know. just doesn't know. Your friend is the ultimate Seb engine fixing piece. Do us whatever you need and pays you. Yes, but it is limited time use. Like it's a one shot. So it's not very great on card uh, flow. But yeah, it's very, very good. So run HQ if successful, take a tag and access additional card when you breach AQ. Mind you, if Seb's text is active. Yo, Seymour, how's it going? I think you left a really nice comment the other day on, on a video. 
The mechanics suggest the gun fires in both directions. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, notably, the additional cost of trash your stuff is going to be really important because you do want to float tags a sub. I don't honestly know how cursed the R plus uh, matchup is going to be because R plus just gets two credits. I think that matchup is just going to be straight cursed. I don't know how to deal with it. Mind you, if you don't care about their ice on the other side, it's anti cursed because if you face check into a ping and it allows you to install a card for two less, like that's kind of cool. So I don't know without testing how bad the R plus matchup is going to feel because giving the corporation 18 free credits through a game pretty bad, but making their ice face checks work for you kind of feels good uh, regardless. If people are trashing cards in hand to trash your resources, this is kind of like Essa, where you want some sort of HQ multi-access pressure because they're generally throwing out their worst cards, so their best cards will be in hand. So I value this. I don't know if this is my first stop to do it because access trash one card from your grip trash card you're accessing, that's a powerful effect. If you're specifically choosing the cards that you're trashing from your hand when it comes down to like, you know, strike fund, uh, I was gonna say iPad worse, but steel skin, like that's obviously very good for you. Uh, but understanding if you have slots for all that package, whether you're playing viruses and you're playing imp, because mind you, solidarity badge wants you to trash things anyways. Do you need this for solidarity badge, which would only get one power counter? Kind of tricky to figure out the slots in. Um, it's nice that it gives you a tag and that matters, but I think we've seen enough ways in Anarch to get tags on your old. Old card wanting destruction, admittedly, but like trading a card for a card from Anarch is like not particularly efficient considering some of the other engines they can build. To be honest, R plus for Seb might end up feeling like Thule versus Essa, who knows? Yeah, exactly. Where the matchup is really bad in some ways, but really good in some other ways. So it's going to be volatile. That's at the minimum. Just play Sunset. R plus is still in Sunset, right? I don't know. I don't carry a gun or anything, but yeah. <laughs> sucks. I suggest you start deck building Sebastian with T3 Hush. I don't think I would, because I think specifically the NBN card pool, you don't mind the stuff that gives you tags. Like, I'm not sure I would. I think Daijin, what do, name a faction that you wouldn't put 2 3 Hush in? Sunset is gone of today. Oh, I didn't know that. It's sunsetted. Trashing of your own cards could represent says losing some connections, resources over the willingness to be more violent. Yeah, maybe this ties this together. But um, yeah, I don't know. Strange card for sure. Yeah, actually, Seth, we had a lot of hot tags. Oh, we're just getting to the cards now. Things going to be important to use eye for an eye to feel solidarity badge. But for solidarity badge, which is incredibly important, it seems, for Seb. And I think there's going to be some Seb decks that are just not playing solidarity badge uh, for better or for worse. Uh, it's still kind of rough because run HQ, pay one, take a tag, C2 cards. And mind you, you can stack this with other multi axes, which is kind of cool as much as this gets a bit more difficult. Uh, yeah, you only get one counter on this because it's the first time. So I would honestly think if I'm playing Solidarity Badge, you're probably better off for a card slot just playing Imp and assuming that you'll get Imp to fire twice over two turns. Imp is better on more board states. So if you want to trash things because you're playing Solidarity Badge, I wouldn't go to this first. This is going to see play if the HQ pressure is necessary, if the tag gaining is necessary, which it is actually very important to have enough cards in your deck that tag you. And then this is like, OK, uh, but yeah, it's not doing that much for me. Why not both? Because of slots. I think slots are going to be pretty hard instead. I think the slip between decks that use uh, the card I don't know how to say, uh, and I don't think you spelled right, so I don't think anyone is going to say it, and the ones that don't. The cops are wailing the lib cycle. I don't think so. That's not exactly true. You definitely don't play the console without the badge, but you can definitely skip the console. Eh, probably. Andre's fire today. Would you spend influence on the new criminal connection searcher in Seb? It depends on the deck. That's the sort of thing that has to come down in testing. Maybe if you build your deck in a certain way where there's certain one of connections that you're like toolboxing for the certain matchup, then yeah, maybe you can. Uh, but it is a fair bit of influence. And I think influence goes relatively far in Seb because connections are obviously out of influence. There's some pretty good low influence connections. So we'll see. Yeah, things like networking, also no free lunch or seem kind of nice. Rogue trading, hot pursuit. Like there's some also really good tag payoff cards and tag getting cards. And understanding whether you need to spend three influence to get the right connection. We'll figure out if that's right or not. I like an eye for an eye for a way to use strike fund steel skin if you're running the price. I agree on the MC. Yeah, no, it's really good if you're playing that package, which I think you are because you're probably playing Lagu because it's one of the best draw connections in the game. You could play, mind you, Proko. Um, I don't know if I would, but you could. Uh, yeah. Now, this card is frightening because it is just a chunk of text. Again, I talked about how I think the parts of the set are very strange to me because they contain a lot of things that NSG has kind of been avoiding. And this card is just recursion on top of recursion. Anarch Recursion right now is on the cusp of being problematic. Now, this card costs nothing 
It gives you a tag, which for Seb at least is good. It's much harder to play this out of faction. Mind you, that's like a design thing when it comes to privilege access and eye for eye is that on the basis, because it costs a tag and you probably want to clear tag in most matchups, you're not playing Seb. This becomes a double that costs two. That makes it really hard to find a slot in any deck that is doing something slightly different, but just keep that in mind. When you take a tag with this event, you may install a resource from your heat paying two less. Very important. It's not a connection. It's a resource. Running archives, gaining a tag for Seb, installing a thing for two less, then installing just like a daily cast, an Earthrise Hotel for one or two credits. That's really good. Ideally, you're waiting to threat. Big reason to ice our archives. You can install a program from your heap. What's that program going to be? Well, we talked about Imp. Really good target for Imp for sure. Is it free? No, you have to pay the costs. Getting a fermenter back. At the end of the day, it's still just a value bomb of install based stuff, which to me, I don't see why Seb has to run that much because you're just going to take pot shots every once in a while with Iru, but it's just a value brick of a card. It's just a brick of value. Uh, I don't I don't know about this one. Like, it's very, very powerful, and I think it's one of the best tag cards we've seen so far. But in terms of, like, what it does, it's just a lot. Just, like, just so much text on a card to just be like, install this, minus two. Also, you got a tag. Install this, minus two. Then install a program. It's just, I don't know. It's a lot. There goes my productivity, Z-Bag. Good luck on Monday. How's it going? One of the most interesting sub questions is how many duplicates of unique connections you run. Some of them are like, you know, replaceable. You also have to understand sometimes you'll lose your connection. So maybe you do want to play multiple ones. It's interesting though that Anarchs only ever play Simul Chip rather than Katurga Retrieval Run. Yeah, but that's largely because Simul Chip makes sense at instant speed because so many of the tools make sense at instant speed, right? Like you can pull an imp after they purge before you access sick. Obviously, you move around botulus. Like Simul Chip is really, 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 really good. So a lot of times you're not, I don't know, you could get a botulus with this. There's things you could get with this, but generally you get the stuff that makes sense on most board states, which would be like fermenters and imps and stuff like that. Seb is as of Anarch thinking about the way that may help. No, but I like as because as is run based. Like the best as card is masterwork. And Masterwork and Prognostic only do things if you run. I'm worried that there's not enough payoff for Seb to be running. And well, there is, like, there is. We're going to see a bunch of cards that say, like, while you're running, get a tag, stuff like that. Like, there is. But I agree that they're very similar. And I think you can be Gmod Seb in As. Is I like As a lot better because there's a lot more creativity. There's a lot more unknown. But it's all a run-based engine. So if you can't run as As, your deck usually falls apart. I think for Seb, that's not going to be the case. Are we bringing Seb with Thunder Art Gallery and networking speed installs? No, but there's some really good stuff there, David. I think Tag is probably worth playing as long as your card draw is good. I think networking is really good. We got a neutral networking, sort of, which we'll get to it. We're just going through all the cards right now, and then we'll do deck building. You're known on the fear of recursion tutoring. A large part of the problem with same old thing was the disparity in power level between cards. I agree. Most cards were really bad back in the day, with the notable exceptions of a few completely busted cards. If same old thing was reprinted, I doubt it would see much play, as evidenced by how little Katurga is seen. I agree. But it's not so much that I worry about recursion when it comes to like playing diversion of funds or blackmail for the ninth time, which, yeah, we both agree that's a problem. But it's more so that we get to a state where it's hard to build a uh, forward advantage in board state. Like, heaven forbid, you know, you purge the fermenter or the corporation crack the fermenter. Like, we had a really cursed game on stream last week in which we played the decklist of the week against a D playing the Lou Anarch. Every turn, the D cracked a fermenter for 14 credits. D pulled out the next fermenter with a simul chip. So... You're right. It's not so much of the problematic cards happening over and over again, but the more recursion there is, the less windows you have and the more board states kind of like become similar. That's my worry. It's like, oh, run archives, install a thing for two, get another fermenter. Like, how is the corp meant to intelligently interact with that? They can't. There's just going to be another fermenter there. So it's kind of tricky. Hey, Safer, how's it going? Networking plus the neutral and Thunder Gallery. How can this go wrong? I think it's actually going to be really fun. It's going to be really fun. I think tag is worth playing. Anyways. This is my concerns. This is just like an absolute like mess of, of, of value-based text. Amanuensis. Amanuensis. Hardware console. Two credits. It's unique. Gives you one MU. Not bad. It's very cheap for console. One MU is fine. Uh, it's not two MU. One MU. When you turn ends, place a power counter if you are tagged. Now, that's generally up into your control. So you should be taking a tag and floating it. Mind you, Seb's ability doesn't protect your resources. It protects your connection. So it's still hard for a corporation to do it. Understanding when they're going to trash your stuff. Fine. When you remove one or more tags, you may remove one hosted power counter to draw two cards. I don't know if you have to play Solidarity Badge with this. I think you can play this without Solidarity Badge, and it's pretty good. The question is what other console you have to play in that slot instead. Whether you're playing Knob Tree, Virus, Anarch, I'm pretty sure you're not, because I don't know how much Seb is going to be running in general. I could be really wrong about that. Uh, but this is definitely very good. A draw console... That draws you to a turn as long as you're floating a tag. There are a bunch of matchups where you can float a tag. If they trash your resources, it's fine. 
So the question comes down to how easy to float a tag, how much NBN, and what is a tag punishment? Because what's really funny too is not only, again, do more factions now have tag punishment as much as mindscaping isn't real. If they're greasing the palm, they remove the tag for you, which is kind of funny because <laughs> it means that it's harder for you to get value from this as much as it's not going to be impossible. Let's put in Yorognev. I'm not worried about meat damage. I think Yorognev is a really good shout out for a card that should be in a deck if you're flowing tags because it works. It's a connection. Um, but I'm not worried about meat damage because I don't think meat damage exists. Maybe people are going to start playing end of the line. And honestly, tempo end of the line is really funny when you tempo end of the line someone. And not only do they lose four cards, they lose two more cards from the Manuensis next turn. Funny. Six damage tempo uh, end of the line. But generally, you just want to, like, end of the line doesn't make sense. Because ideally, the runner's not going to be floating more than one tag. So the question is, what is the tag punishment in the game that works on a single tag? And there's not that much of it. Like, I think, unfortunately, self-growth program, like, probably you're going to see a bit more of this. Maybe the NBN matchup is so interesting on both sides, but you're just going to return the manuensis and then, like, their breaker to hand or their fermenter or whatever. So it's tricky because I don't think we have that much game ending one tag punishment. But we have a lot of annoying one tag tag punishment. So we'll see. Thunder. Yeah. Baseball bat works. Yeah. Thunder Air plus free lunch to get off turn triggers and trigger their console. Yeah, we've played tag as and firing on the corpse turn is really cool. <laughs> it's just genuinely really cool. Uh, with Sebastio, is it every turn? Oh, but a menuensis is, right? This is it the first time you take a tag? When you remove one of your tags, you may remove, yeah. So you can do it on the corpse turn. So when their turn starts, you can actually remove the tag with like a no free lunch and draw two. This seems good. It's a workhorse. You have to float tags. We'll see how good floating tags is. I think Sebastio is still playable even if you don't float tags from turn to turn. Curious to see what the value oppo is to turn off play one untagged. You know how many people are going to be mashing on Jaina to be like, why is my run event not work? Myself included when I'm tagged. And it, it actually hurts. You might have the tools to clear the tags better. And I think you do. But you do have to watch out that like when you are tagged, it turns most of your ID ability off. And that's very uniquely strange for Netrunner. We haven't had a Netrunner has a blank text when they are tagged as much as your connections are a bit safer. So keep that in mind. An assistant, usually literary, who generally takes dictation. Yeah, yeah, it's a dictation thing. This is actually, uh, from my understanding, a big accessibility um, research to get this art and this text to make sense. He allowed himself five minutes. He wished for more. And it seems like he's chatting with some people. Nice. Interesting. Uh, it's cool. It's a console piece again. Not exactly run based, but uh, okay. Wizard Chess, we saw this before. Man, if you want to see the store in Colorado that this looks like, it's so charming. Um, this is a card that I don't think is particularly great because it's hard to build a board state in which this makes sense, but it's unendingly fun. And I like that. I like that a fair bit. Um, I think inherently what this card does, mind you, it says run all three central servers. If successful, you can crack this to choose hardware, program, or resource. Then you go through your deck until you reveal the first two of the same kind. You can install one of them, which means if you call hardware, you can do wizard's chest into wizard's chest into wizard's chest into your hardware. Um, I think when it comes to hardware, program, or resource, Program doesn't make that much sense to me because generally to run all three centrals, you're going to need some amount of programs and the way that most decks are structures and are criminal or shaper, there's way too many whiffs in there to make this make no sense, right? Like if you pull a botulist with this, whoops. Now, if you pull a big program like an Orca, and I think Orca makes sense in this set now, um, you probably should just be playing Spark of Inspiration. So that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but it's still really fun. Resource, interesting. Again, it's not all a lot of decks are built with different kind of resources and running all three central servers, which if that's good for your deck, that's one thing. If you're going out of the way just to get a free daily cast, I don't think so. Um, so don't love it because a lot of decks are playing different resources amounts. It's very hard to see a deck that's only running one good expensive resource or two good expensive resources that getting down at the point that you've made three central server runs makes any amount of sense. I don't know. It's very much worth noting in faction, we have things like the price, which is similar to this and can give you similar value. And of course, we have um, also Gachapon. So I think Orca makes sense, Mela. <laughs> we'll get to it. The shape of cards are pretty weird. Uh, finally, hardware. And I think that's where this is genuinely interesting because we don't really have hardware tutors and you can build decks that have very few hardware and be very selective. I know a lot of folks want to do this and like get down their maw and have one maw on their deck or one console and one knob curry. And I think that's still pretty tricky and I'll probably still play price over that because you generally want your maw down not soon, but sooner than later. And being locked behind the inconsistency of running all three central servers and producing all your breakers is something that's not that easy in Anarchs all the time. That being said, yeah, we're going to talk about the new Jai Chinju. I did it worse that time. Um, and this card sort of makes sense in that, for sure. As much as I do think that card or that deck probably wants to play boomerangs and other hardware, potentially. So that one also might be tricky. 
I think it's a card that's going to be really fun, uh, but I don't know if it has a very obvious like first order optimal home. I think it's going to have a fun home. Wizard chest is interesting that if you hit another wizard chest, you can fire it immediately. Yeah, if you do hardware, you can get every wizard chest out of your deck for some deck thinning, which has some value. It's not no value for sure, uh, but it's hard to make this. It's Jai Chin Yu. Thank you, Jai Chin Yu. That's what I read and I forgot it. Smuggling knife ready to assassinate. <laughs> zero cost hardware if only it was Krim. Yeah, and this and like as would be really fun, but then that deck is running so much hardware that like it's super inconsistent. Big Orca. Orca is really good, but again, if you're playing Shaper, I'd play Spark way sooner than that because uh, it is Spark. That's right. I asked my neighbor who's from Sao Paulo how to pronounce it. Jai Chin. Jai Chin. Yo. Jai Chin. Yo. Are we doing you or yo? It's hard to say. Every Jai Chin Yu deck is going to be running three wizard chests and a single other hardware so they never miss. I don't think so. I don't think it's worth the influence, especially in Criminal. I think you can play Asmumpula. I don't think you're in a rush. Because that's the thing. At the end of the day, you cannot fire more than one Jai Chin Yu in the same turn. Ooh, not oh. Jai Chin Yu. Jai Chin Yu. And Jay like the bird, not Jai. Jai Chin Yu. We're getting there. It's going to take an army, but we'll get there. I think that's a really big thing about... J, I don't know how to spell it anymore. Jai Chin. Oh, damn it. What are you having there? A knife. <laughs> hey, what? <Lamar. laughs> okay, that's actually a really big thing, too. That's really easy to miss. And I like the balance around the way that uh, this card is structured is that you can only fire once a turn. So if you think you're going to run all three centrals and pop off three of these, you're not going to do that because it's when your turn ends. So while you can get your uh, your like your toolbox, what is it called? Your wizard chest, of course it was called wizard chest, into this. You can only fire once a turn. Can't take the Quai out of Metropol Grid. My French is not very good. <laughs> Mercury knife. I don't think I said hi, Steven. How's it going, by the way? Stick to J knife. I don't know. I really get annoyed sometimes when there's cards that are flavored and they have names from other languages. And then people go out of their way to not say them, as I did there, admittedly. Or they come up with like their own little cute nicknames so that they don't have to say the other language. I don't know if there was a card here in Slovenian, which can be really hard to say. And then at the end of the day, nobody gave a shit and just didn't bother and called it something else that they thought was close enough. I'd be a bit offended. I like it when, you know, other cultures are represented. And if we can just take the effort to figure out how to say the thing, which I love when you're correcting me on this, I promise I do. Uh, I think that makes a more interesting game. So if people don't want to say it and they call it like, oh, you know, whatever made up side name, I'm not going to stop you. But like, come on, we can get this to work. What language is uh, Jaro Merck? Jarogniv Merck's? I'm assuming Polish. It's been a while since we had to look this up. Jarogniv. German? A settlement in the history of Gmina Goszczyna, West Pomeranian? That's a Slavic name. Yeah, Polish usage is in Polish language. I think it's Polish. But that's what I mean. I'm not pronouncing Jarogniv probably properly. It's a word that a lot of people struggle with, but look, we're going to put the effort into it because it's cool. Grad school plus work plus union organizing has less much time for now, but glad I could catch a stream. Oh, hopefully it's going okay, eh? People calling Pikachu Pikachu my local meta be better. I don't like that one. That one gets me. I know a lot of nice people call it Pikachu. I'm like, come on, you're only doing that because it's a different language. Maybe you would if it was English. Just tuned in to hear your great take on pronouncing or trying names in another language. Pouch, hey, glad you're with me on that one. The store is actually called the Wizard's Chest, yes. And you can see what the Wizard's Chest look like. The store looks exactly like the box. I think, uh, isn't Martin the Diego Sadaba? Did a great job with the art there, yeah. Martin did Diego. You're the only reason I have any idea how to pronounce Yarknev? Yes. The whole set of like Slavic cards, like the Mest and Chesvos. And I don't even say that right. My shout out to the folks I've corrected. Like Azief. Like people say different. People say still say loop. And like, fine, you're trying. Um, but it's okay. You're Slovenian? Yeah, my family immigrated from Slovenian to 80s. Uh, I understand fluently Slovenian. I speak partially Slovenian. You pronounce Yarknev better than I could say <laughs> J Chinu in front of a three times from a mirror <laughs> thank you kuba yeah no anyways I, I i that stuff gets me sometimes on that note i don't know how to say this because we don't have the pronunciation guide yet but boitada is what i'm gonna say quietly hides deck title feature show i choose you <laughs> yeah no no no, no disrespect Stephen. I, I i know i know you mean well everyone everyone means well that's very important Okay, three credits, Icebreaker Killer, one strength. Uh, this is a card that was revealed relatively late. Oh, this is, Cat does all their art in 3D. The fact that it's like kind of the snake in the jungle, but it's, you know, the 3D. Oh, this, sing this in print and sing a full art of this in 3D specifically is great. Is Azief Slovenian? No, Azief is actually the name of a Russian, uh, 
I'm not exactly sure. A military, it was a, a person from military history who was like a, a provocateur, a socialist revolutionary as a double agent, an agent provocateur. Uh, it's a really interesting story about Yevno Aziev. Um, but yeah, the whole like burning a boat has some sort of uh, attachment to the Aziev story. But Aziev is Russian, very, very Russian. Almost everything in, uh, in that whole cycle was Russian. There was some like Turkish stuff with like the coffee angle. And I think... Yeah, I think like Sable Nyusha is meant to be like Slavic slash uh, Turkish. Yeah, I'm glad to hear people largely pronouncing Chezva correctly. It's not Chezva, but Jezva. I say Chezva. I say somewhere in the middle because that's how we say it in Slovenian. I'm going to have to teach my brother-in-law from Sao Paulo, Netrunner, just to get pronunciation cards. I don't, yeah, I don't even know if I'm saying Sao Paulo, right? Let's be honest. Okay, anyways, um, this is a weird card. It's cool. Blinded by its own wreath of flames, the Boitata seeks eye after eye until the whole world joins in darkness. I don't know if this is a mythological creature or a real creature. I would have to look into it. We're not going to do it right now. Pretty straightforward, Boitata. Nailed it. So, trash any of your installed cards this turn. That's a really cool clause because it's your installed cards. How they're trashed doesn't matter, technically. So, like, at the end of the day, if a daily cast walks away, you've trashed one of your installed cards because you trash it. Uh, you not the game state, you trash it. So keep that in mind that there's some use cases in which this thing can just fire. Obviously, simul chips, you don't have to play an Aesop's Pawn Shop deck, but this can fire more consistently than you think it does. But the thing is, can it fire when you really, really need it the most? Who knows? Understanding how good breakers are is really hard because we don't know what the meta is going to look like. There's a lot of stuff on the corpse side that increases the strength of ice. I think that's maybe an issue. I don't like that. I talked about that on stream before. Making the math of Netrunner harder doesn't make the game more, more interesting. So understanding if we have a four strength breakpoint is matters depends on the meta right now. This on its own breaks drafter, which for most is the yardstick we measure to, is five credits. That's obviously pretty bad. But as soon as you trash one card, not only does this get cheaper, this gets cheaper. So you break drafter for three credits, which is still not amazing, but not the worst. Uh... Hard to tell what this is going to do. It's going to be hard. Boitata and Pawn Shop Ari seems really fun. I'd argue that's probably not worth the two influence. Those sort of decks, like, you can probably just play Echelon or, like, even, like, uh, Polongi makes more sense in Pawn Shop decks, too. So, I don't know. This could easily see a home. I think the killer slot is really, really difficult for Anarchs. I think if I wanted to play a killer, and understanding also, like, what the Breaker Suite is for Sebastio is its own problem. But, like, do you play Noom? Because it can deal with all the big sentries and you can face check safely into, um, into Thunderbolt? Maybe. I don't know. This card doesn't seem hopeless, but it seems really hard to get value. Does the discount stack? I don't think so, guys. I don't think it says for every time. I think it's only one shot, but I'd like confirmation on that for, for sure. They see Diaper Breaker. Hey, JTFQ, how's it going, by the way? You think this is a Diaper Breaker? I don't think it stacks. No, it doesn't stack. So you can't, like, trash all your stuff and then run through sentries for free, which would be, like, a use case for this. If on the turn that, you know, you ripped your whole board state up, it could break every sentry for free. Like, it would be pretty cool. I think this card's interesting. Uh, maybe in limited formats. I'd be surprised to see it. But it's definitely, you can fire this consistently enough. And there's a chance that this is a killer that you can lean on in your Anarch deck. It's kind of hard to tell. Hey, Veronica, until the end of time, it's logged in. It's binary, it wouldn't stack. Stacks isn't the effects, both lines. Yeah, also, if you attach other things to it, I think any card that gives it text itself. So this was shouted out on a daily cast. Like, dedicated processor says host icebreaker games, you know, this sort of clause. And mind you, this card's three influence and not that important, but if you can give it other text, it will actually care about those texts, which is kind of neat. Uh, I think Baba Yaga does not gain this text and, and stuff. How do Anarch have a better killer? I don't think this is a better killer than a lot of the other options. I don't know. Don't hurt if you run Boitata with Echelon. Yeah, it doesn't hurt. But like then like maybe you do that. Maybe you can get away with that. It's hard to tell. Uh, another catch NR here. This is Heal Amphora. Virus 1 Strength 2 Influence. Interrupt clause. Whenever you would access a card in archives, you may host a face setup up on this program. Use this ability only once each time you breach archives. Now, that's not once ever that's once each breach so you can just run archives over and over again and just like sh snarfle all of archives up until you're holding archives on this card now when the corp purges this card they trash it so all these cards end up back in archives face up and they have to rip two cards at random from hq at random is really important because that's very very difficult and then of course this program gets trashed this program is not unique it's relatively cheap i am scared of this program I think right now in Netrunner, purging is very hard. 
it sometimes doesn't matter. And there's a lot of decks that care about viruses that make purging nearly impossible to matter because at the end of the day, the deck is running three simul chips and they're running you know, all this other stuff, right? Like they're running knob curry. So purging doesn't actually matter. I think purging is a really hard spot in that right now. Taking your whole turn off to purge sucks. Having a non-unique card that makes purging even harder. And then very importantly, when you run archives and access them a virus, you just host it on there so you don't get purged out. Also, very notably, a virus, the corp can choose not to purge. You can't force a purge. Uh, it frightens me. It does frighten me. I think if you play this in criminal on top of the Amakua to make the purge for the corporation really bad, because that's the problem with purging. Losing your whole turn to a purge is a disaster. There's a lot of board states where it's just not tenable. Generally, you have to ice up all central servers. And then on top of it, you have to rip two cards from hand. I don't know. This feels like kicking people when they're down already. Healy exists to stop RH punitive counter-strike decks. Yes, this exists. So when you run archives, you can eat the agenda. So punitive counter-strike, that sort of thing doesn't work. That's true. I don't think people are going to be playing this for that matchup specifically. I think people are going to be playing this. It's not as a tech card unless you really want to call your meta. They're going to be playing it because they have viruses and they don't want to deal with the virus. And then this is going to be annoying to everybody. Right? Like, what's an HP deck to do against this? Purge a virus, pay three credits, lose two cards at random from hand, lose your seamless launch, throw the game. I don't think there's good counterplay against this. It's interestingly not unique. So if you put two purges, now four cards, you just can't do it as a corporation. The best you can do is go to no hand size and then purge out because it's not an additional cost. So if you can't pay it, you're fine. What's HB to do? Win? Score out? How? You have an Amaku on 7 strength. This shreds op? Yeah, this is really bad for op. Because op wants to purge with the virus for fun many times in the game. I honestly don't know. <laughs> Poor HB decks. I don't know how common this is going to be. But I do not... Mind you, we had cards back in the day that made purging bad. But those cards didn't see play because they were just... That's all they did. And that wasn't a very good deck slot. But inherently, this card does a lot more than you think it does. Like, run archives and just kidnap a seamless launch so Precision Design can't put it back into their hands. Obviously, you're running this in a deck that's a bit disruptive, but you, they, you can just hostage player pieces, right? Like, oh, I'm holding your Spin Doctor. Now, if you want to Spin Doctor your Spin Doctor and you have to purge and lose two cards at random, right? Like, it's really, really strong on a bunch of axes. It's arguably quite strong. Can't believe they make macrophage worse than eternal. Cup is better hostage because you can keep it forever. Ian, how's it going? I I don't see it. I don't know. I don't know. You're right. You can't keep it forever. But I think if I'm playing like Amakua Krim, I'd rather play this than than uh, Cupulation. If it RFG instead of trashing, it would be better. Yeah, you can always bring this back. I don't think it's the best target in a virus deck to bring it back. But like you can make board states where purging is like the losing line for the corporation. I'm surprised. Because we didn't see any like purging boons in this deck, but this thing just hits a lot of things for for like kind of no reason at almost no uh, opportunity cost besides the deck slot. If Run Archives in their Tomb of Virus and Corp Purges, does the two trash card enter Archives face up or face down? Uh, they're entered face down, if I'm not mistaken, Chris. And then I'm not sure what the rules are that I think you you can choose to access them if you want because they changed the candidate rules. So if you hit them a virus and you purge, the Corp puts two face down into Archives and then... Any cards that were added into the candidate pool mid-breach, the runner can decide not to access. So you can choose not to access them if you don't want to. You don't have to access them. I think that's a candidate change. It's like because they changed the gank rule like a month ago. So I think that falls into that camp. Seems like Healy conducts scoring from archives as well versus decks that care about it. Yeah, it's very important against specifically Jinteki, but I'd argue against like op where you just like grab, you know, one of their win conditions. It's 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 potentially a problem. Candidate rules did not change for centrals. Oh, shit. Thank you. Good shout out. Yeah, you're right. They were very clear about that. So you have to access it. Okay, you have to access it. So that's how you give them the, the punitive agenda. I don't know. I think this this is... I, I, I don't know if... The way the game looks right now, I don't think you need to make my virus worse. I don't think you need to make purging worse. This does both, and it's attached to a relatively interesting uh, utility card that is flexible enough, as much as it might not be the most important card. It's weird that you don't generally want to put three on the table. Because putting two down does enough. Putting one down is whatever. Uh, but I think purging in this game is already in a kind of cursed spot. I don't know if I was excited to see another card that makes purging worse. Canada does not reply to rules. Yeah, that's totally true. Santa, how's it going, by the way? It's not Central's remotes. It's roots and in the server. Archives works the old way. It's only cards in the root of the server. Oh, that's why. Thank you, Izzy. Do you have to give back the card sleeve, though? No, you got to keep the card sleeve. And also, if they have a promo and you don't have the promo, you're allowed to swap them. Because it's your card now. You ever play for pink flips? Anti up. Is this worth... It's worth getting the art in the game? The art's really good. 
Um, the art here is like kind of low res. The art, when you see it like bigger, like on Jeff's stream and, you know, when you get the card in your hand, it's going to even look nicer than this. Because there's a lot of like really small details. Cat's really good at details. Yeah, okay. All right, we saw this card. Arusareus, Aru Aruaceus crew, Ginevra, help me out. <laughs> so this is an important card on the basis that you're allowed to take one tag a turn. That's actually a problem with Seb is that you need enough ways to be able to take tags. Uh, and having one card down, that means you can get a tag largely on every turn as long as you're interacting with ice is really important for Seb because this is a cost, but this is also an engine. This means you install a connection at minus two and that means you draw two cards, right? Like this is super important that Seb has a card like this and Seb deck building would be very, very different without this. So this card is gonna be very important even if it's unplayable because of this. So the ice you are encountering, and mind you are encountering is different text than that you are encountering, or sorry, that you just encounter. So it fires after encountering effects, gets minus two strength for the remainder of this encounter. Uses ability only once per turn. Ooh, the Cold War beginneth. Uh, there's so many cards in the set on the corpse side that give plus two strength. Giving minus two strength matters, obviously. It's an econ card. It can save you as much as three credits at the, ta uh, the boy Tata that we just looked at. So that's not bad. Um, it's, it's valuable. It's valuable. But of course, there's more. Trash this thing, which is not unique, very notably, very strange, as much as taking three tags may be a problem, and pay two more credits to trash the ice you're encountering if its strength is zero or less. Yeah, uh, that's good. Playing Neverunner one quarter mile time. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, it's not unique. That might be a bit tricky. Uh, you might have been the spark set, but we're the flame. This art from Matthias Kalza like, feels way more cyberpunk like Cyberpunk, the property, then Netrunner, which is super fascinating. Mateus Calza's other work, and mind you, Mateus Calza's work was shown as one of the artists from Brazil, is genuinely really great. Like some of the favorite stuff, like fucking Jay Chinu, Jay Chinu, Jay Chinu, uh, is really, really like, I think it's one of the best arts in the set for sure. This is, seems like it has a different style to it, which is really cool. We also didn't figure out what that owl is. I thought that owl was going to be a thing here, but like, uh, we're going to see this character later on, I have no doubt. Uh, that's good. I don't know, this is good. Sounds like Null's crew with bonus parasite. Oh, the being Null's crew is awesome. Yeah, I I'm in on the owl. Uh yeah, it's it's good. It's really good. It's frightening. It trashes itself. It's four credits for a parasite effect. Understanding when you're gonna trash this. Mind you, it yeah, it eats border control. It eats low strength ice. Uh you can use other things to lower the ice strength. Does this work with, with parasite? I mean um leech. It works with Ice Carver, right? The ice you are encountering, and this is the ice you are encountering. It should work, yeah. Four cards for Parasite effect that you don't have to host on a specific ice. Yeah, you just put it on the table. What's the corp going to do about this? This threatens every single ice on the table. Every single ice on the table. And we just talked about how there's a card that says you can't purge. Enjoy your leeches. I don't know. This is messed up. We have never seen this, which is ice destruction that sits on the table that threatens every single ice on the table. It comes with its own ice minus strength thing. Like, this is frightening. This is really, really, really strange. It's not unique. I think the take one tag clause is maybe going to shoehorn it into like a certain subsection of, of, of sub decks. And I mean all sub decks, but like only sub decks, maybe an anarch. But this is absolutely terrifying. Devil Charm is going to be gross. Yeah, you could do Devil Charm. I don't know no, if you want to because I think card slots are really hard in sub. But yeah, you can do Devil Charm. I think you can play it without the tag. You think? Because then it's six credits, right? Like, people don't play Bachlin. Recur with the other operation. Oh, God. Damn. This is what I mean, where the game gets problematic potentially. As soon as you have recursion that's that easy to play, Privilege Access now reinstalls the, uh, what's it called? The Iris Reyes crew. So do you want to fire this six times in a game? Is this Mercury support? I don't think so. It's two credits per ice. Yeah, but you have to trash it. This is what I mean. It's like I get worried about like these sort of like value bomb recursion cards. It's like, oh, did you just deal with the Arsayers crew? It's back and an imp. I ran archives while installing a connection of minus two. Like, what, what are you meant to do about that? I don't know. This is better than the full color suite and the bin with the same old thing. Yes, this is much better. Yeah, practice gets chiseled back at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Oh man. Hey Chas, how's it going? Been following your channel for a long time. Well, never cut a live stream. Just have a lot more live odds and regular videos posted. What's the difference? Is that the editing? 
it's the editing and like live is in some ways much more fun because we're hanging out like we're reacting to your thing that's it uh videos take a fair bit more time because of the editing and at the back end of a set where like most of the cards are out it's sometimes a bit more difficult to uh like do deck dives on more interesting things as much as we could just do well-tread topics so generally that helps and then you play the Ashen epilogue. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know if that's a bridge too far, but this is what I mean. We're like recursion in this set is more prominent than recursion in almost any set. And I could see it not working out. Sprinkle in some sabotage. Baby, you got noise going. Oh, man. I don't know. This is terrifying. I don't want to say about it. OK, friend of a friend. It's Marie Short. I thought we'd see a dog on this one. This one is ripe for a nice little caramel dog. Three credits seems like a lot, but it's probably not because you install it for one. The fact that this costs three credits is actually really good because in Seb, you want your connections to be two plus. So three is totally fine. This card is busted. Yes. And this card is busted in an uninteresting, non-interactive way in which Euro board games are fun, uh, but they're different than Netrunner. So you install this hopefully for one credit and then you remove a tag for four credits, right? So it's sure gamble to remove a tag. Now, that's a bit cyclical because the value that you spent to get this down cheaper, it did remove itself. But again, you clicklessly install this with Seb for one credit and then you remove a tag for four credits. Or if you're not tagged, you gain nine credits and take a tag, which for Seb installs another connection. So that's 11 credits. Mind you, hopefully install this for one. Like it's just an absurd amount of value engine text on a single card that is not interaction based. And the runner or the corporation largely has no way to interact with this. Uh, yeah, super important for Seb. Mind you, when this came out or we saw this, like this reminded me somewhat of Fall Guy and Fall Guy is the same sort of card that you can look at and be like, oh, that's not very interesting. But Fall Guy specifically in as packages or it's not as wow, that hasn't happened in a while in Geist packages uh, is really kind of messed up. It's really messed up because it's uh, it was just very good. It was a click list, draw two, draw one, gain up to five credits. And it was just a workhorse card. And this is just a workhorse card in Seb. Outside of Seb, is it playable? I honestly don't know. You probably don't want to take a tag. But gain two and remove a tag is like, for one influence, it's not that dissimilar to no free lunch, which is a click to remove a tag. So technically, this is better as much as it's clumsy and you're spending influence. Are Sayers Crew is the counter to Sice and Ton? This should be your favorite thing. No, because you still die to it. Oh, actually, no, you don't. Well, you you can't kill it if you're playing Thunderbolt. Emergency rotate all seeing eye. Yeah, there is one card notably that does deal with resources, sort of. Because uh, mind you, Seb's text says using the basic action. So if you can trash resources outside of the basic action, and I think the card that trashes resources outside of the basic action is Trust Operation. I was stalling to think of the name. Like this card is neat, but it's three influence. This card is potentially very powerful as Seb is like not an inconsistent part of the meta. I would probably play a Trust Operation or two in the first couple weeks while playing uh, Nuvum, which is the first deck we'll probably build. All seeing eye at home, game over. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I might try this in as discount install and prepaid buy it to remove the tag. Yeah, buy bands, mind you, is actually a fair bit better in Seb too. Very, very, very cool. You can chain these. Yep. Yep. You can chain them. I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it just does its thing. I guess I'll be over on the other side. All right. Manual Latas de Mura. Uh, whenever you breach HQ R&D while you're tagged, access one additional card. This is the second card. I feel like maybe the third card in the set that just gives you incidental extra accesses attached to already normal accesses. This one's arguably a bit more flexible. I think the other one pretty says when you access two or more cards. Uh, so this is really important because ideally you're going to be accessing tagged all the time. And then manual comes down as much as technically is trashable in threat three and uh, is becomes a bit more trashable or harder to trash. Uh, yeah, you probably play this in the deck. It is just an, a non-interesting multi-access card because you're probably going to be tagged. If you run through NBN Ice, you're probably going to be tagged. That matchup gets a bit better, and then you're just going to see more cards. Uh, yeah, this is one of the payoff cards for playing run-based Seb. It's obviously very powerful. I don't think you want to play that many in the deck, but it's just a card that lets you see more cards. It's like Docklands Pass, but whenever, whenever, on all centrals that matter. Now, I think the part of this that really fires me up is this flavor text. Notably, this flavor text is not coming from Manuel. It's coming from this character here who is Sunny. And I know I've talked to this before with Pat, and Pat also has strong opinions about this, but I really don't like what happened here with the flavor text, which we just went ahead and did a character assassination on Sunny as seemingly a throwaway joke. I don't like that. Just don't like it. I think it's strange because this was the first time that we had a ability to learn a bit more about this character. And I think learning about connections is really important. Mind you, this is not the first time that the flavor text uh, from a connection is not from the connection themselves. But this just seems to be like a throwaway inclusion joke for Sunny, but unfortunately makes Sunny look like an absolute shithead. And Sunny classically was not portrayed as a shithead. She was anti-shithead, which is why people liked Sunny. 
Sonny Lebeau, yeah, this is Sonny Lebeau. I was audibly upset while on Daily Cast, and I agree with him. I don't like this. Is this actually character assassination? I think so. So, okay, so Sonny, uh, what was the Sonny current called? Uh, what, faction? Sonny Lebeau. So Sonny was one of the mini factions, again, attached to Adam, in which she was a character whose job is to be a white hat operational, maybe sometimes black hat, but she worked for, uh, what's it called? A global sec. So she went to work. She worked her nine to five job in which she pen tested and, you know, attacked corporations. Then she went home and she went home to her family and she was kind of that. She was super, super wholesome. She had cards about just going home to hug her kids, did her nine to five to go home. And she was kind of the coolest thing because she kind of existed outside of the, you know, the people doing this because they had to. She was just there. People love Sunny. It was a fun narrative to be her job. Like she shows up with donuts. Admittedly, the donuts are attached a bit to uh, feels like some sort of manipulation, but like just a good person. Just kind of nice. Great. Have some donuts, Miriam. And now we have a card that shows that she is, for some reason, in the area, which I guess you can excuse that. But now she is paying for her children to get good grades, which is corrupt. It's just straight up corrupt. We've taken a character that was painted in a more, you know, genuinely, obviously kind of maybe flat, but that was what we liked way. And then just made her more interesting by making her a shithead. I don't get how that flavor is sunny disc. What am I being? She's buying grades for her children. That's not a thing I want people to do. I didn't read it that way. How did you read it, D? Sonny was a wholesome character, and this throwaway line is besmirches Sonny in a way that I don't think is worth the payoff. This is all okay. Mm, I don't know if I want to go into this, <laughs> but there was a thing that happened a long time ago, very early in Null Signal games, back when they were Nisei, where they wrote a narrative and they used a character that was beloved to many, one of those core set original Neverner characters. And admittedly, the payoff for that story was much more interesting because it tackled much harder issues. But they made one of the characters from FFG that a lot of people attach themselves to a shithead, a total shithead. And a lot of people were really upset about it. In fact, NSG at the time and Nisei at the time went back and changed the story. Now, that story had higher stakes by a mile. I don't want to conflate the two, but this is something we've seen before where NSG has taken FFG characters that are beloved and then just kind of made them, you could argue, more interesting, but I think overall just worse people. And I don't like that. I don't like that. Why would you have to make Sunny this? It's not worth it. I don't know. Maybe because we're talking about it. Maybe she just wants to talk to him about the grades. It seems like she's trading information that she has access to through her corporate job about my daughter's grades. You got to fix this. I don't know. Maybe you could read it that she's just showing up as a parent teacher meet. Be like, oh, yeah, here's something for the cause. Also, can we talk about my daughter? She's struggling. You could read it like that, but I don't think you read it like that with this ellipsis. Maybe not. So by grades, she should threaten to shoot the professor with the Sherman tank. <laughs> Bang. What was the story? Oh, I don't want to dive into it because we're way too deep, um, but it, it's to do with the McCas McCaffrey family. And it's like it's an, an important story and it addresses like really hard topics. And like there's some good value to the story. But Kate came off like a shithead, dead naming her, 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 her son like woof. I wish runners were less heroic. Also, me not like this. I agree. I wish runners were not heroic, but not sunny. <laughs> Sonny, she has a card just hugging her kids, just going home to her kids and her wife, just having a good time. I don't know. Kids need more tutoring. Exactly. It's just like it's just antithetical to the way that Sonny is presented, which is I'm going to go home and spend time with my kids and together we're going to work to get better grades. We don't buy our way through the system. Ugh, this isn't important, but it's important. It's not important, but it's important. Maybe Manuel's blackmailing her. I don't know. And that's the problem is this is the space for us to learn about Manuel. Instead, we just dunk on Sonny for some reason. Sonny's a corpo. Of course, the fam is corrupt fam. <laughs> yeah, soon, no. Defense space mom at all costs. I also bribing a teacher doesn't help your kids. No, it doesn't. And like Sonny should know that. Paying for grades does not help your kids. It hurts your kids. It's a bad thing to do on seven angles. It's not a good story. Why would you do this? Do you think the Sunny is doing a pen test of sorts? I've heard one of the things that can be tested is a social manipulation angle penetration. Arguably, yes, but I think Miriam is, that's a really cool angle, but I think Miriam works uh, at the office. I think it's kind of color-coded that way. Uh, what's it called? Office supplies? Because I think Miriam is dressed in, oh, maybe not so much, but this looks like, the wall looks like it's a, a local office. But you're right. Maybe uh, Sunny's pen testing another corporation. That's really cool. That's actually a really cool angle of it. I always understood Sunny could also take side gigs that weren't that safe and ethical. I don't think that came up in the narrative. Sunny was just clearly doing this because Sunny was, it was her job and she just wanted to go home with her kids. Like that was it. I know it's such a cool angle for a runner. Everyone was like, you know, doing something much more extreme. And then there's like, yeah, I'm just going to go home now. Let's see what's on Netflix. Hey, Ryan, how's it going? Congratulations on spoilers, by the way. That's really cool. 
Even though GFI is one of the most evil cards, yeah. Just feels like they're showing her to be an active parent who's investing in her kid's success and also professional. I read this that she's out there bribing uh, teachers to give her children better grades. I think there is a reading that is less discharitable charitable, uh, in which she's invested. I just don't think it's structured like that. Um, maybe it is. Maybe I'm wrong. You could read it a different way. I think maybe some people do. I don't read it that way. I know Pat didn't, and Pat's upset about this too. I don't like this. We saw Sunny in the Art. Do we ever see Epics? We do see Apex in the previous cycle. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> also, isn't Manuel supposed to be an ethics teacher? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what Manuel is. We haven't learned anything about this character. And that's another frustrating thing is like when the text box of a connection, which is meant to be a person, is used up on a joke, which gives us nothing about the character besides the fact that they're maybe ethically flexible. Uh, I feel like it's a loss. I don't know. She's definitely doing a bad thing here, but she's always there to whitewash corpos there. I don't think she's whitewashing corpos. Her job is to make like she was exposing corporations like she was there like she wins by getting seven agenda points. I don't know. I don't think she, I don't see her as a corpo, but like, I see how we could see on both sides. Yo, Cody, how's it going? The read for office supplies is also how am I reading Manuel because of how similar the flavor text is. I'm going to have to fail you. Me sliding 20 miles across the table. How about now? <laughs> you pass ethics. The text on the blackboard behind him is a translation of what we owe each other. Oh my God. Really? That's funny. She's white hat. Her job is literally to make corpos better killing runners. Oh, she's also black hat though. It's been since a, a while since I've read the the Sunny lore, but from my remembering, which might be charitable because I like Sunny, uh, is that you see the way I see it, I'm teaching them the lesson importance of basic security. So it's a mixture. I think in the lore, she was exposing bad stuff the corporations were doing, not that she was strengthening them. But I could see how you think the other one too. From good place. I think she's corpo, but she's complicated. I read as someone who saw what she did in job and enjoyed it. I think she enjoyed her job because she was good at it, but I don't think she cared about her job. That's what I read from it. I don't know. I love the character too, but she's not deaf, not like a good guy. Man, I thought so. I thought she was good. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. That's upsetting because we like Sunny now because it's out of character. I think it's slightly, I think it's out of character. I do think it's out of character. All right, we talked about this card before. For the uninitiated, this is attached to the story that dropped uh, about 12 hours ago, which is a pretty important story for the set. It involves a couple characters from old days, uh, Data and Destiny days. That is Adam, the original Byroid runner to break free from the directives, and then Dr. Lovegood, who I was convinced was the third hand in the handshake in a really awkward way, but it's not. It's Adam. That's great. <laughs> this is the bad place. Um, yeah, I talked about this card a bit at the beginning. Um, this card seems to exist for narrative reasons because it is a narrative beat in the story. I'm not going to spend too much time about this before because we have a lot of cards to talk about, but I think this card is inherently kind of unhealthy for the game. I don't like a card in which you can search your stack for a virtual and install it at for a three credit cost, sometimes less. I don't think that makes a more interesting game. I think it accentuates more problematic cards. Can you get your turning wheel down consistently in any matchup? Yes. Is that a problem? I meant to say the twinning, not the turning wheel. That will be happening uh, because of that. I thought it was the three-way handshake, right, Bumble J? Um, so yeah, this card looks super busted. Jesse, how's it going? And that's the problem. I don't know if it's busted. It might not be busted. And then if it's not busted, it's probably nichely playable. I think the connection package is a way to make this playable. I think the virtual subtype here is pretty rough. It's good to see Adam. It is. I I don't like this. Don't like design like this. Search your card for a deck. Search your deck for a card. I don't think that makes interesting now, runner. I don't know. Bad corp, good runner is a boring way to see the game. We need some evil criminals and carrying sysops. I agree. I agree. It doesn't install just tutors. Yeah, it does. But that's fine. And then you just like uh, career ferret or whatever, right? I don't know. This is like just totally at home and spamming all the companions in the world. Like like companions, mind you, are all virtual. You can have them in hand. Admittedly, there's some tension there. But like it just supports a lot of the parts never and I don't like. Virtual is a cursed subtype. There's some very powerful virtual cards. Some of them are banned. Uh, don't like it. I think what I like about Netrunner is the implication. Uh, that the corporations can be made out of really complicated individuals who are doing awful things, like, got cut off there. Hold on. Like Jackson Howard, even if they aren't necessarily awful in their personal lives, the she does bad work so she's a bad mom vibe is really off-putting to me. Uh, D, I'm not 100%. I get your first part for sure. She does bad work so she's a bad mom vibe. 
Oh, as in like she works as a white hat for the corpus, so she's a bad mom. I think FFG went out of the way to make sure that she was portrayed not as a bad mom. Like she is a loving person and she cares and she does all the stuff that she does because of her family more than most runners. Uh, but maybe the stuff she does is, you know, not everyone has the ability to choose the work they do. Uh, yeah. We hate on RWR. <laughs> Eric, it's the first day of the set. I'm, 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 I got takes, that's for sure. How you doing, man? By the way, I listened to your podcast. Uh, I know you called that out on one of the last podcasts. No, I listened to it. I listened to it, man. Plus one to D's comment. Yeah, I agree. Would Mean the Minds be okay if it revealed the top until you found one? I think if this card was less consistent, it would be cool. The fact that this is perfectly consistent to do with its thing is just like a problem. And there's cards that exist that are burdened for future designs. So admittedly, if this card exists, it's going to be a problem anyways. But if a card exists that is virtual, that is good enough to get in the early game, and every deck wants to consistently get in the early game, or every criminal, whatever, can play this, the game gets worse. So cards like this have a design burden where you have to keep in mind with this existing, you have to make sure that the connections and virtuals you're printing exist in an environment where this makes sense. And that's probably not worth what this card gives to the game. I didn't see villainize Kay's mom too. Kat, I talked about that. I didn't want to dive too much deep into it, but that was the original story in which I know NSG back in the day Nisi ran into that where they took an old character and made that character a shithead for narrative purposes. Now, that story was more interesting because the stakes were much higher. Um, but unfortunately, they took a character a lot of people loved and made them, again, a shithead. And a lot of people had negative responses to that. And this is my negative response to Sadi as much as the stakes are way different. What is the one deck archetype you want to see in NPC Vancouver? Uh, I want to see weird combo NVN, which I think can exist. I want to see Orca Werewolf Shaper. I think that's what the, that deck is. I think that's probably quite fine. I think World Tree can come back. Uh, whatever Nuvum's doing, I'm pretty sure it's just Fire Threes and Punitive, which that's going to be a maybe not that great. I think that's where I'm going. Is Globosec really shown as one of the bad megacorps? No, it's not. It's meant to be independent. My response was specifically to the idea that only to show Sunny as a bad mom because she's a corp. But yeah, I agree with that. Is it me or is the spiciest release date opinions ever on Andre? I'm getting out the unhappiness that is set from you. It's it's mixed. I was a bit anxious about this because there's a lot of parts of the set. And like, unfortunately, we're starting with Anarch and Criminal. I think it does change. But there's lots of parts of this set that like, I know a lot of people tune in here and I have some takes that are a bit more heavy than others. And it's honestly concerning. Like a lot of people worked really hard on the set. There's a lot of really good stuff on the set. And I don't like genuinely, I'm anxious about this to be here and to be like, I don't have 100% thumbs up. It sucks. It really does suck uh, that I can't do that. There's just things to talk about. I also want to be very clear that maybe the fact that I don't like this card, we'll see it over the next days, let alone weeks, and it'll prove to be not the real point. Uh, but I just want to say that like going into the set, very specifically, this set felt different. Because we see a lot of cards that, again, veer away from what NSG classically has been designing and some of their design ethos. And then there's a lot of like, you know, just minor, non-interactive engine pieces that kind of get me in some ways, right? Like, it's a very nuanced thing. Uh, but we have a lot to talk about, that's for sure. All right, let's keep going. It's fine to be negative. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, I don't want to lie. Like, I want to tell you how I feel. It's just, I wish it's so much easier when when I feel is 100% like only excitement. And there's excitement in here. There is for sure. But there's other stuff too. Like, you're more critical of that. Not going to lie. And you're also true. Oh, thank you, Aris. Who cares about Seb? Time to build another great Zaya deck? Yeah, there's some good Zaya stuff. I have no problem being negative. Anyone who remembers me might. <laughs> Weirdly, can't add Descent into the deck builder. Oh, that's really weird. That's a very important card. I think once you get past Seb, the set is pretty great. I also am a Seb hater. Yeah, yeah. The fact that we're starting on Anarch is not going to help us, um, but it's going to get better for sure. Potential pro sunny argument here is that she's working within a corrupt enough system where her kids' efforts wouldn't be enough to make it to corrupt academic system on merit alone. I feel like that's a bit of a stretch. I don't know. Like, I get you, and there's definitely a narrative there for sure. I just don't think that's the Occam's razor here, right? Don't worry. Meeting of Minds is bad. The set slaps. <laughs> Other than pronunciation, have we touched on the new runner wincon? No, it's in like two cards. Die annulsing the podcast or live long enough to become the shadow net? <laughs> yeah, whatever, man. Whatever, man. Okay, window of opportunity. Uh, we talked a bit about this one before. This, mind you, was on the shadow net. You may install one program or piece of hardware from your grip. That's cool. Uh, you pay for the cost, mind you. Run any server. When that run begins, derez a piece of ice protecting that server. It's your choice. But when the run ends, the corp may res the ice, derez this way. Not their choice. It's just going to happen. Uh, this is a neat card. It is. It falls into a line of cards that kind of have the similar use case. And we've seen a lot of cards like this in the past, right? Like on the basis, is this similar to inside job? Yeah, it is similar to inside job. Does inside job get you into the remote server on more board cases? 
yeah, is a bit more of a consistent card on more board cases. And I think Inside Job is really undersung as being a very powerful card. Paying two credits and getting a bypass and threatening a two ice server, forcing two reses in the early game is messed up. Inside Job is way better card than you imagine it is. And unfortunately, we're sending a central service with Mercury. Don't worry about it. Um, so that's good. There's other some other ones like Tread Lightly is not exactly it. I keep remember forgetting the name of the card that has the floods on it that says any ice res on this turn or de res on this turn. There's a bunch of similar cards. Obviously, Boomerang is kind of an idea here. And I think it's really easy to come up with use cases in which there are board states. Leave no trace. Thank you. There are board states in which this card is more powerful than the other options. I think the one that's called out pretty e easily is like turn one, you run the remote server, the corporation reses an envelopment, and then you install Hermes with this and run it on turn one, right? Now, I think the chances in which this card is stronger than that for attacking a remote server versus just having the solidarity of inside job and flexibility of boomerang is not a big sell to me, unless this clause here is specifically really, really important, which for a lot of criminal decks it not exactly is, and I don't know in as decks if I'm that quick to put this in. Now, where I think this card gets a bit more interesting is unfortunately, again, and this is, a, I think, some of my themes when it comes to the criminal cards, is I don't like Mercury's design, in which running central servers and bypassing ice so you can see multiple cards from centrals to me is not my favorite kind of netrunner. And I think this card is actually a fair bit better on central servers because the corporation is not likely to want to res the ice again uh, because that's the thing. You're giving the corporation a choice. If they derez a brawn and then run the remote server, yeah, you can re-res the brawn and you will if it keeps the corp runner out and you win the game. Mind you, this also works with Saucy and Los and derez decks and it has to be worth considering in those lines too. But on central servers, the reason, like, it's kind of like leave no trace. Like when you leave no trace a central server, they don't res stuff because of course they're not going to res stuff. It's a terrible trade. And I think similarly, Windows Opportunity on central servers probably makes a bit more sense. As much as you could argue on those cases too, uh, inside job makes more sense on in and central servers in the same spots too. Saucy, all cards slap with Saucy. Saucy is like secretly kind of a busted card as long as you have the support for it. So I don't know. I need testing with this, but this immediately does something very similar. Mind you, Inside Job does rotate. Boomerang will be around, it seems, for a long time now. And I think there's also very important cards, considering we saw Thunderbolt, which is just like massive stuff you need to face check into really poorly. So I don't know how I feel about it. And mind you, this is kind of bad into Thunderbolt 2, which is going to be a non-inconsequential part of the meta in which they get value from resing and de-resing their eyes. So it's tricky. It's really, really tricky. Is Mercury stronger with RWR? Almost definitely, Ian. How's it going, by the way? Almost definitely. Lots of new ice wants to be re-resed? Yeah, exactly. Like it's, there's a lot of board states in which this is not what you want. And inside job is almost good in every board states. I would never hit envelopment with this. Uh, you would on turn one if you're going to, if to bounce it with Hermes. You're right. If you re-res envelopment, they'll get more counters. But if you install Hermes with this and run, and then they can't re-res their envelopment, they res on turn one, you return that envelopment to hand, right? Like there's some blowouts with this for sure. I just don't know how consistently they come. And mind you, envelopment gets eaten by inside job anyways, as much as Hermes doesn't fire. Windows of Opportunity is specifically good into OB, installing Border Control turn one because it eliminates the trash Border Control stuff inside Job install Sandstone line. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Like there are OB openings which are strong into Border Control, strong into, or sorry, into Boomerang, strong into inside Job. And very uniquely having this card in your deck so you can deal with turn one Border Control push is probably not a reason I would play this. Yeah, so I don't know. The stream chop a bit on YouTube for others. Uh, let me know if that's the case. On that note, what time is it? I need to just pop out for like a minute to feed Nanako the cat. Haven't watched live in a while. Gonna try to get in standard this meta. Oh, yo, if you have any questions, definitely ask. Windows of Opportunity, the Seraph, Archer, Cloud Eater, then on Passant it. <laughs> yeah, there's like some combos that you can build into it. But in terms of like a utility card, stream is good for me. Thank you. We lose inside job this year, though. So many iconic cards leaving out for sure. It hasn't been choppy. Okay, good to know. Interesting card. Uh, they definitely can find a home that makes it better than the other stuff. I think the shortest path is just to play the other stuff that we've constantly been playing. But I think this is the sort of card that will surprise you that there are some board states where it just feels meaner and it's harder to play around. But again, keep in mind, uh, NSG has been doing a really good job of making ice that cares about res and de-res. And we have whole factions now that deal with it or like, so it can be tricky. Okay, we'll just do one more and then I'll show the scary art card and then well, I'll go feed the cat. We'll be back in like 30 seconds. So you need card card alarm clock again from the shadow net. When your turn begins, you may run HQ. Uh, if this card had just this text, it would be playable. Rise and shine, time to F up a Corby's day. This brings up a really interesting question. What do you think, and without getting banned in chat, what is the worst word NSG would write on a card and not censor it? Because there's a precedent to censor this word. On Max, it's censored. It's censored even harder, if I'm not mistaken. We don't even get a letter. We got no letters. Whenever... 
<laughs> what is the worst word? Can I write crap on a card? Time to crap up a corpy's day. Like, what am I allowed to say here? Um, so this card is just good. I don't know. It's just good. Can we censor Corpy? I don't like Corpy. I don't like saying Corpy. Uh, when your turn begins, run HQ. It's just good. It's two credits to get a free click a turn. Mind you, you can use programs. You can do anything you want in this. Obviously, you're a criminal. They're going to be icing HQ. But if you want to deep dive, if you want to get your Sable click, fantastic. You rolled Sable HQ. You got two free clicks on a turn. Now, this text is not bad. The first time you encounter a piece of ice, you can spend two clicks. This beats on encounter ice, very importantly. And you're getting a click back from this, a click back for Sable. So the cost of this is not that bad. This is just genuinely very, very good. Obviously, there's always be running shout outs and i don't love always be running i think something is in the water here in montreal we had a bunch of players play always be running at worlds and love it and they would just like send it centrals and uh c2 cards mind you abr was more powerful in turn one because you had built in multi-axis so you're not going to exactly see that here unless you docklands pass on turn one fanny it's obviously fork don't be weird <laughs> do i just switch to frag it worked for battlestar galactica Fork seems fine <laughs> Comparison. Yeah, I agree with that. That's a really good take. Uh, that's an AMS reference for you? I don't know. Fanny? Okay, great. Um, yeah, I don't know. This is good. This is just genuinely good. Uh, good. The fact that it's an alarm clock and is an alarm clock, I thought there would be some misdirection here. Like it would be a coffee machine or like some reason to wake up. I love that it's going to have birds and pie cat. You got a lot of work to, uh, a lot of stuff to work with for the set. Uh, but this card is just great. It's, it's just good. Stick an MU on alarm clock and be a reasonable console. Yes. Yeah. This could easily be a console uh, if it had MU on it. Any persistent bypass package for clicks is amazing. Yes. Uh, it's obviously Mercury support as much as, again, I don't think I like the play pattern of Mercury that much. Intriguing progression from Midnight Sun. We had S star 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 on Shastushka. Now it's F star star K. That's 100% increase in letters. Yo, shot. That's true. In two years, we're going to get the whole, the whole damn mean word. It's like ABR Adam without a downside. Admittedly, though, yes, but without upside. Because the only reason that ABR was worth doing an Adam is that you had C2 from HQ on turn one. So after a mulligan, C2 on HQ is really, really good. How long have you been live, Joe? Um, two hours and 13 minutes. We're going to be here for another hour and a half, maybe a bit more, and then I have to duck out. We'll be there tomorrow. We're going to be here every week uh, until you're tired of me. Uh, and I'm tired of you, Solomir. So until that happens, which will probably take us a whole week at a minimum. Um, I'm just going to put this on the screen so you can see it if you haven't seen this card yet because it was spoiled. And I'm just going to go feed the little cat. So I'll be back and just uh, come back for the exclusive part two of the stream. Sup? Okay. Damn Eastern time zones. I'm <laughs> still in bed. Good morning. You're going to be here every week until we retire to you. That's a commitment every day this week. Not every week. <laughs> what are likely we are to win off three deep dives for comparison? Very likely chat. So this is J Chin Yu. I think I'm getting it. Was that a delivery for a new spoiler? No, but shout outs to my family. I, I caught up with my sister and my brother-in-law. They were had such a great time doing the spoiler thing. Uh, again, respect to Pat. It was awesome. So this is the new win condition. It was toted that there'd be a win condition for uh, in the new set, a card that probably says win the game. It does say win the game. So it's a unique card. You can only have one installed at a time as much as you need three in your deck. I'm out of breath because I ran from the cat food. Give me one second. When your turn ends, which is a really cool clause on this because there's no way to cheat this out faster than that. If you made a successful run on all the three central servers this turn, I'm still out of breath, you may add this hardware to your score area as an assassination agenda worth zero agenda points. That has no mechanical text, like mechanical implications. Then, if you have three assassination agendas in your score area, you win the game. Okay, so you need to get this down. 
and you need to run all three central servers multiple times. You need to find all three from your deck, which is pretty tricky. It's not impossible. Mind you, we looked at the wizard's chest, which is a way to do this, but I'd argue that it's not the easiest way to do it. And threat three, very importantly, whenever you bypass a piece of ice, you may spend a click to install the hardware from your heap. So inherently, if you're bypassing and there's many ways to play this. I think one way, unfortunately, is like the very cheesy, I'm just going to Mercury Century ser Central servers over and over again and play a full rig of like backstitching, Fazerum and Tangler. Uh, I don't know what else you want. Like just, it's hard to Estabrado with this, but not impossible. You definitely play Alarm Clock and you just kind of throw Centrals. Asmund tutors this. Asmund does tutor this, but Asmund only can tutor two different weapons. So you can't pull two Jaitinos. So it definitely helps, but it's not like bulletproof. Uh, mind you, just filtering works, like having class act, drawing through your deck can help obviously a lot. Yeah, it fetches it, but it has two different cards uh, with different names. So you can't grab two at once, right? Jaichinu and Boomerang. Boomerang's also tricky though, right? Because if you're going to spend all three clicks on your turn running and then admittedly you don't have to install this on the turn, it can just be on the table. So you can actually do Boomerang run, 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 and it can work. Uh, when the set was announced, I said that I wasn't too excited about alternate win conditions because alternate win conditions. Uh, I think it's easy to forget how good Netrunner is. Netrunner is really, really good. And having an alternate win, win condition that forces you to focus on a different part of the game and ignore the fun part of Netrunner is hard to make that more interesting to me. I think this card is of the power level that it's going to fire every once in a while, but it's not going to be very consistent is my guess. And I think that's fine. I think this is a cool win condition that's admittedly attached to like just bypass central servers. Like the fact that this has built-in bypass support is exactly the sort of Mercury that I don't love, which is kind of Mercury in general, unfortunately. Uh, and so like, I think there's a lot of times that Mercury can just win off central servers doing this. Can you play deep dive and will it win more consistently? Almost definitely, as much as you don't have to spend influence on it. So there's a lot of things that make this not the first order optimal strategy, I don't think. I'd be surprised if this is like tier one competitive and I'm glad that it's not. Let's just say that. So I think this is like a nice midpoint of a card that a lot of people are going to pursue and it's going to be cool, especially when this comes down and you think the assassination is going to start and you have to really worry about it. Uh, but I'm not too worried about it. No, we didn't do corp cards yet, so maybe we're starting at the top of the set. So we're only like 10 cards in maybe, 15? Neat thing about this card too, the fact that if you do bypass a card, you can spend a click to install it. That means on, again, the turn that you're doing the triple runs, you can get it from your heap. So it's not weak to damage. That's really important. If you lost one of this to errant damage, you lose the game. Like you lost your win condition. That's obviously not good. But also now this is a card that can recur itself over infinitely. Um, that's kind of fun. I don't think you really want this in a pawn shop build, but that's cool. Uh, that th This is very uniquely a card that installs itself over and over again from your heap. For a click, it's hard to cheat that out but there might be ways to make this uh, uh, work a bit better. I'm glad, hey, Morgan, it's a bypass clause so that it can't get jammed in self-trash Anarch, to be honest. Yeah, I just don't know how you do bypass and self-trash Anarch, but I can see it. Alternate win concept either to be way too powerful or sort of niche and probably unplayable. Feared, weird is design space. And I'd argue that this card has the middle. Where like it's very easy for a lot of people to be excited about this. Um, it's probably not good enough that I have to be worried about it, but when it fires, it will be pretty cool. You need three different copies of them getting this right. Yes, you need to play three in your deck. Playing one in your deck with closed deck list is like kind of funny. <laughs> I don't think you want to do it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely interesting. But the amount of effort you need to get this to work is like a Herculean amount of effort that if you spent it on somewhere else, you'd probably be in a better spot. Because this card that allows you to play Aesops and Krim, uh, you already can play Aesops and Krim, um, especially if you're playing as decks that have click compression for installing cards. I think Az could play this. I think this is actually kind of okay with Az because Az draws consistently through his deck with like masterwork. Like this does make sense in Az more than Mercury, arguably, because Az is also good at like locking the remote server with like boomerangs and poison and stuff like that. Yeah, that's what I mean. I'm glad it can't get jammed. Yeah, that clause is good. I don't like bypass and that's going to be a problem for the next couple cards we talk about, uh, but it's, it's, it's cool. It's fine. You need to get to threat three to start recurring though. You do, but ideally when the first one goes off, Right, like, because you have so many in your deck. By the time you're getting to the recursion, you've probably already stolen an agenda accidentally getting this to fire or something. Also, hi, Andre. Hey, Morgan. I find it funny that really only Krim got the alternate winkin. I think you have to like, because you can, you have to spend twelve influence to get this into another deck. Uh, I don't know if you have to, if you, that makes a lot of sense, because you probably have to play at least one bypass card. Uh, so yeah, it's probably just criminal. Mind you, exploit too. For what it's worth, is like not the worst card in the set. Because exploit sets you up to do the next parts of this, 
right? Like if you derez three ice on central servers, because you can do like run, run, run. If the the, the Jai Chin Yu is Jai Chin Yu is installed, like you're fine. So you actually can exploit and do this in the same turn. I think that's really, really quite cool. Um, that actually exploit makes some amount of sense as much as like, I do think that the decks that are going to play this are just going to be like, I'm going to play bypass, probably minimal breakers and just go from there. Yeah, as gets us down for free. It's not the, not the worst. Chichinho means find a way as an alternative unconventional way of doing things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, a concept in Brazilian Portuguese. It's, I thought it would be more like bricolage, but it's, yeah, the idea of like fighting uphill to make things work. Yeah, exploit is still legal. Exploit is still technically legal. It's a Mars card. Because it's a Lowe's card in theory, as much as I don't know who the character is. All right. Cubulation. Um, wow. I love the art on this. Edmund Chinian. Just doing great. Exploits in her deck tonight. Oh, that's sick. Limit one hosted card. One MU, one cost. Access. Pay a credit to host the non-agenda card you are accessing face up on this program. If it was installed, it becomes uninstalled. Uh, great. Whenever you breach HQ, if this program has a hosted corp card, you may pay a credit and trash this to access two additional cards. So it's two credits for legwork down the line as much as you take hostage a card that you access at some point in the game and trash it or steal it for free. I think it's the art I most want to play, Matt. This art's so good. This art's really, really quite good. Okay. Uh, in terms of the theme here, if you don't know what cupulation is, these things are called, I don't know if it's cupulation or cupulation. These things are called couples. They're kind of like a crucible. It's something you heat up a lot and then it's meant to extract like valuable metals from invaluable metals so the idea is that you get some sort of ore and then you heat it up and then kind of convert it into gained goods on that note i'm kind of bummed out i have a card similar to this in my own set design and the idea of like grabbing a criminal's card and holding it hostage as a ransomware attack and then like sending it central servers to get multi-access is such an easy flavor win i think for criminal to make them feel more like a criminal and instead we got something a bit more heady and I, I don't know how I feel about that one. I think that the flavor on this could have been much more straightforward as much as there's some metallurgy involvement with Mercury and all that name stuff. We lost Lansomware attack, but we got murder. Yeah. Yeah. What happens with the hosted card? It gets trashed. Goes a face up into the archives. Gonna good feel paid to pay one to steal DBS off the table. Yeah, you still have a problem though. Like I'd argue that you'd rather just trash the cupellation to steal the DBS. Unless you're worried about punitive, mind you, right? Hey, Wayne, hello. Haven't played Neverrunner in a long while. I'm excited to try the new set. Well, welcome. It's a new set day. Killed the final boss of Neverrunner should be an Anarch card for sure. I think we had it, unfortunately. It was like that one with Hoshiko on it that, yeah, you know the one. I mean, this is like imp like trashing, which is also multi axis seems fine. So I think this is one of the most interesting cards in the set. I don't know how consistent it's going to be because it does two things and it does two things at relatively medium value. Right. So you can use this card to run central servers and steal an ice. Okay. That's cool. That has an impact on the game. You can use this to trash a card, mind you, from a remote server for free. So if we're putting a card in our deck to be able to trash things in a remote server, would I rather have this or would I rather have specifically Miss Bones? The answer is almost always Miss Bones. It's just more consistent on more board states. But then you can use the Miss Bones effect and transition it to multi axis. And specifically in the horizontal matchup, I don't think this is the first card I want to get down. I think that's a slots problem too. Criminal is just really bad at MU. But when it comes to getting like, would I rather have this down in an asset horizontal matchup or would I rather have bankroll? The answer is bankroll, right? So that's kind of tricky. Is that you only have a couple extra slots in a criminal deck. Generally, it's like two bankroll, one Chesla. And so it's hard in that deck, as much as this card is not permanent, to kind of fight for those slots because it is very, very, very fundamentally restrained because you just don't have MEO. You going up? You want to go up? You can go up. So that's tricky. Now, having the multi access too on a deck slot, like it's worth something that a card can do two things. Like, would you rather play for a Docklands Pass right in here and right now? Yeah, maybe. It's about the same cost and work for the whole game. Or like well-timed legwork. Yeah, maybe. It's on the right thing. It's like, it's on the same cost. Very notably, Cupulation, though, is powerful because it is not a run event. So whenever you breach HQ, you can fire this. Which means, again, if you're playing like Mercury, you can, unfortunately, Inside Job or Estabrado HQ and flush out the whole damn thing. And I think that's actually really interesting when that happens. Uh, I think that's quite cool. Is that it can work non in a run event way. Not that Docklands Pass doesn't, so... It's tricky. It's like the midpoint between two things that are generally both good, but there's better, more consistent ways to do both of them. So if this sees play, it's because your MU is inherently very different than most other decks, or the modality of it is worth the fact that it doesn't do either of the things too consistently. Shaper probably loves cups. Yeah, Shaper could play this, mind you. It's a bit flexible too. Influence is not bad. 
having some HQ pressure in Shaper might not be the hardest with the new set, but that's worth something. Uh, and with Shaper, you can use this over and over again, but I think your silent chips are actually relatively well taxed in Shaper. You can sell it to ASOS. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I feel like Docklands is just better because Crims are super tight on MU. Yeah, Crims are just really tight on MU. It steals operations. It does steal operations. And that is like, notably, is that how do you deal when you something like an audacity? It's really hard to deal with it. And so this can show up in the same sort of like area where criminals lack the sort of disruption effect besides financial disruption that doesn't even show up anywhere. And that's kind of notable. That is definitely notable. But to me, that's a bit more of a meta call than it is a card that was slot into just about every deck. Mind you, I'm hoping that the operations are just targeted out by the fact that everyone's playing Imp Lou, right? Like, I, and just like our their people are playing, what's it called? Burner now. So I don't know. You can't sell the hosted card. No, the hosted card is not installed. You can't ASOPs the card. You can ASOPs this. You can't ASOPs the hosted card because it's not installed. You can only uh, ASOPs installed cards. So it's strange. It's a fascinating card. I think it's one of the cards that I think is the coolest in the set. Like, it's dope. I don't know how it's going to find a home itself, uh, but definitely everything that it does individually is, is really quite good. The question is whether this is a slot and we didn't see any MU criminal cards. Like that's just kind of rough. MU is really tight and it's just really hard, especially in any matchup to think of a card that will take up your extra MU better than bankroll and then better than the, the Jezva. It's tricky. It's tricky. Now, again, we're talking about like first order optimal stuff and I, I think I can be very wrong about this card, uh, but this card is very cool. Very, very, very into it. I keep thinking you can squirrel away agendas with this. Yeah, you can't. You actually can't. Oh, yeah. So when it comes to SDS, you can't. It's not an agenda. So you can't even like use this as a film critic, which I think is what we were hoping to get in Criminal because a film critic in Criminal would feel pretty good. Strange. Very interesting card. Melanthrogam. Hey, Ginevra, what are you up to? What do you got a pronunciation guide for me? I was told uh, Lucille said that this M is soft at the bottom. If it didn't trash itself, it'd probably play. If it didn't trash itself, it'd be busted good. It'd be really, really good if it didn't trash itself. Uh, the flavor text on this card is awesome. Uh, the flavor, in terms of like a criminal card, this idea is something that shows up in uh, Brazilian or Portuguese culture. And it's the sort of like bad boy, uh, kind of illicit nature, this sort of like fedora person, which is why a fedora shows on, on, on the thing. Portuguese term for a lifestyle of idleness, fast living, and petty crime. This is what I love. I love this stuff. Traditionally celebrated in Samba lyrics, especially of Noel Rosa and Bezerra da Silva. Exponent of the lifestyle, the Melandro, uh, which even for like Latin, that kind of seems like something bad. Or bad boy. Uh, rogue, hustler, rascal, scoundrel, gangster, uh, you play some Arkham Horror, you know what you are, has become significant to Brazilian national identity as a folk hero or rather an anti-hero. That's really cool as a like very on-theme criminal card, but also something that's relevant to the area of the set, which is great. Love it. I'm mostly amused at more Adam Doyle hands. Apparently they didn't ask Adam Doyle to draw these hands. Adam Doyle just went and did hands, which is sick. There's a lot of good Adam Doyle art in the set. And Adam Doyle's mind you, has been doing a lot of stuff for like Arkham and has an art style that I was surprised. And you see a bit of that Arkham art style in like um, the werewolf card. I'm excited to host my virus from archives on to protect my little turboy. I think if you want to do that, Oliver, you can play um, by Zer what, what, the Anarch card that also came out in this set. It's probably a bit better. Okay. Uh, the Kaipoera use of the word is important here too. It's a great term. Is this used in Kaipoera as like a turn? Helium 4, thank you. Yeah, Helium 4, I think it's better to deal with my virus if you're like leaning into Amaku. It's my guess. So, when you install this thing, low two power counters on it, I think actually one of the big successes of the set is that it is the beginning of the redemption arc for Pudma. There's a lot of really good Pudma cards in the set. Uh, and they're cards that inherently work with rigging up, which is wild. So many, unfortunately, of the cards that you thought you could rigging up in Pudma, you can't rigging up in Pudma because they don't come in with power counters and you can only inherently charge a card with power counters. So if you think you're going to like get your hype, oh, hyperbaric does work because it comes in with a counter, right? Yeah. Okay. This does work. But then things like Kurapira, which you thought you could rigging up to like start the counter chain, you can't because when you install this, it doesn't come with any counters. So there's a lot of cards in the set, specifically criminal cards that come in with counters. Um, and there's just like, this is the beginning of Padma seeming better and better because unfortunately Padma was balanced around endurance. And obviously we don't have endurance anymore. In Kaipoera, my other game is the ability to quickly understand an opponent's intentions and during a fight or a game, full trick and deceive them. Cool. To be honest, when people quickly, people pronounce Helium 4 quickly, I parse it as Helium 4 and get really confused for a second. So this card costs a lot. It says whenever you encounter a piece of ice, if it's strength 3 or less, you may remove one host to power counter to bypass it. Use this ability only once per turn. Oh boy, more bypass. Whee! Um... Threat 4, which, mind you, Threat 4 just inherently shows up on a fair bit of cards in the set, is just cursed text because the amount of time that the game is in Threat 4 is very, very small. 
Um, it's just, that's really rough text, but it's good text when this happens. Whenever you encounter a piece of ice, you may remove this program from the game to bypass it. Now, very importantly, this trashes itself when it's empty. So best case scenario, you bypass a small thing and then bypass one big thing. You paid four credits for that. Is that fair? It's tricky, right? Like this is the beauty of inside job. And as much as the corporation can play around inside job, uh, inside job pays two and makes a run for the same click. Now there's an upside here is because you install this program and then it's on the table and any run you feel safety that you can face check into a drafter. Like that's kind of cool. And four is expensive. I think this card is interesting. I think it's really cool. I think in Padma for four influence, splashing one of them could make some amount of sense because that is a strong ability. And every time you run R&D, it's hard to keep you out if you're bypassing stuff. That's cool. Obviously Mercury support, but I don't like bypass on a stick. I don't like it. I think it is largely fairly costed. I don't think it fits into good stuff criminal, but it could be wrong. Generally criminal will just face check into the small stuff and then produce the right breaker. The question is, is this cheaper? And mind you, this is the same thing that kind of showed up with endurance where four credits feels like a lot, but then once you're breaking the ice for free, it actually pays for itself relatively quickly so the idea is that if i break two drafters with carmen for like what is it eight credits and a breaker for five to three does the melandra gonna make more sense yeah it might and so i'm interested to see where that comes in uh does this make sense in the jay chinho decks 100 it does maybe alongside an ice carver i think dropping four to three is actually really important but ice carver is also three influence so it's hard to find a deck where all that makes sense and also this is when you encounter a piece of ice, so very importantly, cards like Leech that you're going to use when you are encountering, I think that verbiage is unfortunately a bit hard to parse. You can't actually use. So this card is probably okay. I love Bypass. Oh man, I don't like Bypass. Ben Amparo, Brazil. Kara, how's it going? A lot of ice above three strength. It's like a mix. Some of the low strength ice like is just, you know, ping, which like bypassing that can matter obviously in some board states i think drafter is like almost always cherry picked as the best option here and rightfully so because having a way to break drafter is incredibly important uh but this is the most taxing guys i can imagine at three credits or at three strength right like bypassing a magnet yeah on some runs that does matter a heck of a lot of course it does but generally you're breaking this for two credits into the mid game so it might not matter it's kind of like a pre-installed two use boomerang and that might be fine that generally might be fine as much as mu is uh, is tight so yeah Hey, Nanako. Yeah, she just had lunch. She's moving to the bed slightly over there. I'm too loud. Yeah, Leech doesn't work. Leech doesn't work, which is probably for the best. Yeah, interesting card. Um, Hard to see where it is. There's more bypass, unfortunately, in the set. Uh, Here's Fizerum and Tangler. This is a slime mold thing, and slime molds are actually really interesting because slime molds are the sort of things that people can study because they actually do really good pathfinding. I know I had friends in college that were actually doing studies on slime molds, and they were saying like you can use slime molds to find an efficient network pattern where you put a certain amount of like foods, like sugar, where all the stops are in a metro, in a metro city, and then the the physerum, the slime mold, will actually build a very efficient route, which you should replicate because it is naturally very efficient when it comes to like metro lines. Uh, really cool. And that's the idea is that we'll get in there eventually. It finds a route eventually. Would I argue that we're getting too cute here when I just want a criminal card that does something that sounds like a crime? Yeah, maybe. I think this is ripe for here. So we have something that's cuter than, uh, you know, it needed to be maybe. It's cute that Pat referenced slime molds in one of his fiction pieces. Oh, he did. He didn't he? Monkey wrench works. Yeah. Monkey wrench does work for this, uh, which again, that's neat. That's definitely interesting. Monkey wrench feels a bit better in the set. They did a test with the slime mold in Tokyo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. So people have been using slime molds because they are genuinely interesting. Yeah, Monkey Wrench got better in the set. Whenever you encounter host ice, if it's not a barrier, you may pay a credit for each subroutine it has to bypass the ice. But when the corp purges, trash this program. So is basically the text on Femme Fatale. I know I shouted out Femme Fatale when it came to our predictions. Femme costs nine and it marks one ice. Now, Femme is an okay to bad killer on its own. It used to be better back in the day where sentries were generally low strength, a lot of subroutines. It's not that way anymore, really. Uh, but it's a femme that gets purged that you install for zero. The no barrier clause is kind of interesting because there are a lot of decks that have more taxing barriers than anything else. I'm looking at you, Sokka. Uh, but this is, again, bypass on a stick. It's three influence. It's a virus, which means you can't reposition with the Vernissage. But this is another card where I think inherently purging is just very, very, very difficult. In Netrunner, we've seen more cards, again, Helium 4, that make purging, I would say, inapproachable. So, yeah, this is frightening. Now, how this plays out, it's a bit more nuanced because I think you can't just like install this on an ice, not knowing the ice is because if it's a barrier, it's really bad. And I don't expect a criminal to have a lot of ways to reposition this. You can play this in as as a program that comes off the top with a prognostic mid run. There's some stuff in there. Helium 4. Uh, 
<laughs> nine credits difference to install yeah yeah it's um it's hard to think that this is not going to be frustrating to deal with uh is it better than inside job and boomerang generally probably not it might not be i'd be surprised if it is in some ways but i do think that um Purging is going to be really hard. Simul chip is definitely going to be amazing with this. I'd argue that like if you're playing Simul chip and this is three influence, are you better off playing Botulus? Right? Like there's a bunch of things that you can do with this that shapers don't do with this. So the question is what faction is playing Simul chips to do this? Like maybe you're playing some Feist Arums and you're playing Simul chip and Criminals so you can play Revolver and stuff like that. But we've already had cards that do something like this that don't see consistent play on top of Simul chip as much as Botulus Virus stuff is real. And mind you, this coming in with a virus token doesn't really matter in Nop Curry decks and stuff like this. But uh, this is just another tool for the sort of thing that bypasses ice. This is, a, again, a bit of a frustration. I think this set has the most bypass tools probably out of any set ever. And a lot of people don't like bypassing ice because it means the tax on the ice doesn't matter. Now, that's not entirely true here, but I don't like bypass because it means that the ice you brought to the table might not matter. And for what it's worth, this card and, and this card, that's not 100% true, but do just keep that in mind. The more bypass in the game, it can get frustrating because you don't have a lot of angles. Plus, Polongi, it's not a barrier, though. So you can't unbarrier a thing. You can barrier a thing to your detriment, but you can't unbarrier. Yeah. If you're Krim, the botch simul chip is just a lot more influence. Exactly. Well, yeah, if you're Krim, but Krim's simul chip doesn't seem like it's worth doing it. Why not spree and criminal with tranquilizer? Oh, that's interesting, actually. I haven't thought about that. That's kind of cool. I think it's a Krim botulist. The Krim botulist is boomerang. Right? Right? Yeah. This is the thing that I was actually surprised is I thought we would see a card in this set that gives you the sort of like weak uh bypass protection i didn't want guard but i wanted something like magnet that says like the turn this is res ice cannot be bypassed i feel like i just need a low influence tool like that to feel like i have some agency into bypass decks because if i put ice on central servers and you know mercury just goes through with inside job and sees three on hq like i just don't feel like i have intelligent ways to play around that play pattern uh, and that's inherently just frustrating yeah crimbosh is mostly boomerang tranquilize only triggers on install and start a turn yeah but you can still be annoying with it okay what the heck is this Amelia Earhart, this is from, from Jonas, from uh, TBU3K. Yeah, uh, whenever a run on HQ or R&D ends, if you access three or more cards during that run, place a power counter on this resource. So get one power counter on it, run R&D, great. There's a story, mind you, about Wingspan. I'm not too plugged into Wingspan. Uh, when your turn begins, you may remove three hosted power counters and trash this resource. If you do, the corp loses 10 credits. What? What? stop stop he's already dead like what i i don't get this what am i meant to do about this if this hits the table what am i meant to do that's why we got paula's cafe yeah like 10 credits what are you meant to do if padma gets us down for three influence charges it once and then just runs r&d runs r&d and you lose 10 what what do hello and admittedly, maybe this sees no play because if you've already seen nine cards, how have you not won the game already? But like, there's just, there's nothing to this clause. You just too big to fail? Not really. I don't know. This is, uh, this is frightening. Th this. <laughs> uh, stone chip is great. Oh my God, you can stone chip this thing. And that's the thing too. It's like, this is a virtual. So if you have a deck and this card turns out to be problematic, which again, it might not, it probably isn't. But if this card is problematic, we have a virtual tutor. So you can pull this out. Do you know also is a virtual you can tutor from your deck? Dig. Great. So you charge this once, the corpse scores out, they lose 10 credits. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. Yeah, we can tutor virtuals now. And this is exactly what I mean. Not that Amelia Earhart's a problem, potentially. It might not be. It's probably pretty clumsy to play. But this is where like having a virtual tutor for the game is probably not a good thing to have. Yeah, grab the twinning. Grab Airheart, grab Dag. Like you just set it up. Ten's a big number. This card is really panned and testing. I hope it is. I hope it's terrible. But then that's the thing that I don't understand. Obviously, this is meant to be a bit of a thank you to Jonas, and Jonas had a fantastic year that year. Home, oh, damn, Jonas kicked ass. But like, it's a mixture between a card that seems when it fires, it's gonna be really unfun. But don't worry, cause it's not good. Right? Like, if this is good, it's not good. Like, it's bad. I'll be upset. But if then if it's good, like, if it's bad, then it's like, we forgot about it. 
I guess it lets you feel better after failing to win three multi-Xs. Yeah, and we had cards like that back in the day. And I'd argue, like, those cards are kind of interesting. Like, Turning Wheel, and mind you, unfortunately, the way Turning Wheel worked out wasn't healthy, but it was a card that accrued value that you can, can do into multi-Xs if you whiffed. There's something to that, to make sure that you don't get lucky and it kind of, like, you know, it irons out, you know, bad luck. And there's something to that. But lose two 10 credits, there's, that's just, that's a problem. Scape net? Yeah, right. Like, are we, are we scape netting people? Are we... Is this where we're at now? Like we have the Yu-Gi-Oh! Go get your virtual and then they play the Yu-Gi-Oh! Hand Trap, trash your scape net. Like, you're, sorry, you're Amelia. What's going on? You count upgrade too? Sorry, Chris. I don't know, by the way, Continental Champs also got cards. I don't know if they do anymore. I think they get likenesses now. I think now the only way that you can get the champ card is by winning worlds. Uh, you get likenesses from now on from winning this. It was just something that changed a while ago. Immediately used with shapers like Pudma, Stone Ship, and Flux can be powerful. Yeah, with Flux! Like, you can Flux this trivially! The turn this comes down, you can charge it. Like, I don't... Yay! Compared to the modern tools, like, 20 the turning wheel seems so gentle. I... It, it, <laughs> Alice, how's it going? Yes, it, it kind of is. It's keeping an RFG so you can't levy it back. Lol, yeah, I know. Isn't this a big splashy play that energy wanted, though? I... I don't know. Because it's one thing to have a big splashy play, but then when the corp loses 10 credits, they just stop playing Netrunner. Like, if you go from 10 to 0, you do not play Netrun anymore. It, economic attack is a cool thing for Criminal. It is. It's part of the color pie. But losing 10 credits on a board state where the runner largely has control over it, you just fail to play Netrunner for a couple turns. Your play is credit, credit, credit. Next turn, credit, credit, credit. Oh, man. I guess charge is good. Yeah, I think Padma has been re redeemed in a lot of ways. There's a lot of good Criminal cards, but, like, this is not what I wanted. Clownos don't get cards nor likeness. Oh, I'm sorry saying that. Is this like Crypto Crash? It's like Crypto Crash for sure, but Crypto Crash has an agenda on the table. Like there's so much risk attached to this. There's no risk attached to this. You can generally do this with, a, with mi I wouldn't say minimal effort because you have a deck build around it, but like the, they can't interact with it. You can interact with the Crypto Crash. You can steal it. It gives you two points. You can play around Crypto Crash. Mind you, runners are much better at ducking Crypto Crash because they can install it. Like you see good players playing around Crypto Crash. Can a corp play around this to some extent, but nowhere near as much as a runner? Like corporations are not just resing sand sands, you know? It doesn't RFG, so you can recur it. Yeah, you can recur it. It's tricky, but not impossible. Uh, reclaim. Mind you, Reclaim recurs virtuals. <laughs> At least the runner doesn't gain 20. I don't know. Yeah, super wild. This seems like a nightmare to test. Uh, we have to hope that it's, it's tested out, but like this is frightening. Frightening. Economy has changed and is much more stingy since account siphon. 10 credits for corp. It's, it's a lot of money. Corps need to spend their credits down to 5 so melee doesn't hurt as much. Yeah, I don't know. Res Regolith, exactly. It's like load bang Regolith gets so much stronger. It's like, oh man, I guess we're all playing Regolith now. Anyways, uh, this is a card I haven't seen before. This is Julie Barela Re Lee. Mind you, this is the partner to Debbie family, but they work together in the, the, the narrative. When you install this resource, it costs one influence, so easy for Seb. Load four power counters on it. Okay, more loads. All the power counter support in the set is in criminal, I think. When it's empty, trash it. Okay. The first time each turn you take an action on an installed resource, remove one host of power and gain a click. Yeah, there's two revealed today. The other one's a Jinteki card. So I get Julie down for free. I hit friend of a friend. I clicklessly gain five credits. Doesn't work with conduit. No, the action has to be on a resource. Mind you, action means it, it takes a click. Action is click into colon. This seems really good. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, no. Liberated for free? It's the first time each turn, so slowly, yeah. Smartware is Rizeki at home. That's really funny. That's funny, yeah. You actually can't hit Smartware for free. Oh, man. Julian Wheels. Yeah, Julian Wheels are really good together. Uh, Wheels, mind you, is just very good. Obviously, like you play three of probably in Sev because it does everything you want it to do plus more. But yeah, I, so far with the Anarch, like so much of what we've seen is like install and just get a boatload of value from your connections. And uh, I don't know what to do about that. Julian Proko, yeah, it's fun. I don't know if you want to do that. I think Proko is really hard because if you're playing Seb, and mind you, you don't have to play Julie and Proko and Seb. Maybe you can play an Az. An Az, like this is kind of neat too, right? Beatrice and Eero, yeah, it makes it makes. Beatrice is more playable, that's for sure. Red team? Ooh, red team's cool. So it's neat. Yeah. In Seb, you don't want to play Proko, I don't think that often, because they can trash it, and that's a problem. 
Julie's fun. Yeah, I think Julie's fun. Julie's just another value bomb, though. It's just like I install this for free and I gain four free clicks. Right? Like you install this for two to zero from seven, you just gain four clicks. Seems kind of wild. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very playable. That's very, very playable. The Moreira sisters, oh, their sisters can be any less alike, each taking after her own father. But after they were forced into this, yo, speaking of De Debbie, was I the only one who whiplash really hard here? This is Debbie downtown. I thought like the kind of, you know, I would say I don't expect much from Debbie, the value card that gives you like three credits in your criminal deck in some games if you're lucky. And then in the narrative, Debbie is like descending on the Brazilian White House to assassinate the president. <laughs> so funny. It's like that Debbie? The bassist that needs guidance? Anyways, it's funny. That's criminal cards. Uh, a lot of bypass stuff. That's for sure. Two cards for four turns of a free click. Yeah, it's really good. If the concern with Seb is being click intensive, then Julie seems like a problem. Yeah, Julie definitely helps. If Seb is click intensive, you definitely need Julie in there for sure. Like, it's it's gain two clicks when you hit, uh, what's her name? Julie's Pancakes vibe? Yeah, it's good that obviously she doesn't last forever. But like, yeah, pay two to get four free clicks is seems above curve. Seems way above curve. And then it just helps you set up. Wild. Okay. Um, I've talked about this card at length. I think this card's really good. I think this card is terrifying. Um, getting good criminal pressure. I, I honestly think I'm out of most people I've heard highest on this than most folks. Julie doesn't work with Wildside though. No, she definitely doesn't. But like it's the same sort of thing that you it just gives you a free click a turn to do your thing. You can recur with privilege access. Yes, you can recur everything with privilege access. There's so much recursion in this set. It's just any card you'd be like, oh, I spent like like this is the problem with privilege access that I'm scared about. It's like, okay, so you just got four free clicks for zero credits. And then you're going to get another four free clicks for zero credits. And you got a fermenter back. Like, it just becomes... It, it feels to me that we're just trying to build the most efficient busted engine versus the corpse efficiency. And I don't think the corpse is going to win that. Uh, we haven't got the corpse cards yet. Wondering if the corpse and wild win rate last season was a result of all the wild runner cards getting stuck in RWR? Uh, I don't know about that. I don't know. Uh, anyways, I think this is really good. I think I'm higher in this than anyone. I'm going to put two in every Shaper deck, especially a Shaper deck that wants to run, which I'm hoping is more of them. I think this is really, really, really good. That's a better... Uh, yeah, I, I don't say that, but it's totally fine. I know you mean quite well. Uh, it's technically you're not... A lot, there's like some words you, you generally want to avoid on like MSG type streams. That's one of them. That's fine though. This card is neat. Man, the art on this is great. Flora Wayland. Place three power counters on this event, then run any server. Very importantly, you cannot charge this card because it's not installed. Charge uh, is very clear as an installed card. Uh, host a power counter. Host one installed Trojan. Program on a piece of ice protecting the attack server. So it's. I think a lot of players are going to play this incorrectly when they crack their pack, uh, which I think mine's going to be on Friday. Host one installed Trojan is not from hand. You just move it around from the table. So nothing is leaving your grip as much as you can Arasana first and then move it around if that makes sense. And it can. The idea is that you can run through ice. You can cube on through it pass it cube on through it or flux flux yeah that's right you can file amelia amelia Earhart on the turn it comes down or it means get out or leave town yeah so folks glad folks got the debbie whiplash she's a death metal band though so it worked that she knows how to throw down <laughs> yeah um downtowners are a death metal band i think debbie was based off of an existing uh musician from a death metal band yeah uh yeah this card is interesting because it doesn't like really slot in any straightforward Arsana decks we know of. It gives flexibility and it probably breathes some life into like the things that you don't often see, like Monkey Wrench or Umbrella that require a bit of positionality. Polongi gets a bit better, and that's cool. I think inherently in Arsana decks, it's hard to get slots. Like it's just hard to get slots in a deck. Uh, to do this sort of thing, but I think we're going to see this in weird decks that are more combo decks, right? Like again, you can fly a flux three times in a turn, no problem. Cuban a lot, Pichachan a lot, and you can go to town pretty, pretty hard with this. Uh, that's quite powerful. Now, at the end of the day, all your things are going to end up on one server, maybe even on one ice, and that's a problem for you. Uh, but this card is going to open up a fair bit of weird combo deck building. Obviously, this is a mulch card. You can move botulists around. It is too influence, so it is something. The song stays more synergy with Egret for weird combos. I'd argue that it's probably not worth pursuing this to make Egret better uh, compared to other stuff you can do. But yeah, you, you can do weird stuff with this and it enables weird stuff. I don't see how it fits into like reg stuff. Spree plus for Zerum is fun. Yeah, you can do it. If you hit a barrier in a really bad spot and then that's 
probably more expensive. Like moving around a slab band will probably get you far enough, but I, I could see it. Egret, you mean since Plongi doesn't get hosted? Oh, yeah, yeah. You'd have to move around Egret. And like, that's okay. Egret, mind you, only works on res dice. You can't host Egret on unres dice. That shouldn't matter because you have every paid ability timing window on this thing possible. Uh, so that works. This allows you to move Egret on non res dice. I don't know if it does. I don't think it does. I notice that Spree and Muse do not mention that we must pay the cost of install. It seems to be implied now. Uh, Spree doesn't install cards. Am I wrong about this? I think Spree... Can you install Trojans with Spree? Wait, you can install Trojans with Spree? I thought you just moved them around from the table. Yeah, Spree does not install cards. Okay, so Diogen. This does not install cards. So that's why. Yeah, it just moves things that are existing on the table. That's very important. I think a lot of people are going to goof that up, just like I almost did. But yeah, that's very important. They, it's not like dump three from hand, which is actually a harder card to play. I think this is neat. I like that we got like fundamental Arasana stuff in the first set. And now we're getting a couple more cards that are just like situationally interesting and that build stuff. Muse does. Yeah, Muse 100% installs. You pay for cost for Muse, though. Uh, install costs are implicitly required and have been. Yeah, it'll say install ignoring all costs if it explicitly is ignoring all costs. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, SMC SMC says paying all costs, probably. I don't actually know what SMC says. Good night, Andre. Hey, good night, Morgan. Congratulations on the set launch, eh? Get some sleep, huh? Yeah, so this doesn't say install paying all costs, but it's assumed. It'll tell you if you don't, if you don't. You can only install Egret on a res piece, so you can host it on anything if you've res to move it. It doesn't trash itself. It ends up on D-Res Magnet, for example. Cool. Did the original one say paying all costs? Yeah, it said paying install cost in brackets. And NSG has just said, like, anytime it's installed, it's implied. So, yeah. So if we're running a three ice server and we have a Cuban, that's a six ready economy card. As long as you can get through all the ice, yes. As long as you can get through all the ice, it is. Um, is a six credit econ card abstractly. Is that worth it? I'd argue probably not. Like, that's not a consistent card that you want in your opening hand. So I think, again, the decks that are going to build this are not just, like, doing cube on stuff. They're probably doing something a bit clever with it, which is kind of cool. I thought the MU cost was voided on Muse. No, yeah, you have to pay for the MU cost. Uh, Muse is... Damons will say if they're not. Yeah, we got a Damon in the set. All right, this is another Edmund Chinian art. I think this might be my favorite flavor text. Eight billion corner office is so funny. I don't know why I love that. It's so funny. <laughs> Place four credits on this event. You can spend credits during the run. Cool. Now it runs R and D. So already we have a very limited overclock. There's more text here, but pay four credits, run R and D for one. We're getting three credits on this. We could get more on overclock. If successful, place two credits on this event and access one additional card when you breach R and D. Now, when that run ends, you may run a remote server. So it's a combination of three cards. It's half overclock. It's half jailbreak. And then it's half get a free run. Sometimes I don't have a, a good reason to make that make sense. Uh, it's an interesting card. It's another card that I feel like is kind of like spree that is slots intensive. Generally with cards like this, you probably want a card that is a bit more focused that works on one board state more than others. Cause it's not hard to find yourself in a situation where you have this in your hand and you don't want to pay four credits to run R and D to see two cards and, or you, the remote run doesn't matter for you. Like it's hard. It's hard to get a board state in which all of this works for you really, really well. So that's the sort of card that generally shows up as maybe a one of maybe a two of, but I'd argue that if we want multi-axis, we'll pursue better multi-axis. If we want overclock, we'll pursue overclock. The best case for this for a mile is if you're playing into asset spam and they don't ice up R&D, and then you can run R&D and then have six credits to trash remote server. That is probably okay. Again, overclock does see good play in our Asana decks, and I like overclock a lot. So I think if we're going to see this. We're going to see in something particularly interesting. I'm not sure what it is. If you have run based triggers that are on successful runs, this is really good. It's also really hard to play this when you don't know if you're going to make a successful run. And sometimes with Ari, it's not guaranteed. The run on RD doesn't have to be successful for the remote run, so it's something. Oh, that's very true. Yeah, the run on RD doesn't have to be successful. That helps. So, like, you can bounce off of it and the run on RD. The question is how much are certain people going to ice certain central servers? When it comes to the next card, you have a big, very big reason to ice R&D pretty much way sooner in the game than you used to. So um, I don't know. It's a lot on a card, that's for sure. And like this sort of card has the same sort of vibe as Praxis does, where Praxis is just a value bomb. Like this is just like it does this. Oh, and it does this and it does this, which makes it harder to like parse and to maybe understand. I think, though, where Praxis is good on 
just about every deck that you put it in because it's absurd. Uh, it's much harder to get all parts of the um of the beast into this. Do the credits slash cards exist for the remote run from Trickshot? Yes, that's the point. So, oh, well, you don't access additional cards on the remote server, but for the run on the remote server, you can have up to six credits on this that you can use. Yeah. My understanding is the computer science concept the daemon subtype is referencing is just pronounced demon. I think people say daemon. It's probably pronounced demon. It does have that archaic like ligature AE combination. What were they called in Dark Materials? His Dark Materials. Daemon is, is yeah, credits carry. Credits definitely carry over. Super powerful card. I don't know if this is powerful. I think there's a chance that you won't see this. Um, just because the situation for it to be good is super, super narrow. So if there's maybe one in the deck, there's one in the deck. It's just like play a game in Netrunner, play Shaper, play Arasana. You don't have to play Arasana and find out a board spate where you want to run RD, C2, and then also run the remote server all in the same turn. It's really difficult. Are we calling privilege access praxis? Love it. I've heard someone else say that in one of the daily casts, and I thought it was so cute in the comment section. They were called daemons in his dark materials. Did they pronounce it daemons or demons? Who knows how they pronounce it hundreds of years in the future in present day Brazil? That's why we're asking Ginevra. <laughs> might run three trick shot and three overclock and hyperbaric kit. I think in Kid it actually might be pretty tricky, right? Because in Kid you specifically are kind of bad at running two servers. Because only one ice is a code gate. In HDM it was called Damon like that. But did they say Demon in like the in the films or the TV show? I say Damon and I work in software. They pronounce a demon in the show. Really? I was surprised to see that. I thought they were like kind of smooth it and not say demon. How did they pronounce it in the book? <laughs> And then what's her name? Lara? Is it Lara? I forget. Lyra? And a liar leans over and says Damon with a pretty big A in it. I say Damon doesn't disambiguate. It did because I said it. <laughs> okay, this card's absurd. This card slaps. Art's so good. We saw some really good Diego Sadaba art, uh, hardware art in the set. So this is, mind you, there was a set of cards that were released on the Null Signal stage. No, this was a Jeff card, excuse me, that are throwbacks to old cards. It's more Padma support. It's more rigging up support. When you install this, load two power counters and when it's empty, trash it. When it's empty, trash it is showing up on a lot of stuff. That's unfortunate for World Tree enjoyers. Uh, so yeah, keep it in mind. It's a balancing mechanism. It is what it is. It's also important because you don't forget that you can't charge empty cards, which stops you from being frustrated. Whenever you make a successful run R&D, instead of breaching, you may remove one host of power counters to look at the top four cards of R&D and range them in any order. This text alone would be a printable card. This text alone would be a good enough card. Period. Then spend a click, host a power counter, breach R&D. Uses ability only if you made a successful run on R&D this turn. So that clause is important because the idea is that you can dump your whole cataloger, look at four, and then go back and access the top. It's a breach. So all the cards that say when you breach, access more cards. And there's a bunch of those. Like I think, does twinning work here? Not that you need it. Yeah, whenever you breach. So things like this definitely do work. That's really important. Mind's Eye is going to come up a lot on this too. And I don't think you need to do Mind's Eye, but Mind's Eye has different text in NSG world. Breach R&D. You cannot access cards in the root of R&D, but this works. We played like with a Niashia deck. We played a weird deck list of the week a while ago that does all this sort of stuff. Uh, apparently we've lost art here. There is still space in the text box. Why not fill it? Think of the environment, Osher. <laughs> so this card for the uninitiated, I hope the art shows up, but I'm never going to do Okay, it's indexing. Indexing was busted. Uh, this is one of the most powerful R&D multi-access cards ever. For three influence, it showed up in every faction. There were some Anarch decks that played six to nine of these that did really well competitively. And I don't like this card because it blows you out on turn one. On turn one, you could do indexing, see two three-pointers. If the corporation did ice R&D, and then you can just like mad dash and you won. Game over. Very important to understand for those who haven't played against indexing, similarly to those who haven't played around uh, Lilo and Hermes came out, is that it's very important that there's certain ways this works out and doesn't work out. This cataloger access upgrades? No, it doesn't because it replaces the breach step. So you don't access the upgrades. Firstly, even when you whiffed with indexing, and mind you, indexing saw five cards, this saw four, you get good value with it because you get a range of the top four cards of R&D. And so you can just make the corporation miserable. Just miserable. So you'd be like, oh, I'm going to put all your economy at the bottom. You're going to be drawing a Nancy instead of Nancy. Good luck, right? Like it has a value even if it whiffs. If it doesn't whiff, you want to make sure that you're playing indexing. And then, of course, you're playing cataloger on board states in which the corporation cannot shuffle. With op, that can be pretty tricky. Making sure there's no spin doctors on the table because if they shuffle, they shuffle. Atlas counters. There's a lot of ways that corporations could play around this. 
This is also worse on tempo because while you install it and then you can choose to use it on any run, including with a run event, which does make it more powerful and you can rigging this up and you can Padma this, it doesn't do the run itself with indexing because indexing was a click and the value went off. Here you have to pay at least two credits and another click. So there's balanceable. Do you think it's splashable at four influence? It depends on the meta. I don't think you have to because I think other factions have good multi actions built in. Like we have a turning wheel tutor or sorry, a twinning tutor. I don't think you need to. I don't think criminals and anarchs are frustrated with the multi axis. If anybody shaper right now, I really like having more multi axis and shaper because all the shaper decks are currently playing conduit and conduit's really hard to play in the modern meta because a lot of decks are on two to three of virus because of all the anarchs that are getting played. So I found conduit to be underperforming when I've played it unless someone like really misplays into our Asana and then doesn't respect the sort of pop off you can do. Uh, cataloger is sick. It's really, really powerful. Um, this is a cool way to do indexing in a way that I wouldn't need jerk to be like, that's busted. Uh, yeah, it's, this is a really, really powerful card. And it's just generally like when they say the set has a new win condition and then Jai Chinu gets the conversation, this is a new win condition. It is. It's very powerful multi-axis, especially for a shaper that wants to make targeted runs. And once you've seen the four cards on the top of the deck, again, even if you whiff, you don't have to run R and D for like two and a half turns. Uh, just very, very powerful. You need to be on dedicated charge deck for this to be good. I don't think so. I think for this to be good on a non-dedicated charge, you just don't hit this button ever. I think it's fine to not hit this button. I think you can choose to hit this button, especially if you win the game. But if you just don't hit this button and you get two indexings for two credits on a card that you can play alongside run events, just don't hit this button. Hit this button if it wins you the game or if you need to. I also think this set got so many ways to make Mad Dash absurd. We didn't mention this when it came to the Anarch card. Like, uh, what's it called? Helium Fora. Host an agenda on it over install your helium for it to trash the agenda mad dash archives like there's so many cards in the set that make mad dash really really good this is one of them and mad dash being good i don't think is healthy for the game but when you access a card in archives and mind you you need to get the agenda in there so okay that's a bit convoluted uh it doesn't work with uh cupellation uh because you can't do agendas but just keep in mind there's a fair good mad dash targets it also isn't unique it isn't unique which doesn't exactly matter as much as you can get them out of your hand sooner than later this doesn't mean that you can some upgrades might fire twice, once on the first use and then again on the second use. Yeah, Jeremiah, how's it going? It depends on the upgrade. Because things like Mana Garm happen when? When the runner approaches, so you don't do any approach things. So any upgrade that fires on Breach, yes. Uh, but you also don't access upgrades. So things like Ganked won't fire because you won't touch it. So yes and no, it depends on the text of the card. But you need an upgrade. So say we do T upgrade X Breach Z standard. Apparently, it's only Wands of City Grid, so nothing too much to be worried about. Sick card. Shaper, I think, is the most excited I am about the set by a mile, um, which shouldn't be a surprise. Because they printed cash again. <laughs> the set is saved. Andre's Doomer takes are worth nothing because we got cash. Uh, yeah, 10 out of 10. It's cash. Um, sick. Getting ganked while using Catalogger's ability is going to be annoying. You can't because you won't access it. You do, you only uh, breach our D. Oh, actually, do you? You can get ganked, right? <sighs> yeah, this is, this is good. It's good. It costs two. It's good. It's not a virus. That's fine. I don't care. It's not a virus. Uh, only use it on your turn. Technically slightly worse, but that's fine. Uh, actually, a fair bit worse that this is only used your turn. That's worth something because sometimes you want to do tricks on their turn. Um, they could put the ganked on top and then bump into it. Yeah. <laughs> we got cash plus a pawn shop target that recurs cash and sticks to the board. Which one, Spark? Yeah, World Tree. So for what it's worth, when it comes to cash, I would rather play World Tree than Pawn Shop. I don't think Pawn Shop makes a lot of sense when you have World Tree that can sell a thing, not only get three credits, but install a card from your deck, which sets up your next World Tree. We are lacking click compression in Shaper. And so World Tree gives you your click compression. Maybe you play one Aesops in World Tree, but if you, I wanted to play an Aesops deck in Shaper, I'd probably play World Tree sooner than Coalescence. Cash Bill Flux is just more complicated Cubon. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is sick, sick, great. This will inherently build other shaper archetypes because they have a card they can install. And mind it, being two versus it being one for cash is actually super important because that lines up better with DZ MZ and it lines up better with things like urban art vernissage. Uh, so the fact that you can actually gain four credits from this if you install it cheaply is not dissimilar that you could install a cash cheaper and or with fire synergy to get four credits off of it. So all in all, it's in faction and it's good.
Click impression, I hear Ari calling. Yo, Jeff, how's it going? Congratulations on Daily Cast, by the way. Man, absolutely stellar week of, of content. Um, mind you, the CO2 recently. Yeah, installing this mid-run with Ari is also kind of funny because while it will trash itself, you basically clicklessly gained four credits during a run and then hopefully you simul chip it or world tree it into something else, right? Sick. It's a workhorse of a card. Probably not sexy to a lot of players, but very, very important that Shaper has something that's a bit more interesting with the board. Why is Coalescence good? Is it charged? No. I don't think you ever charge this. So the idea with Coalescence is that if you can install this cheaper, which there are a lot of shaper ways to do it, it is now an econ card that's attached to the program slot. So imagine that you have a DZMZ or imagine you have a Vernissage, right? So you install this thing for one, maybe zero credits, and you just gained four. So it's an economy card in the program slot, which means it interacts with all the shaper magic that you have that allows you to recur, reinstall, forfeit, trash, send it away, all these sort of things. And we lacked a card like this. In the modern card pool, there was no program that you wanted to install that would actually be tempo positive. That's really important, is that there was no card that you could install that after you installed it, you were further ahead in the game. All the programs you installed would put you further behind because there were icebreakers or utility cards that cost money that didn't immediately give you something. And so now we have a card like this that I can install, I can gain four credits off of it ideally, and then world tree it into something in the future. And then on a turn where things are not going well, I can trash something to simul chip it back in. Simul chip, mind you, installs it for free, so I gain four credits. It's a workhorse. It's a really important card that we have a program that can give you money because now all the cards that interact with programs can give you more money from this. Cubone, but it has the same restrictions. Yeah, Cubone, you have to be running, so you need breakers. It's not exactly it, but it's very close to what we have. Only charge it with rigging up. Yeah, you can rigging up it. I'd be surprised to see a deck that does it, but with rigging up, it's technically a six credit econ card. Ooh, and there's other weird econ cards too, like rejig. If you rejig this, mind you, you're playing maybe a lily pad. You just gained four credits and drew a card. We now have a Shaper Engine. Maybe you're playing Onicom, so you have four credits, drew a card. Cool. Uh, you have a lot of weird things you can do with this. Flux, I, I wouldn't go out of the way to charge this in this set specifically because this set has so many bonkers things to charge, but you can charge it. It makes a Flux into a Cubon, which I don't know. I just play Cubon, I reckon, unless I have other charge targets, and maybe I'll do that on a turn where I don't have a better target. Just really good. Really, really good. Very, 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 very good. Good afternoon. Did we talk about unscooped cards? We saw one so far. We're on our way to the second one. Oh, uh, we only have about an hour left. We're only on the shape of cards. Maybe we'll talk about runner cards today. How's it going, droids? Happy launch day. Ah, <sighs> Wolf 2 is here. So this is Adam Doyle art that I wouldn't be able to tell you very quickly is Adam Doyle art besides some of the squigglies here that are kind of lost on the compression on Netrun DB. But this is like what the Adam Doyle art looks like in the upcoming Arkham set that apparently is delayed in Canada till April. I'm really happy I crossed the border at the last minute. Uh, Lobosomim, mind you, don't know how to say it. We're waiting for that. But it is a werewolf type creature from, uh, from Brazil lore, uh, which is sick. I think this card is sick. I think this thing's so cool. The fact that it has art that makes sense for your opponent sitting across the table, 10 out of 10. Um, it's a decoder factor. We've seen that before. When you install this program, it costs eight, takes up two MU. Let's ignore that for now. And whenever it fully breaks a code gate, place a power counter on this. That means it is another rigging up target. That's sick. Interface one to one code gate, one for two strength. That is good. That is good decoder numbers. And when you fully break a code gate, it gets power counters. You can pay X credits and power counters. So it's not free. That kind of sucks uh, to break X barrier subroutines, which means if you play this and then you play Orca and you're going to play Spark of Inspiration, if not rigging up, you have a breaker suite of massive creatures that are synergistic in a way that makes me excited to play Big Rig Shaper 10 out of 10. This card is good. I think you probably can play Labus Omen. You probably want a Panic Fractor because I don't think you can rely on this. I don't think you want to play Propeller because it's too cheap. And if you're playing Spark, it's going to really goof you up. So I imagine you play like a Labus Somem. You need more MU, Orca, and then either like an Angolo or a Lamb season to taste. And then you have a pretty flexible Breaker Suite that actually makes a lot of sense. That makes me feel a bit better about playing Spark of Inspiration. Uh, I don't know. One Power Counter per Ice. Oh my God, it's one Power Counter per Ice. Oh shit, that's good. Oh, this is great. This is really good. I don't know. This is sick. Not Yeah, not X is amazing. What about Spike? We'll get to Spike in a second. I don't like Spike that much. Uh, this is good. This is cool. It'll build whole decks around it as much as Spark is not as exciting as I think you want it to be. But like, uh, honestly, one of my favorite cards in set. I'd play this. I don't know if it's tier one, but it's fun. And I want to play Orca because Orca is secretly very good. And you know what Orca does? Charges cards. Are we scared yet? Amelia Earhart? Are we scared yet? Cataloger? Are we scared yet? 
I don't know. Seems okay. All right, good art. It's a daemon. They're back. For those who don't know, daemons are subtypes of cards that host other cards, programs that host other programs largely. Uh, it comes in with no strength. When you install this program, I did not read the sentence fully. Search your stack, heap, or grip. Grip notable, heap, uh-oh, or another recursion card in the set for one non daemon program. Shuffle your stack after searching it. You have to pay costs for that, mind you. So you do get a thing down for two credits on top of this. You have to pay MU for this and the hosted card. So it is an SMC immediately that you have to crack for the exact same cost. That'll be a bit easier on MU, but a bit harder on MU. Harder on the permanent way, easier upfront. If that program is a Trojan, install it on a piece of ice so the Muse is just kind of left there. Otherwise, install it on this program. I don't know how to pronounce that. Vo, Mentor, Angel, Murdered by Porcos, Never Forgotten. Uh, really stunning art and really good flavor text, I imagine. Gauss's Emergency? I think Gauss's Emergency is really hard because if you're playing Spark of Inspiration and you hit your Gauss, you kind of lose the game, right? You can repair crumbs instead of just tutor? Yes. You can recur this to recur programs. It's shape or nonsense through and through. Now, very importantly, this is also the click compression for installables because this is one click to get two cards on the table, which when we talked about like world tree compression is what you want because the idea is that it's not great, but you can in theory abuse out something like, uh, what is the name of the cache? It's like way too long for as quickly as I want to say coalescence, um, is you can sell firstly the hosted card to the world tree, and then you can sell the muse to the world tree. That's cool. That's one card for two installs or one install for two clicks. That's actually very notable. It's recursion anti-tech. Uh, it's it helps echelon doesn't care about its programs, right? Icebreakers. Yeah. So like Maven, I guess it's a really flexible card. It's really powerful. Uh, the Trojan text is like good. It means that you can play one of Trojans and get them consistently. You still play to SMC and I still think you don't not play SMC, uh, but yeah, it's good. I think it's not worth the MU to get cards you want to keep installed, but having recursion for cards you want to throw out repeatedly and throw it out in Muse is great. Yeah, gunking up your MU is going to be difficult. So for Trojans, this is not that like bad on board state. So I think you're only MUsing for probably or amusing, excuse me, for for permanent programs if you're going to sell them or trade them. How was installed card on Act on used MU? Uh, totally normally. How's it going, for Epsilon? So you have to pay for the MU of the Muse and the hosted cards. Steve, how's it going? Will SMC get banned or rotated? Currently, there's no plans to ban or rotate SMC because while FFG cards as a whole get rotated, self-modifying code, very easy to forget, is actually not part of system gateway or system update. It's part of uprising. So it's legitimately a card embedded within the ashes cycle. So if they're going to ban SMC or rotate SMC, they would have to do it separately to banning and rotating ashes, which is currently not on schedule for like the next two, three years. Coalescence would be hosted on Muse, so both become a sole target for... Yeah, World Tree, exactly. You do each of them individually. Obviously, do the Muse second. Uh, yeah, ah, it's flexible. It's good. The recursion from Bin, like, you now have a deck that can recur six programs, three simul chip, three of these. You can also simul chip this back, but that's kind of nonsense, but uh, sometimes it's right because you can pull a card from your deck. Weird. Also, hosting viruses that get trashed while they purge, like, okay. Better than SNC for Trojans because it plays with UAV and DZ, but also you say worse for reg breakers. I think a part about why this could be worse for Trojans, and mind you, you can install this mid run with Arasana. I think that's really important. Like Arasana, you can install any program, but if that program is not a Trojan, it gets trashed. So if you're missing that like hush that you need right now, install the Muse from hand, use the Muse to install the hush. This will get trashed, but the hush will stay. So even in hand, this has value in Arasana, which is kind of cool. Rejig might be good. I think so, but then you trash the hosted card. So you need something to do with the rejig on the hosted card, right? Unless you're rejigging this in 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 a Trojan deck, which is kind of hard on slots. But maybe. I hear a lot of thoughts of the post SMC world, so I thought maybe it'd be coming. Yeah, notably, Steve, SMC was banned in Sunset, the, the sort of testing format, which is not meant to be like a balanced testing format, just like an ideas testing format, from my understanding. So is a world where SMC gets banned? Maybe. Is SMC restricting to the design space of Shaper? Most definitely. Uh, so maybe SMC won't be around forever. You can rejig the hosted cards. You can rejig the hosted cards, but then you still have a, a Muse hanging out, right? I just don't see why you'd do that. You could. You could. Hey, hurry. How's it going? What's the significance of installing a program on this card? Does it replace the memory cost? It has no significance. It's just addition. It pulls it from your deck or your heap or your hand. So it just uses up one more MU. 
very notably back in the day, we had cards that or daemons that specifically had interactions with the hosted MU. So this was Deg Deer. You can install other programs onto this. Each program installed this way costs one less, and the memory cost of the hosted program does not count. So because it has no text like this, the memory cost of the program, imagine it just being another program you have installed. But very importantly, if someone trashes the Muse, the hosted card also gets trashed as well because it is hosted on the card. But if I host a 2MU card on Muse, I am spending 3MU. Yeah, Leprechaun. I think Leprechaun even had flavor text about like how deep can you stack them, which like funny. What's Sunset? Uh, Sunset was a testing thing that NSG did. They made a format for the last three months or so to test out what Netrunner looked like while banning out a certain subsection of powerful cards. It technically ends today. I once saw someone running a seven-tiered nested daemon tree, right? So you can host a muse on a muse on a muse on a muse. And if you have enough money for one click, you can remove four cards from your deck. Oh, no, never mind. It says non daemon Never mind. Okay. You cannot host Muse on Muse. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. I did see that. You always want to reread the text when it gets weird like that. Be like, did they allow that to happen? Not that it would be a problem. There's also Sherazade or whatever. It was mentioned as a Hacker Hall of Fame. Yeah, Sherazade was a very important daemon back in the day. I really like that card. Installing 1001 programs puts you in the Hacker Hall of Fame or would if such an institution actually existed. And mind you, that is a reference to the Arabian Nights of that number. Okay, Pressure Spike, it's a Fractor. So we have two Fractors technically in the set. It comes in for four, which is not the cheapest. Uh, one Strength, one MU. Interface, one Break, one Barrier Subroutine. Okay, two for three Strength, not bad, but can be clumsy. Threat four text, and mind you, this has to be predicated with Threat four is just cursed text on Netrunner. It just doesn't work. Uh, from our understanding so far, Threat four just does not consistently work for a long enough period of time in which you can build around that part of the card being relevant. Because most corporations try to close the game out relatively quickly. On three-pointer decks, it's the worst, and we'll come back to that, because a lot of three-pointer decks will score a three, a three, or score no agendas and try and kill you uh two credits for nine strength is obviously goofy weird uses ability only once per run that probably is not a downside that needed to be on there but keep that in mind uh especially if you want to egret stuff the stress hurts then it must be a weapon so the fracture slot in shaper is a bit ugly uh propeller works gauss kind of works it's very noteworthy that the f uh, barriers currently in the standard format seem to be a bit like uh What's the word I'm looking for? Stratified? There's a word there that means that. But basically, there's a lot of low strength stuff and a lot of high strength stuff. Threat 4 doesn't exist until you slot Shibboleth. Shibboleth is the only card on which the threat text is active. It's really strange how that worked out. Bimodal? I guess so, yeah. Stratified. Stratified. Polarized? Okay. We know what we mean, right? But there's a lot of barriers that are low strength, in which this is not the cheapest way you can get through a low strength ping or border control. And then there's a lot of high strength barriers. Again, we saw like Sokka's Worlds list, which is like high strength barriers, the deck. So if you're trying to deal with a Pharos that's 10 strength, good luck. So abstractly, text like this is really nice because you have a way to deal with the low strength, but late game, you have a way to deal with the high strength. Now, specifically with Sokka's deck, is running almost entirely three-pointers. So the window in which the threat for text is active in a Glacier deck in which you would want this to break big barriers it's probably not going to do you any favors because at the end of the day, you don't have like the strength cost to break ice with pressure spike is not dissimilar to things like Kurapira and Kurapira is pretty expensive. So I don't think you can count on this, which is a problem. And so having this to be a solution to breaking a Pharos is only going to be breaking a Pharos for maybe a couple turns in which the corporation or you are on threat six. So I don't know. Is this better than Lamb as like a permanent way to deal with high strength barriers? Is it better than a Hush that can make Pharaohs attainable? Probably not. Uh, Lamb is generally about the same idea to break big stuff as much as I haven't crunched the math entirely. So it's really tricky because I don't think it's amazing against high strength barriers as rare as those are. And mind you, there are a bunch of high strength barriers in the set. So what's really hard to tell in this set is that there's so much stuff on the corpse side that really just cranks up strength of ice in a way that i'm not a big fan of but ice strength might be higher than it looks because it feels like this set specifically is waging an arguably a pretty ugly war against k2cp turbine and so there's a chance that having better strength boosting numbers matters it's just like how much does this break a brawn in the early game and the answer is seven credits how much does it break a brawn in the late game five credits if you get to the late game and Shaper and one on Threat 4, could I just put down a Cleaver and a K2CP Turbine or a Tacobi and break Brawn for two credits? Yeah. So having a payoff on a Shaper card that works in late game, to me, is like super antithetical to the fact that by the late game, like we're already turbined to the gills. So I don't know why I want a card like that unless having the four credit breaker early enough is good enough or obviously 
Cleaver gets banned or something like that. Kevin, thanks so much. New set hype. Thank you. 10, I believe, Australian dollars. Hey, how's your new set been? Are the cards up on Jinteki? We should check that every once in a while, but I don't think so. Vanilla Cleaver breaks brown for eight credits. Yes, but you try not to. You're right. You try not to. Like, that's unfortunately, it looks like they're not up there. Like, anybody comparing their Breaker Suite to, to Braun? Yeah, that's probably like a bad uh, a straw man of an argument. Uh, but we probably shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, I don't think they're up yet. I don't even know. Has uh, Null Signal put out the, like, the, um, the, uh, their launch article? No, not even yet. Like, normally there's an article here that shows all the cards and then has a pronunciation guide and stuff like that. Can see wafer designers have never cards to solve the objective math problems of Breaker Efficiency? I think they can. And I think we've seen some cool looks into it. Like Kurapira. Like, for what is where Lob is Somim and Orca. There are cards in which the math of it obviously is a bit of an ugly fight, but they have text on them that make them so interesting that people actually change their play patterns into this. At the end of the day, yeah, I break brown for ass with Kurapira, but it is actually interesting enough to build around. It'll it'll have an impact on what you res. I think the future of Icebreakers is something like this. It's not so much something like just having numbers that get better in the late game. Right? Like, I think this is one of the least interesting shaper breakers we've seen in the entire cycle. Even comparing itself to, like, um, uh, Living Mural and the other stuff. Yo, Ren, how's it going? I mean, I'd rather break Brown occasionally with Cleaver for eight and have all those other sweet breakpoints rather than have it like this. Yes, I agree. I agree. So it's, it's going to be tricky. Uh, cards like this also might just make more sense than limited play, like Startup, in which having a Fractor makes sense. Uh, so, again, for standard, I'd be surprised. Ren, I'm uh, halfway through the latest episode of the podcast enjoying it pretty mary de silva notably probably one of the most criminal cards in the whole set damn uh cd connection another one influence connection it's another card that has the same there's like there's a bunch of cards in the set that just say like whenever you do this see one more card uh not my most exciting netrunner because there's a bunch of these like incidental value cards whenever you breach rnd if you're allowed to access two or more cards, access one more. So if you play Pretty and you play Sunny Assassination, uh, you get a run R&D with like Aero and see like four cards or something. It's really weird because these cards, there's like inherently no counterplay to them. For what it's worth, I'm not too hot on this card because I feel like these cards inherently feel a bit win more. I'm probably wrong about that. But the same sort of idea like why Psych Mike doesn't even show up in World Tree decks is because by the time you're seeing three cards in R&D, do you need three credits? And probably not. But that's different because seeing one additional card on R&D has implications because you actually lock the deck for another turn potentially. So that can't matter because this means you can run less often. I'd rather play this than Psych Mike. You could play both for sure. Uh, but yeah, it's strange. We've seen so many incremental value cards like this in the set so far. And this is definitely not bad. Akiko support, that's kind of cool as well. Uh, there's a bunch of homes for this. Mind you, this also makes, uh, I'm pretty sure this makes Beatrice a bit better. Flavor text is fun too. But yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's a card that's going to come down for one influence in most sub decks, and then you have to just worry about Iru, I guess. What's the current hype level on Zero to Ten scale? My hype is really hard, high Piotr. I, I think it's an interesting set because like I have strong opinions on both sides of things. There's some really, really, really cool stuff, and then some other things I'm not excited about. So it's definitely super hyped. Like I want to get on Jane as soon as possible to test things and see some stuff. But yeah, there's some pain points I think in the set potentially, which we'll see how it takes out. There's a chance like Doom or Andre will be totally wrong in two weeks, and that's great. Do you think we'll see MCA informant again with all the new connections? I don't think you will, because I think most of the connections see play in Seb, in which tagging Seb is not that big of a deal. And then on top of that, when it comes to MCA informant, it's incredibly expensive. And if you want to play any sort of tag punishment, you're more likely to play more direct tag punishment. This card is absurdly expensive. Uh, it's a lot of money. Are you disappointed with some stuff instead? I don't think I'm disappointed. I think what I've said, and we've talked about this kind of at length already today, is there's a bunch of cards in the set including this card, that seem to me like they have totally different design goals than what NSG has done in the past. And I don't know how to rectify that. Like this set has a bunch of recursion, a bunch of install runner stuff, a bunch of unending <laughs> recursion, a lot of bypass. Like it just has a lot of stuff that I'm not the most excited about as a personal player and the way that I like the game as much as I'm not the authority on this, right? A lot of people are going to love this thing for sure. I think if Pressure Spike was a charge card instead of Thread, it would have been much cooler. Yeah, it's like hyperbaric though for barriers probably isn't healthy because then you can hyperbaric everything, right? Okay, we talked about this earlier on the stream if you're not tuned in. This is meant to be the climactic finale of the set. This is the two influence neutral card. It's very similar to a card we've seen before, which is Levy AR Lab Access, which a lot of players, if you asked me a day ago, uh, is it good that Levy is not in the game of Netrunner? My answer is yes. Back in the day, there's a lot of decks that could get to the end of their deck and then you thought, okay, I have a window now and then they just redo their whole deck and at that point not only is their deck 
just entirely events and value and multi-access because they've installed all their programs and hardware. Yeah, this is kind of this. This is harder to play in some ways for sure. The trash five from the top of your stack, I don't think it's that impactful as much as it means that you don't recur as many cards. So maybe you have a window before the game is over. But I think we're just on the cusp where like recursion is problematic on some Anarch decks. As much as I don't think those Anarch decks are going to play, uh, are going to probably not play this. I was very surprised to see another levy. Exactly. That's how I feel. I was very surprised to see another levy because I thought we learned through the history network that levy was not worth reprinting uh, for the health of the game. Now, I can be totally wrong about this. Of course I can. I'm probably not wrong about this, uh, but I'm not sure how to feel about this. This seems like it exists for narrative reasons um, more than gameplay reasons, which I don't love that. My Anarch deck wouldn't run this. It's too many important one ofs. But that's the thing is once you go through your deck, trashing the five. So like trashing the top five cards of your stack arguably doesn't matter, right? If you need those cards and you trash three simul chips in your Anarch deck, yeah, maybe that matters, right? But the chance of you getting through your deck, then Ashening, and then getting through that second deck, and then having to need every single card there, I think is really rare. But maybe that's showing us why we don't need Ashen in, in, at whole. Is Labor Rights healthier for the game than Levy? Arguably not. Mind you, Labor Rights is also another card that has struggled throughout the balance of Netrunner for many reasons. If you hit this button here, you see the show history. Labor Rights was also restricted for arguably less time than Levy because we, and mind you, the landscape of the game was different, but like these cards were seen as problematic as much as the game was different back then. Very, very different. It's hard to compare it. But I also think Labor Rights might not be a healthy card for the game because it's the same sort of thing. Somebody gets to the end of their deck and then they get nine more simul chips. Like we're just spamming the same cards over and over again. And I don't think that makes an interesting board state and an interesting game. So I don't think so. I don't know if Labor Rights is good for the game. And mind you, we have other recursion cards that see no play, and that comes down to the fact that there's no targets. But now is Katurga going to see play because we want to be able to get this back? Yeah, maybe. I like the game before getting rid of infinite economy for runners. This is going to really drag out the economy. It can. And Nick, how's it going? I agree. And this is where I'm a bit confused because NSG kind of made an effort to make the game punchier and faster about more Hail Marys. And then we see cards like this. And then we see cards like this which are like incremental value multi-access cards as opposed to like the sort of like haymakers. Like finality is what I thought we would see. Something like this, which is an interesting play that works in faction, that has implications, that's like a strong hit. And instead we get a lot of like these incremental value cards, like finality, like the new supposed Julie. And I think Julie is going to be a more fun card than, than, uh, than pretty for sure. Sorry, we might not have seen this card. I should leave it on the screen for longer. But you know what I mean? No same old thing makes Ashen Borderline bad. Yes. Jeff, and I hope Ashen is bad, borderline bad too. But then the case is, why was it printed? Why are we printing bad cards, right? Is it because it lines up with a narrative beat? Because if so, I don't, I don't know. Did I put this in the story and give me a card that I'm excited to play, right? So it's weird. It's like the only way that we're going to be happy, I'm going to be happy about this, is this card's unplayably bad. That's a weird spot to be in. Maybe I'll be interesting in a certain deck where it makes a lot more sense, and that's a cool deck, maybe. I like that it helps shapers be classic Doom Shaper with Aesop's new cash stuff. I'd be surprised if Aesop's is good enough in the modern meta. Um, but yeah, you can play like prepaid Kate type decks and that's going to be fun. Narrative was not the reason this card was printed. Okay, cool. That's good. That's good to hear. Anyways, it is what it is. Notably too, and this is very easy to forget on Levy, on Levy was more pronounced. Specifically the decks that played Levy, or some of the decks that played Levy, some of the main decks that played Levy, would be playing a lot of copies of prepaid voice pad. And this is like the big thing about Levy in general is prepaid voice pad was a card that gives you eventually, you know, three credits a turn as long as you're playing events. But the problem with events is you ran out of cards. So Levy was really good because you played it for two credits and then you got your whole deck back and your whole deck at that point was events because you installed all your prepaids and all your programs and all that sort of stuff. So your deck was just a draw and economy and some multi-access. That's really, really important. Now, this was actually a part of Levy is sometimes you saw people play Levy at weird times because inherently this is an event that draws five cards. Now, not necessarily five new cards, and keep that in mind, you're spending influence on this in every faction. You play Earthrise Hotel to pay four to draw six. This potentially is five to draw five. And sometimes you just need a new hand. So if you are playing this, keep that in mind. You don't have to wait to the bottom of your deck. Sometimes it is right just to play this, especially if you have one card in hand, because this is pay five to draw five. That's interesting. Now, it's not the most powerful part of the card, but just keep that in mind. Sometimes it's right just to levy to get a new hand. And uh, I think that there's going to be some cases as much as Ashen doesn't seem as flexibly good because of the other costs on this. Just, yeah, watch out for that. Is there a thematic reason why Ashen Epilogue does what it does mechanically? Yeah, I think it relates to the like the culmination of the story in which the runners end up kind of into the same spot they started. 
maybe five cards fewer, right? The idea is that after the assassination of the Brazilian president, a new president is instated. A dominant initiative doesn't pass, luckily, uh, but I don't know. It, like you, it wasn't the sort of like glory win that everyone wanted. There's just a new person up there on the on the podium. I'm happy with a card if it's competitively bad, but enables some jank decks that a bunch of people enjoy and are only possible because of Ashen. I agree with that entirely, and there's a lot of cards in this set that I feel that, but this is probably going to be a jank deck that I don't think is going to be healthy or fun to play against. As opposed to, like, which I think is huge success, things like the Wizard's Chest, which I'd agree is probably not the most competitive card, but that's fun. That's cool. I even think the alternate win condition of uh, Jay Chinyu, Jay, uh, that also can be more fun because I think it's not first order power. Dominion Initiative doesn't pass. Yeah, for now. All right, this character we've seen before. This is Valentina Ferreira Carvalho. Uh, Carvalho, that is the character from the lore of op. Uh, she got fired from her op job for publishing, I think, some information. It's been a while since I read it. I forgot who wrote that one, which is great. Resource connection. When you when you remove one or more tag, gain a credit. So it's basically like a built-in networking. It says whenever. That's weird. Uh, it says whenever. I know when I talked about the set, I wanted a neutral way to clear tags. This is probably it. But now, oops networking the idea is that if you have networking which i think you probably play in your sub deck as much as it might be harder to play random damage cards you don't have many random damage cards you can clear tags for free yes that's right more install runner here for seb i'm scared but you can clear tags for one cost less that's obviously incredibly important in seb because and it's not only when you remove tags like that's also really important for seb is even if you don't remove tags through the basic action you gain one more credit so if you do friend of a friend and clear a tag and gain five credits, you gain six credits. Woof. Just, just value flood. Um, it's absurd. Now, threat three is, I think, the only time that this card is actively really playable outside of Seb. I feel like installing this for two just to begin to save money off clearing tags from Oppo or face checking ice is not what I think is going to make average runners better into a reality plus. I could be wrong about that, but paying two to pay two more to save one, like if you're playing this against Reality Plus, how many times do you have to remove a tag through the basic action for this to be a functional economy card in your deck? It's like six or seven tags. And sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes you just need more money this turn to remove tags and like challenge remote server. But I think the amount of tags you have to remove with this in a non-tag me runner is a lot. You have to remove a lot of tags for this to be worth something. So I don't know if this solves the sort of like, I have no tag punishment or sorry, tag removal and shaper. During threat three, though, which is important because you generally want to oppo on threat three, when you install this resource during your turn, you may remove a tag, which means you gain a credit or gain two credits, which is cool, which means you can drop this for free on turns just to set up and for free. It's hard to make it better than that. Yeah. You cannot clear a tag if you don't have one. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. I think prepaid was a good levy deck. I also think Geist and Geist Haley decks were the real villains. Uh, back in the day, Jeff, people were not happy with prepaid Kate because it was just an unending vomit. Uh, that being said, there were things that beat it for sure. It did, but I agree. Things like Geist and Haley feel more prison because they do inherently play more control and less tempo where it's like, I can see the top of the deck every turn. Uh, I installed my whole deck for two clicks, like shaper stuff, but I agree. There's just problematic cards attached to levy. There are hundred percent is. Do you dislike prepaid Kate? No, I, I honestly, if someone said you could play prepaid Kate today, I would play it. And that's because prepaid is fun. Prepaid Kate is just fun. I don't know if it's great for the game because, again, it's just an unending flood of value, which, again, seems antithetical to what a lot of the other design we've seen, where it's limited to value, limited economies. Right now, we're almost at a point, besides the Anarch decks, where when you get to the end of your deck, economies do dry up. Uh, and now there's technically a reset button. So it is interesting. It was a really fun deck, though, because playing Sure Gamble to get six just feels good. Straight into the pot shop. <laughs> I can see worry about Ash and Epilogue. The other card I also too worried about it. I hope it doesn't become too harsh with Amelia. Yeah, Jeremiah, I think Amelia is there, definitely frightening. Ashen might also enable World Tree decks where you can get back all your resources you just trashed to World Tree. I'd argue that if you're going to do that, you're probably better off in World Tree decks. Like if you want to play that card, which is really hard because World Tree decks generally don't get to the end of their deck, you might actually be able to play the like second coming of uh which is what is it? Lab. What is the, the hall? What's the one with dogs on it? What's the dog one? Five cards, dog. Dog subtype. Unending value is what the Anarch decks with companions do right now. I agree. And I don't think we like that. You might just get Valentina out for free with Seb anyways. If it's, yeah, you definitely play in Seb. Not Tunnel Vision. Oh, Spark. Good choice. But no, the, the Shaper one that says Shuffle Five back. Harmony Therapy. Yeah, this one. 
Like, I think if you're playing World Tree, this is probably a bit of an easier card to put into your deck to just shuffle five cards back. That's enough value for World Tree, I think. Um, I don't know if you have to spend two influence to shuffle your whole deck. Yeah. And I in testing so far in World Tree decks, which are going to look fundamentally different, I don't know if it's necessary uh, because you just have a lot of value in that deck. It's hard to get to the bottom of that bin. It's like a 60 card deck sometimes. Maybe it'll be less. This card's massive and Seb. It might be playable outside of it as a meta call. Is this better than networking? Generally, I don't know. Uh, networking, mind you, does kind of hurt because it is minus one hand size, technically. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is not exactly the way that I think Shaper can clear tags easily. I'm so art blind. I never knew there was dogs on it. I thought N'Golo was a motorbike. You're not alone on that. N'Golo has sick art, though. How many th is since slow when it's faster installed from deck than hand? Yeah, exactly. I agree. Spark. That's one deck in which harmony makes more sense. Okay, it's 140. So we don't really have time to jump into the corp cards. I'm going to only be here till two because then I have to go. We'll be back tomorrow. Normally we start at noon. We'll start definitely earlier. Hopefully by then, hopefully by tonight, mind you, JNet will be online. And there's a lot of streaming you can watch tonight, mind you. YouTube.com uh, slash at, I should just open YouTube. At three o'clock, my time zone, Ba Ram Wu. I haven't double checked, but I'm pretty sure Ba is going to be streaming. Is Ba not here? Ba's here. So you want to watch Ba? I don't know what Ba is going to be up to. Probably some deck building. Uh, also, Neon Static is going to be streaming tonight in paper, in person. So their stuff will be working regardless if JNet's not up. But there's going to be a lot of other good stuff tonight, let alone this week. So please check that out. It'll be starting at three, at least for Ba. Neon Static starts around five or six Eastern. I'm not exactly sure the timing. Um... That being said, we'll be back tomorrow. We'll probably be starting earlier than noon. We're going to be streaming a long day, obviously getting to JNet itself. And we'll be streaming probably every day this week in the afternoon. So if you're enjoying it as much as my takes aren't as effusive as you might have hoped, uh, I really appreciate the conversation. I'm so excited to see how this, this set, set shakes out. I want to be very clear. The set is obviously fantastic and i'm really excited to see more of it huge shout out to the nsg people a lot of work goes into this i've pre-ordered my cards i can't be more excited to get more never onto a table really soon is rwr not live on jnet yet no it doesn't seem to be uh the report from glc says soon so sometime today hopefully what's the runner you're most excited to play uh shaper I'm not sure which shaper probably arsana I think the, the the Shaper cards are more exciting. Even Padma seems fine. As much as I'm going to feel really bad hitting people for 10 credit losses off of uh, Amelia. I met the creator Jaina recently, not knowing it was them. Oh, really? Uh, what's his name? He used to play Jinteki Personal Evolution. He's like the Belgium Monopoly champion. Not a Kiko. I don't like a Kiko. 12 influence. No, 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 no. NSG article. Oh, NSG article is up. Check that out. It's out now. Fantastic. Mind you, I ordered my pre-order. They shipped it out early, which is sick. So we can see all the cards here. Again, we've gone through all the Anarch stuff. Uh, we've gone through all the Criminal stuff. We've gone through all the Shaper stuff. And then we have two neutrals. Corp stuff. I talked about HP at length. I don't know. We want to dive into HP. Not my favorite faction. I don't like Rise and D-Rez. We've seen a lot of Jateki cards. I guess we'll just do this. This is the one card that was revealed today besides Julie Moreira, which is Cohort Guidance Program. Oh, this art's great. Oh, you got a little, little trickster taco there. When your turn begins, you may resolve one of the following. Min, how much cards? Yeah, Min, it is Min, yeah. There is an absurd amount of cards in the set that is one to res, two to trash. That's a very hard number ratio. What would you guess is the, the one to two trash check in this in this set? I think there's like 10 cards that are one to two. And one to two is not very good because it means you inherently have to ice it up because two credits is super trashable for most runners with like functional economies, which is a problem because a lot of those cards, if they can't get iced up, are not going to survive. And a lot of factions don't have good ways to punish people for trashing this. So just keep that in mind. We'll look at the one two, but the one two seems to be just like on every asset in the set, barring one or two. When your turn begins, you may resolve a falling trash card from HQ. If you do gain two credits and draw a card, that's on your turn. So you can't regenesis because a card's entered HQ as much as that is powerful. You trade a card for two credits and draw a card. That's actually relatively good because you're just trading up. And I don't think trading up matters as much as eventually it could be awkward. Turn one face down card in Arcus face up if you do place one advance on an installed card. So this makes sense in Taya. Uh, you can trigger this in the order so that you get Casador. You can get Charlotte to get a counter, which is quite nice. There's no way to fire two of these. This seems like the sort of card that could be political. You could do two. That'd be absurd. Early Premiere got nothing on this. It really doesn't as much as the runner has choices to interact with that bottom clause. I think this seems pretty good. We've seen a lot more draw on Jinteki, like non-ice. Um, which is kind of sick. 
uh, because this owl allows you to play on tempo. Like Charlotte plus this, you're gaining six credits drawing two cards. Doesn't nearly every faction have a way to punish trashing now? Not in a meaningful way. Uh, some better than others, but you don't want to just like, like when you're playing HP, you don't want to just active policing them. Like you need to have a bit more, oh God, the art. Now we can see it in this quality is really good. The frame of the art here is fantastic. It's as if uh, Marlon, like did Marlon know that the, there would be a swoop here and a swoop up there? It's so good. Two of them table fires both. Oh, that's true. Yeah, it's not unique. Yeah, that's good. That's a workhorse card for Jinteki. Uh, that's nice. This card's neat. Ways to protect assets are sparse, but maybe front company. I don't think front company does it. Uh, it just wastes a click. Like, I, I still think you have to um run it. But, like, check this out. In terms of one-twos, we have warm receptions, a one-two. We have working prototype, which is a one-two. What else do we have as a one-two? Charlotte's not a one-two, but almost a one-two because you have to advance it. Cohort's a one-two. Uh, Janina is worse than a one-two. Sudden Commandment's a 1-2, technically. Hollow Man's not a 1-2, worse than a 1-2. But the trash cost on cards in the set are really low. Hearts and Minds is a 1-2. Uh, Isaac is a 3-2. Like, the, the average trash cost, this is the only card that's, like, higher trash cost. Right? 1-3. So, like, the average trash cost of assets in the set is really, really low. Which is difficult. Because I, I don't think cards that inherently, like, like that's the thing with, um, uh, what's a good example here? Like, I'm glad, and mind you, we didn't talk about the they reprinted team sponsorship, but team sponsorship at being four cost, you would consider not trashing on some board states because you couldn't pay four credits. Uh, that, obviously, I think team sponsorship is a bit pushed. We now have this on 1-3 being unique and in influence and neutral, so that definitely makes it less good. Uh, but yeah, the trash costs on cards in the set are very, very, very low. So do keep that in mind. The police are busy with the riders, so trashing things is easier. Artists do get the frames to work with. Oh, that's sick. One new card about the face of an archives. I missed that one. It's this one. It's cohort guidance program. The people watching behind the screen is obviously great. Team spawn and G's felt so awful to trash. Yeah. And admittedly, that was a problem. Like those cards are really, really strong. We still have. And I think this is exactly the sort of card in which the trash to res cost ratio is where you'd want it. It's like if wage workers was on a one, two, I don't think you would see a lot of play besides in strict combo decks. Wage Workers being a 2-4 means that it does inherently protect itself, and you kind of have to protect this card. And we've just seen so many cards being 1-2s that are not going to protect themselves. And it's a really hard thing. It's like balancing a card based on how strong it is versus giving it a low trash cost. It's a tricky dance. It is a really tricky dance. Like We've seen some of the most powerful operations in the set have trash costs on them. And you're right, you can trash them, but if they fire, they fire. We're not into deck building Tron. We have to like close this out in 15 minutes. And I don't want to dive into the corp cards uh, because I think we're going to get, we'll start, we'll start. Okay, hold on. I'm going to go to NBN. I'm just going to go straight to NBN. That just turns it. Why would you do it? Please help. Wait, sorry. Terrence, how's it going? Arkham Horror, sorry. Wait, I'm not sure what's happening. How did we live in a world where those were legal alongside CTM? I know. I have put 500 cards into this sub deck. <laughs> oh, help, send help. King making. It's a research agenda. This is neat. Uh, when you score this agenda, drop to three cards. You may add one agenda worth one or less agenda points from HQ to score area. Oh, man. Okay, Andre, going to get pedantic. Let's get pedantic. This card is really fun. It's a really fun card. Uh, it can be a 4-3 sometimes. You have to get lucky or you have to know the top of your deck. That's really important for Epiphany. Let's start the pedantry. Firstly, this is a gender title. I know king making is probably what shows up in a Wikipedia article, but uh, NSG has kind of gone out of the way to make sure that these like gender titles don't get gendered. We had a card back in the day that was going to be called Drafts Men, and it got changed to Drafter, as you know it now. And I don't know. I don't like these male default gendered names as much as queen making probably is a bit like a bit confusing. I think we've said queen making on this channel because I don't like calling it king making. It's notably. It's not a lot of gender names on Neverner cards. When you score this agenda, drop to three cards. You may add one agenda worth one or less. This was called out in one of the things. What is happening? Why should it be? This is not right English. And this shows up on so many Neverner cards. It should be worth one or fewer agenda points. Why is it one or less? And why is that consistent? There must be something happening in testing in which less sees more play and fewer. But for those who are not plugged in, in English, when something is countable, you say one or fewer. If it's not countable, you say one or less. Yeah, Jamie, you probably know why this is. Why is this like this? About countdowns versus mass downs. Oh, here we go. This is the talk I'm in for. 
No fun if not a world for this entire Aries leaves. Yeah, you can score Aries with this. It's a problem. You can score false lead. Basically, you want to get anything that has ongoing text, not wind scored abilities. Because if you have a one, two, or one, what at one point agenda that has a wind scored ability, it won't fire because you're adding to your score area. You're not scoring it. Language intentions to communicate messages, it does that. So I'm happy with it. Yes, this is like a pedantry thing. It's like when you go to the grocery store and they say this aisle is 12 items or less. It shouldn't be that. It should be 12 items or fewer. Obviously, we understand what's happening. So there's probably a decision of why this happened. What's worse, this card was introduced in the guessing game? <laughs> yeah. Fewer, enter. What do you mean? Fewer, enter. Yeah, this was on Guardian Blade. I had a lot of fun doing it. X or less shows up on a lot of is generically correct context, like install cost or three or less. It doesn't. Uh, so if you look at things like career fair, it always in FFG world, they said three credits or fewer. Or sorry, they said paying fewer three credits. What did they say? Lowering the install cost by three. Okay, hold on. I looked into this. This is definitely not what the people want for takes for uh for this set. Okay. If you have fewer than six credits, not if you have less than six credits. And I, that's technically correct English, right? Although I find there's a lot of similar words where the only option gets eked out over time. What type of noun do you think agenda points are? I think agenda points are a countable object. This is actually what the people want in grammar time. Agenda points are a countable object. I can have fewer agenda points than you. We're trying to get to seven. I don't have less agenda points. I have fewer, right? So the idea of things that use less are things that are not countable. Like I have less patience. Grammar without rehearsal. Agenda points come in integers. They're countable, right? It's wrong on white space. I think less shows up uh, consistently on NSG cards, and at least it's consistent. The runner's six or less. It should be six or fewer, because the idea is, can you count credits? Yes, you can. Now, less shows up sometimes on FFG cards. To search it, you have to do like space, less, space, because otherwise you get unless. But like, what happens? With a cost less than or equal. So is a cost an integer? Technically, yes. But it says with a memory cost fewer than or equal, that sounds wrong. But my argument says a memory cost fewer also, yeah, it sounds really bad. But a memory cost is countable. So this kind of makes it interesting, right? You have less out water, but you have fewer ounces of water. Exactly, yeah. Countable measurement. IMO, okay, wait. Jamie, I think I missed it. If the runner has 550, does white space end the run? Yes, clearly. If you think of the specific credit tokens, that's countable. If you think of a credit total, that's not. So we're talking about a credit total like we're talking about water. I have less water than you. Not I have fewer water, but yeah, I have fewer cups of water. So the idea is that, but the, it's printed on the agenda. <laughs> Isn't it because less than? Less than is a mathematical expression. It's not the same thing as a new the new agenda, which is different and wrong. I have less money than you. I have less money than you, but you say, give me a dollar from your wallet that is, that has, <laughs> I have fewer dollars than you. That's the thing though. I have less money than you. Yes. But I have fewer agenda points. I have fewer dollars than you. Cause if it says you may add one. Yeah. I don't know. That's hard. But the thing is like less shows up on a lot of stuff like this. You have less time. Yeah. Time is not countable, but I have less hours. Like I have less hours of free time in the day, but I have fewer. Wait, huh? I have fewer out. The thing is, like, people also just say this wrong, and that's fine. Like, language just changes. I think majority of people don't use less or fewer correctly, classically correctly. I don't, right? Maybe agenda is like water, and we try to quantify numbers. I think that's the argument here, is that agenda points are uh, like un slight, slightly less quantifiable thing. We need an errata for this. I can't wait for a linguistic drift to make these entirely synonymous. They largely are. I'm pretty sure they are. I know I was talking to, um, my uh, my sister and her husband, who they work in like subtitling and localization stuff for like TV and film and the amount of people in scripts, obviously scripted stuff, let alone like off the cuff life, uh, you know, reality television shows in which people say less or fewer and then having to just do it the way that they say it is a thing. You're comparing less than to one or less and they're grammatically different. You were correct. The king making is wrong, but less than one is never wrong because it comes from math. Oh, cool, Spark. But one or less sounds more correct to me than one or fewer. It does sound more correct to you, but it's wrong. Despite me being annoyed, pedantic about it in other cases. I think this language is actually a scoop for the next set, which will include half points. <laughs> we need fractions. I wish the HBIs increased the strength by fractions. Agenda points are a weird type of value. But what about credits? Because credits get the same treatment from, from NSG. Credits are counted in not fewer credits, but less credits. 
one less letter and less got to get that less letter countdown we have space though right we have space on this one oh man maybe there's an agenda that's interested if zero has the word less on it this is probably not the scoops the discussion you came here to this channel but it's the discussion we're plugged into because i think it's fascinating i think credits are more clearly defensible to treat as a mass noun ah well, all I'm excited about is that there was discussions internally in NSG. And no matter what NSG came up with, that's totally fine because I don't think inherently it matters as much as it might bother people. But I'm just so interested to hear what the internal discussions were to come to this and whether this was flagged as being like, should we change this? Should we be consistent? Should we not? Because that's cool. That's really, really cool. The phrase less than one in math is often referring to uncountable objects, i.e. real numbers. Uh, this agenda is cool. I think this agenda is fun. Is it good? Maybe. Are the one pointers hard to play? Cool, you score them, anti-Hermes uh, technology. Uh, I think this card is going to be fun and might be part of combo decks. Uh, I don't know what one point is you're adding. You have AR enhanced security, unfortunately. Who knows? Kind of discussion to what the rules team does. Yeah, I love that stuff. I think that stuff is super interesting. Maybe not all, everyone does, but the fact that those discussions happen and people like have strong opinions about them, like sign me up for sure. This is the other agenda, and this is exactly what you needed to make Epiphany make any sort of sense. This card is, again, just a flood of text. It's just like value on top of value. So 4-2, fine. When you score this agenda, gain three credits and place one advancement counter on an installed card. So technically, a 4-2 that gives you three credits is below curve, but in terms of tempo positive NBN agendas, okay. But when you install this agenda from anywhere except HQ, which is the exact clause that I know we iterated that there's probably a nicer clause this is a good clause to do this. So it works not only from Epiphany, but unfortunately it works with things like Kakarenbo and Restore and things that install from archives. Hooray for recursion. You may reveal it. If you do, gain two credits and place one advancement counter on an installed card, including itself. So if you install this for a, a click through, in, through um, Epiphany's ability, not only do you get a credit, not only do you get a free advancement, which is three credits worth of value, you can fast advance this out on a something like a... I don't know, Arella on top of a San San, and then you can do some massive chains of value. A lot of the NBN we've seen in the set seems like combo NBN that can score out multiple points way faster than you think you can. I know I shouted out NBN being a fast advance thing, and this is definitely a part of it. Uh, really interesting. Obviously, this works to some extent as well in Prov the Vost, where getting the advancements matter, but this is definitely like a very fascinating card. Uh, and what you can do with it is not very obvious, and it works with itself relatively well. My grammar embers are sure stoked. <laughs> as real teams commented on how this agenda doesn't work because agenda text is not active on face down agendas. Oh, no, dead. You can't start this again. You can't start this. I'll be upset. When you install this agenda from anywhere except HQ. So from my understanding of the rules, and probably Jamie's writing this right now, is that any text that only makes sense in context makes sense in that context. <laughs> I don't like it. I know I've been saying that I wish there was a clause next to this or a reminder text that says this fires when uninstalled or something like that. But you're right. I'm not sure why this fires because technically the text isn't active. The first comment of like 15 on King Banking is me saying this feeling it's certain that printed agenda point value of one or less is the right phrasing here. The only existing use of agenda point value is the CTU word for Jemison. Triggers always work with intuitively correct way and ignores a lot of how cards normally work. Yes, that's the thing. It's like the cards work the way you think you're going to do. I had a really good comment talking about like, why does expendable work? And I agree, expendable works because the rules say they do. And I think it's kind of a, a victim of the success of NSG that they've done such a good job codifying the rules that the rules just having a clause that says, cause it does work, silly, uh, is, it feels like we want something that's more religious than it is just like a structured meter. Um, so take that as it will. Maybe we just need a little symbol here that says, yeah, this also works where you think it doesn't. Stuff like that. But technically, if it makes sense, it does its thing. As much as I do not understand why I can't fire Descent from Archives. Why can't I fire this from Archives? It does due to 9.1.8. Yes. It does because of a line in the textbook, which like, uh eh. Specific beats general. That's what it comes down to. In development, we always use less than not fewer when we were working with numbers. Maybe a dev worded the card. <laughs> Yeah, but zombie in like development when it comes to, you know, coding. Yeah, you actually use less a lot because operators, right? Linguistics discussion is awesome. Yo, hurry. Glad you like it as much as I know I do. Words are just made up. Maybe the agenda works because you reveal it. Yes. Anytime that you have an ability like that, I think is attached to reveal. Mind you, one good thing about Expendable is it's very clear from HQ. If this did not say from HQ, I would be really weird about this. Like if this was just worded click and credit reveal and trash this ice this 
probably would work in different zones, but this is what I want. This text that makes it obvious where it's going to happen from. I think that's a really good thing about Expendable. Descent would not work from Archives because exception to the rule isn't the only place it could possibly work. But you understand why that's not intuitive, right? Like, I get that the rules support it, but like, you also get why this is not as clear as it could be. If anybody does think Rule 9.8B is doing its job well enough, you can email suggestions to Rule to NSG Games, yes. I've talked to a lot of people, myself included, that, you know, parts of the rules can be difficult. And if you have feedback, obviously hit up NSG because they, they definitely want to keep this stuff in mind to keep the game as clear as possible. This one caught me for a loop for sure. I thought it was like subliminal. Me too. I thought it was like subliminal. And then you realize that would be absurd. So it's probably not. But yeah, I thought it was like subliminal because subliminal says specifically from archives. And that's the basic idea of this 9.1.8, whatever it is, is that if it makes context from a certain space, it always works from that space. Uh, so keep that in mind. Why aren't my assets active in archives? Sometimes they are. Not always. But why? Because. Wait, is there any good example of this? Why? Would... Well, they do, right? Like nightmare archives, ambushes are. But that's exactly the point. They're not active from archives. So why is Nightmare Archives? Because of the ambush. So should there not be a clause that just says this is active from archives? Because then you have to realize the subtype matters. And there's not many cards in which the subtype inherently changes how you interact with the rules text. I agree. I agree. I know how it works. I just, I just, I don't know. Maybe I'm just complaining. We run into the issue if it said this res dice, then it makes existing cards more confusing because of the difference. Yeah, that's actually a really big point too. It's like as soon as you put like explanatory text on on, on descent, all the cards without explanatory text sink further into like. It's not the subtype though, isn't it? Nightmare archives. On access triggers always work from everywhere. Exceptions are noted in the card text, like access wall installed. Like I don't know that. Why do on access triggers work for everywhere? Why? Because of the win access language? Classically in the rules, it was the ambush subtype is just win. Oh man. That's why we end up not including the clause. Okay. Can it just be Yu-Gi-Oh where we make up what the cards do when we play them? Uh... Yeah, Nightmare doesn't say it's specifically active in archives. A lot of traps only say that it's specifically not active in archives. That's very notable. You can blame FFG for it. <laughs> Anyways. Uh yeah, okay. Uh, it's two o'clock. Unfortunately, I got to sign out. Hopefully everyone's having a good day with the new set launch. I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff there. Uh, I think the NBN stuff looks quite interesting. I think I'd actually be interested to play Epiphany, which is kind of the goal here. Overarching thoughts. I think Shaper looks pretty sick. Want to see what Anarch looks like in person. Criminal, a lot of bypass stuff, but a lot of some stuff that'll fit into good stuff decks, and that's pretty good. Uh, I don't know if I'm like the HB Thunderbolt stuff, and Anor uh, Jinteki got a lot of flexible cards for like generalist stuff, which is kind of what I wanted, which is good. Uh, NBN, you got some big ice. Uh, that's good. And Wayland is probably where we're going to start. I think the first thing would probably build, mind you, Hollow Man is such a fascinating card, is do a Nuvum deck, unfortunately, 59, Puny to 5-3. Because, mind you, we saw this later on in the set release. I just don't know what you do with this besides just spam punitive. Play as few agendas as possible, play 59, some big enough ice, and then just punitive them or steal money when they steal this. Eternal can have a little Yu-Gi-Oh as a treat. <laughs> no signal. Andre, have me on your stream sometime. I'm always happy to talk about stuff. Yeah, Jamie, I probably should do that. Uh, I think that's a really good thing to talk about and then we can maybe collect questions uh to answer as a whole do we know when these cards will be on Chiteki? Chas, we do not. It's very noteworthy that the devs on JNet, bless them, uh, the absolute heroes they are, are not NSG. So they'll get to the things on their schedule as they will. I think I heard from GLC that they say later today. Uh, depends when your today is, but that's probably correct. So in the near future, generally the cards are like, it's not like they see the cards at the last minute and they're like frantically coding. Uh, they have seen the cards and it's just them pushing the thing. And then obviously there'll be some bugs and stuff like that. Very importantly, if you're on to JNet tonight, if you see any bugs, go tell the JNet people, flag it, GitHub, all the good stuff. There's a bug report feature just to, so that they know, but they're currently on NSG. They're on Netrun DB, their earliest today. Noah said today. Yeah. So today again, what time zone is Noah in? Building Nuvum and Startup is going to be rough with a small card pool. Yeah, because you literally can't find 50 cards. <laughs> but yeah, for sure. Hope everyone's playing new cards and not mulch if you're on the punitive plan. Uh, yeah, but they generally are. They generally are. When a new set comes out, I don't feel like it's like Hearthstone Ladder where people are just playing aggro. Can we have a community agree not to play R plus while we test Seb? Generally, yes and no. For what it's worth, I think the Reality Plus matchup is not, it's going to be polarizing for sure, but it is cool that the face checks off their ice and their agendas actually pushes you forward. 
Like it means that you have to change how you play, but the idea that I run into a ping and get to install a card for two credits less, and I'm a deck inherently that has tag removal built in, it might not be that bad. That being said, you just gave the corp 18 free credits and like 16 free card draw or something. So that's a problem, but just keep it in mind is that there are some downsides to it, but there are some upsides. So that's a matchup I actually want to see in person a bit more than any other matchup. So keep that, yeah, keep that in mind. Probably playing Nuvim because I like to use 50 sleeves or lefts for my deck. Yeah, I buy Dragon Shield 100, so I can get away with one Nuvim deck, I guess. I think Mulch will quite quickly be back and dominating. Uh, I think when it comes to JNet, specifically also because there's not that many huge competitive tournaments, mind you, actually, and NPCs this weekend, they will be streaming on Saturday. So you want to see the new cards in person just this weekend. There'll be organized play, and a lot of really strong players are coming in for that, too. Uh, I'll get a link sooner than later of where that stream is later this week. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people just want to play with the new cards because they're fun. Like, do you want to play Wizard's Chest? Yeah. Do you want to play J Shin Yo? Yes. So we'll see that. Rocket Racing Seb versus R Plus. <laughs> Who benefits more? I don't know. It's interesting, like Era versus Essa versus Thule, yeah. Or personal evolution versus Apex. Yeah. It can be tricky. London one's coming out super soon. I need to get my card order in. Yeah, get your card orders in. I don't know if the EU store is open. I know I've already pre-ordered my stuff and it's already in the mail. So shout out to the nice folks running the Canadian distribution, which is great. I know one place the Wizard's Chest will get a lot to play. I don't think it's a good place to get it, Mango. I don't think you play Wizard's Chest in that deck. I feel like it's probably not the best place. I hope today I got enough support with Tributary and Charlotte. I don't know if they got enough Generalist Ice. Tributary and Charlotte, they also got the Cohort Guidance Program, which just is pretty good. Uh, the new neutral card honestly kind of interested with it because it's exactly the sort of thing you want to put in the second server to get like good attack value like this card is probably just good uh so there's a lot of things i think you can consider in the slot um so atea definitely has something i think that is still going to struggle because atea did not get an agenda i think in terms of jinteki jinteki got a lot of stuff but unfortunately with jinteki uh, besides mind you i think uh tributary is absurd we still got a lot of ice that says damage on it which is not necessarily what you want in most atea decks and then the agendas I think are interesting. I think see how they run is like super narrow in what decks you want to play it, but we did not get the generalist Jinteki agenda we wanted. So I still think like getting together seven agenda points to score out from Jinteki is not going to be the easiest thing in Atea. But like Boto, it's Braun at home. Uh, what? Please, any other subroutine, any other subroutine on this. Thank you. And then like Cloud Eater is also net damage and very, very expensive. That being said, I think Tributary absolutely slaps so hard. I mean, folks who play Wizard's Chest. Oh, there you go. There you go. I thought you meant uh, assassination attempts, which like, yeah, okay. That makes way more sense. I hope the store gets those copies in foil. Sisyphus Protocol seems good in Atea to me. I think it also, I would see it, yes. I just don't think it's like the tempo positive sort of thing where I want my like PDS Jinteki deck. I think it's good. Maybe. No ice that actually stops the runner. Yeah, there's no ice in the set that actually stops the runner. Why play Atea when he can just play Asa? I think uh, Tron, uh, I think you were shouting out Tributary and Asa. It's really good. Tributary in a lot of things is really good. Tributary eavesdrop, like, let's go. <laughs> Every server is a server of good. Um, I'll still stand Project Yagi Uda. Yagi Uda is probably better than we all think it is. It's just like, I want when I score my agendas to push me forward, which every other faction has a way to do that largely besides Shinteki for some reason. Anywho, that's it. Congratulations on the set launch. Get your pre-orders in. We'll see you on JNet. Again, there's good streaming stuff tonight. I'll try and get the description updated as soon as possible. But Neon Statics tonight. Baram Wu is tonight. And we'll be back tomorrow. Andre, of course, you have to go through going through all the corp cards. We'll probably do it tomorrow. Um, I think there's a really good corp cards there. Thanks for streaming. Yeah, thanks for hanging out again. Appreciate the stream. Sorry that my takes are all over the place. But if you want to leave a like on the channel, mind you, we're on Patreon. I need to give a huge thank you to all the people that support the channel. Otherwise, like we're going to take a lot of time this week just to hang out and play some cards and try some stuff out. And again, this would not be possible without the support. If you want to support the channel, you can find a link down below. Mind you, this is just sure gamble and uh, degree bill patrons. But we also have a lot of uh, daily cast patrons and the contributions are incredibly appreciated. Even if you just want to like the video, share it. There's a lot of way that helps. Um, I would also be super stoked to hear. I probably should ask patrons like what sort of decks you want to see first, because there's a lot of runway of things we can try out. We're going to try and try out everything. I know Jeff and I are going to be recording our tier list video, the correct tier list video later this week. It'll probably be out in a couple weeks or so. And I want to get testing in more than I have for other tier lists just to make sure that we know what we're talking about. Uh, and uh, so we're going to try and try as much as we can. Andre's going to get tributary banned for being toxic. Eh, it seems fun. 
there's there's play patterns that can be tributary which is cool because it's only first run a turn so there's a lot going to it that seems a bit more manageable like i like it there's built-in uh counterplay as much as uh it's still pretty good at ice boo testing yo okay play tester over there wants me to go in and say uh i that i like concerto and he's like well actually <laughs> untested takes only i'll try and keep those in mind because i've given some of my untested takes today uh as uh you know anyways on that note take care of yourself enjoy the streams later today enjoy the new set and we'll see you hopefully tomorrow take care y'all